The following audiobook was written, performed, and produced entirely by Jordan Crumbine. It is a fully independent production designed specifically for YouTube. For the best experience, first save this video to your watch later playlist to easily find it again. For navigation, please use the chapter markers in the description. As long as you're logged into your YouTube account, the player should remember your last position in the book. If the performance is too slow or fast for your liking, you can use the playback controls to adjust the speed of the video. Finally, if you enjoy this production, please like, share, and consider leaving a review on Goodreads. Leave a comment if you'd like to see more original books like this on YouTube. Thank you, and enjoy the book. Abraham Owens is Punched, Drunk, and All Out of Fucks, a novel by Jordan Crumby, read by Jordan Crumby. Prologue. It's night, because it has to be night. Chaos wants darkness. It demands darkness. He knows this because chaos whispers it to him. This person, this man, this thing, is not the hero of the story. Chaos tells him to sit at the farthest edge of the narrow room. He's at the corner of a small table where fingers of darkness are able to reach out from the shadows of the dimly lit bar and grab hold of him. He feels the touch of darkness as if it were tangible, a numb and empty cold dancing across his flesh. Perfect, Chaos whispers. He agrees. He has no reason not to. Chaos has never once led him astray or made a fool of him. Even if he doesn't immediately understand a direction, he understands that chaos demands patience. So he sits. And he waits. He wears a hooded blazer in a dark shade of green that brings out an unnatural, verdant hue in otherwise dark eyes. A pale, narrow face is resigned to neutrality as he waits, as if he's able to sidestep linear time, his body slipping into a state of hibernation until chaos whispers. A stein of dark beer sits on the table in front of him, filled to the top. The foam has long since receded. He hasn't touched it, and he's not going to. It's almost as if the beer is for show. Because it is. He's been sitting like this for nearly an hour. Sitting, waiting, anticipating the whisper. He is patient because chaos demands it. He knows that surface dwellers will see this as a contradictory observation. But chaos operates on no timetable. Chaos exists as plainly as time itself, gravity, or humanity's inescapable desire to wage war against itself, murdering and killing in the name of one imaginary god or another. But he knows there is no god. The glory goes only to chaos. And chaos is patient because chaos is inevitable. Soon, chaos whispers, a silent and breathy voice in his ear. He feels something stir in his groin. A small group of three enters the bar, and he evaluates them quickly from the shadows. The happy couple exchanges a quick kiss, and the friend, an obvious third-wheel hanger-on, beelines for the bar to order the first round. Light catches flecks of green in those dark eyes as he considers the girl being kissed. He evaluates her in a cold, calculating fashion, like a person reviewing the dinner bill to ensure everything is in order, or a cut of meat to ensure it's the right size and isn't too fatty. Instinct told him she could be interesting. She's the right weight, the right figure, the right kind of simple, vapid willingness plastered across her face, one of those insipid and dull traits that remain so rampant among the surface dwellers. Instinct tells him she could be interesting. Chaos whispers, no. The boyfriend, on the other hand, is perfect. Strapping, immaculately scruffy hair perfected after hours of mirror time, arms that long to be twisted and pinned, full, pliable lips that beg for a forceful touch, eyes that sparkle and plead to be owned and controlled. Yes, the boyfriend would certainly be enjoyable to play with. Chaos is patient, but even chaos can be tempted. Wait. Beneath his neutral expression, an angry flash of frustration sparks. It's an impatience that will undoubtedly cause chaos to scowl in disappointment, if only it had the countenance to do so. He took a long, calming breath. Perhaps they would be tasty appetizers, but the happy couple isn't who he's waiting for. Maybe another day. Too many variables had already been aligned, and there still remains a handful to nudge into place, like pawns on a chessboard. This singular encounter is essential for events yet to come. He needs to be ready. He needs to be patient. 
This is too important to allow for frivolous distractions. Yes, soon, Chaos whispers. Once again, the door to the bar opens and someone enters. His breath catches in his throat. He feels something tighten in his chest. Excitement? Anticipation? Joy? Dark green eyes sparkle, revealing a sense of raw, if not subtle, thrill. Abraham Owens has arrived. He recognizes him on sight. It's been years, but the brute hasn't changed. He matches almost perfectly the old photos and recent anecdotal descriptions. Owens is massive, easily 6'4", with broad shoulders and a commanding presence. His head is shaped and his jaw is covered in stubble. His nose looks to have been on the receiving end of too many punches. No, Abraham Owens doesn't look like a hero. He doesn't even look like a villain. Abraham Owens looks like the goon the villain hires as one of the henchmen fated to die in the first act. He watches as Owens settles at the opposite edge of the bar. There's an exchange with the bartender. Back in the far corner, over the untouched beer, he muses that Owens probably prefers grunts over words. As he observes the other man, he starts to calculate how drunk Owens must have already been just to have walked into the bar in the first place. Putting aside Owens's condition, a man of his size must have a high tolerance for alcohol. To be in a room this full of people, he must have already been wasted. That sensual, breathy voice tickles his ear with words no one else can hear. Yes. He watches as Owen slams back glass after glass of whiskey. This is it. This is what he waits for. Abraham Owens is who he waits for. This is what chaos waits for. Owens continues drinking. He's putting it away fast. The waiting is almost over. A smile pulls at his lips, twisting the neutral expression into something demonic. He begins to stand before surprising himself by hesitating. When he settles back into the chair, the rage that had simmered for so long continues to bubble and rise. He can taste it, like bile in the back of his throat, a stinging acid pricking his nose. Abraham Owens is right there, and yet he hesitates. Is he denying chaos? Is he trying to exert some kind of divine control over chaos? Impossible. Chaos is patient. Chaos is inevitable. Chapter 1 Well, fuck. No matter how much cheap alcohol I poured on it, this little field trip to Dockside Bar wasn't turning into a good idea anytime soon. Better try the expensive stuff, then. The bartender, Jimmy, had a genuine look of surprise when I sat down. Abraham Owens, he said, drying his hands on a dish rag. Jesus, it's been a hot minute. How you doing, buddy? I gestured to a bottle just below the top shelf and grunted. Less chit-chat, more whiskey. Jimmy squinted, and I didn't need super empathy to see he was trying to figure out how deep in the bag I already was. Four singles, a case of some pansy-ass hard lemonade, good, cheap alcohol content, the last quarter of a respectable bottle of spiced rum, and flavored vodka I only touched when there was no other options. And that was just to get me down the street to Dockside. Fortunately, I held my liquor like I took a punch, and I met Jimmy's gaze with a steely one of my own. We gonna make eyes at each other all night, I growled. I fished my money clip out and peeled a Franklin off the wad. Leave the bottle, keep the change. Jimmy gave a half shrug, grabbed the whiskey, and filled the glass. I slammed it back and immediately refilled it, rolling my shoulders as I felt the weight of the other bar patrons slowly ease off my back. Dockside wasn't packed, but it was still Friday night at the local haunt. A handful of people would make my skin crawl. More than a handful? Well, if it weren't for the booze, I'd be suffocating. This was a really fucking bad idea. I knocked back the second glass of whiskey, and the field trip still didn't look any rosier. The alcohol burned its way down my throat, and my back released more tension. You doing okay there, Abe? Jimmy asked, putting on a fine show of playing the sympathetic bartender. Not that I'm cynical. I raised the third glass of whiskey and cheers. Never better, I lied, overemphasizing my words and popping my eyes in what I hoped looked like confident certainty, but probably read as angry drunk. Someone flagged Jimmy from the other end of the bar. Before he stepped away, he knocked twice on the bar top. Just go easy for me, okay? I waved him off with a grunt. I hadn't dragged my ass to Dockside and risked emotional suffocation from a bar full of drunk strangers just to cause Jimmy a bit of late-night trouble. No, I wanted, for once in my shit stain of a life, to experience a total abdication of reality. Some people drink to forget. Some people drink to numb away the pain of life. 
Some people drink because there's nothing else left to do. Me? After years of detailed field research, I can safely check the box for all of the above. And then some. The night was fuzzy, and I honestly couldn't say if my ex-wife had been on my mind before I came to Dockside. It could have been the memory of her and the associated guilt that drove me to abandon the safety and isolation of my trailer in the first place. Maybe I had been thinking about her, and maybe I hadn't. Either way, I was definitely thinking about her now. Truth was, there wasn't many days when I didn't think about her. My phone buzzed in my pocket. I checked the display on the outside of the flip phone and saw it was Valdez, and then clicked the side button to dismiss the call. She was a good kid, just trying to be a decent friend, which was the last thing I was interested in right now. After pocketing the phone, I turned and leaned against the bar, bringing a fresh glass of whiskey to my lips. I scanned the crowd to see if there was anybody I could use to disappoint Jimmy. After all, if you can't run from your problems, the next best thing was to find someone willing to beat them out of you. Plus, it wasn't every day that I got to be around so many people without a crippling tidal wave of emotional suffocation. Even after the third glass of whiskey, the pull was still there. It was a kind of psychic magnetism that attracted the emotions of anyone nearby. The stronger the pull, the more I was overwhelmed with someone's entire emotional state. Too many people with too many emotions, and I might as well have suffered a fucking lobotomy. Behind the growing dam of alcohol, the pull was muted, distant, and thankfully far from crippling. But like climate change, capitalism, and the Republican Party, it was still there. As my gaze drifted from person to person, I picked up the faint chords, almost imperceptible vibrations of their emotional states. If not for the already copious amounts of alcohol, these subtle twangs would have been clues that painted vivid pictures of each person's life. Hunger. Lust. Lots of sloppy, drunk happy. Someone was harboring a fit of anger that danced particularly close to an infectious, all-consuming rage. But it was all so distant that I could almost, almost ignore it. Booze was a beautiful thing. There may have been a more effective way to mitigate the emotional plague, or maybe even a way to control it. But as long as I stayed isolated, or remained well lubricated as the case may be, there was never any reason to suffer through the exploration of my psychic limits. Fuck. Even if I tried, it would probably end up killing me. Death by feeling. Brain exploded with raw emotion. Someone called Guinness World Records. I took a healthy sip of whiskey and immediately choked on it when I saw her face. It was my ex-wife. I glimpsed her as my gaze skimmed across the bar patrons. I immediately choked on the whiskey, my blurry vision going watery. As quickly as I had spotted her, her face was gone, lost in the small crowd. It was a fleeting instant fueled by enough alcohol to kill a small horse, but I was sure it was her. At least, I think I was sure. Problem was, she'd been dead for two years. Her name was Priscilla. Growing up, she hated when other kids called her Prissy for short, so from the time she was 12, Priscilla insisted on going by her middle name. Personally, I don't see how Gertrude was much of an improvement. The thing is, though, she was always my Gertie, right from the beginning. I didn't even know Priscilla was her first name until we were signing paperwork during a shotgun elopement in Vegas. Before everything went south, I made a decent living as a contractor, specializing in all things brick and concrete. I had started the business with my brother, and things had gone pretty well for us until the shit hit the fan. It was hard, honest work, and a far cry from the type of questionably legal gig work I take these days whenever funds run low. Gertie, on the other hand, was fucking brilliant. Seriously, she had a PhD in economics and even appeared on a few of those cable news programs to talk about policy proposals or something. The whole thing was beyond me for sure, but Gertie never made me feel dumb about it. She was good to me. She was good to everyone. We liked to shop for campers and plan for a nomadic life, traveling across the country. She wanted a traditional motorhome-style RV. I wanted a massive trailer we could pull behind the truck. We settled on a small three-bedroom, two-bath bungalow because that was the sensible thing to do. And when you're happy and talking about kids, it makes sense to be sensible. In hindsight, it was good that we bought the house. After the accident, and when her migraines began, I was able to retrofit one of the extra rooms into a soundproof, lightproof cave for her to ride out the pain. I already felt bad enough, because there's only so much you can do for a person suffering from chronic migraines. She tried all the meds, but nothing would touch it. She needed darkness, silence, and time to ride it out. Aside from retrofitting her cave, there wasn't anything else I could do for her. Other than leaving her alone, that is. And then, 
that empathy thing started flaring up. I didn't know what was happening at first. I thought it was just coincidentally getting headaches at the same time as Gertie. Some kind of sympathetic hormonal bullshit or whatever. But the headaches escalated, and I soon suffered full-fledged migraines right alongside Gertie. They started late in the day as a persistent, throbbing drumbeat in my temples and the vice-like grip of an 800-pound gorilla clenching my skull. Glowing and distorted auras punctuated a sensitivity to light that felt like shards of glass slicing into my optic nerves. Layers of pain compounded until the nausea demanded the constant presence of a puke bucket. There were times when we would spend all day lying in the cave, not daring to move. It was during one of those quiet moments, in between waves, when I first properly noticed the pull. In the silence of our cave, I suddenly started laughing. They were big belly laughs that shook the bed. The outburst must have split Gertie's head in two because I immediately felt an ice pick in my own brain. Later, I would learn that a package had been delivered to our front door, and the delivery driver was listening to a funny podcast. I had a little help putting two and two together, but the end result was that this super empathy bullshit just meant that instead of Gertie suffering alone, two people were going to be crippled by her migraines. And that was in addition to the flood of emotions I was now picking up from our neighbors and my daily colleagues. I'm the first to admit I'm not the sharpest tack in the box. My path to problem solving tends to begin and end with my fists, but at the time, I didn't see any other option. I needed to get away from everybody. Gertie included. So I did. That's how I wound up in a run-down, 32-foot tow-behind in the far corner of an RV park. I left the construction business to my brother, who all but crucified me for walking out on Gertie. While I was busy finding relief in isolation, my brother was busy finding religion, the evangelical kind with a hateful, spiteful God that hid behind a cheap facade his followers wanted you to believe was love. Of course, I had tried to make my brother understand the situation and what we were collectively suffering through, but this freshly minted Jesus freak fuck had embraced a narrow, black and white worldview where there was no room for shades of gray. Angry, intermittent browbeating shifted to excommunication, and eventually I lost all track of him. Last I heard, he had skipped town on some evangelical mission to spread shame, sexual purity, and recruit souls for that hateful fuck of a god. As for Gertie, Less than six months after I left her, I found out she had died from an aneurysm. She wasn't even 35. This super empathy bullshit is a bitch. It's a crushing weight when I'm around any group of people, debilitating in every way imaginable. I say all of that to say this. As lobotomized and helpless as my empathy makes me feel, even at its absolute worst in the biggest, shittiest crowd of fucktards imaginable, it still pales in comparison to the weight of guilt I carry for abandoning my wife. Chapter 2 The room felt like it was spinning. Which was fine, I was used to that. It wasn't anything more booze couldn't fix. I turned around and grabbed the edge of the bar, knocking back the rest of my whiskey before refilling the glass. I focused my gaze on the glossy oak bar top, tracing the lines of grain to a fat knot. Try finding a singular point to focus on. Let that point, whatever it is, a pencil, a picture on the wall, the feeling of the ridges on your fingertips when you rub your digits together, let that become your entire world. Focus like your goddamn life depends on it. Josephine Watson, my closest friend, confidant, and the only person who had ever been able to make sense of the psychic changes that plagued me. Finding a singular point of focus, that was Josephine's advice for dealing with the pull but it certainly applied here, after seeing the face of my dead wife. The knot was the size of a drink coaster. It was dark and had two cracks, frozen imperfections under the glossy wax. Grain flowed up to and then around the knot, which made me think of a whirlpool in the middle of the ocean. Something smashed into my back, and I collapsed forward into the bar, spilling the glass of whiskey and knocking the bottle over. The bar went silent. I watched as whiskey leaked from the bottle, pooling on the bar top. A strange fog pricked at my already alcohol-clouded brain. It filled my ears with a low, thrumming buzz. I could faintly hear Jimmy the bartender shouting, but I had no idea what he was saying. I pushed myself off the bar and wiped the whiskey from my chin. Jimmy came over, still shouting silently, at me or my attacker, and set the whiskey bottle upright. I turned to face my attacker, but no one was there. The ragtag crowd of dockside patrons watched me with excitement and confusion. 
no fists were raised, and I didn't see any one person stepping forward as my attacker. Scattered around me were splinters of the chair the mystery attacker had smashed into my back. I felt a tapping on my shoulder and turned slowly. Fuck, why did I feel so lethargic? This couldn't just be the whiskey, could it? And saw Jimmy was saying something to me. I still couldn't hear him, but I could feel what he meant. Your trouble, Abe Owens. Always have been, always will be. You're low-life scum, and you don't deserve to be here. Take it somewhere else. Jimmy stared at me, waiting for me to make a move. Finally, I nodded and started for the door. I could feel the eyes of every patron in the bar following me. Fuck. I made a stupid decision and turned around to go back to the bar. Jimmy's eyes went wide in fear. I pointed a finger at him and, instead of anything comprehensible, just growled at the bartender. Jimmy gulped. I grabbed the whiskey bottle. There was still a decent quarter that hadn't spilled, and exited the bar. The strange mental fog hadn't lifted by the time I made it to the nearby bus stop. I sucked down half of what was left of the whiskey and tried to unpack what had just happened, which was about as useful as an elephant trying to peel a banana. Another swig of the whiskey. The ground shifted as my head spun. The punch came out of nowhere. For the second time that night, I was caught entirely off guard, something that rarely happens thanks to the pull. I don't know if it was the person throwing the punch, surely the same attacker from inside the bar, or the fog from the dump truck quantities of booze I had consumed, but I didn't feel a thing until the fist connected with my face. I stumbled backward into the bus stop bench, grabbing my face as stars exploded. Usually a hit like that would be enough to sharpen my senses, but like I said, dump truck quantities of booze. I stumbled again and tried to focus on my attacker. It was late in the night, and even if my attacker hadn't been silhouetted against the streetlight, I wouldn't have been able to make out any of his details. Fuck! This whole night was a mistake. Not that I didn't know that from the start, but I have a rule about letting foresight get in the way of a bad idea. Another punch. It was weird, I saw it coming at the same time I felt it connect with my jaw. More stars. As I spun, or was that the world doing the spinning, I felt something pulling at my chest. Double fuck. Now it decides to give me a heads up? The pull. It was like an invisible thread that connected me directly to my attacker. The stronger the pull, the more I could feel every vibration of his emotional state. The stronger the emotional state, the more I intuitively understood the individual. It was a fucking nightmare that can only be drowned out with booze, preferably in quantities of a metric fuckton. The pull twanged in my chest. Anger. Rage. Frustration. Only the last emotion was mine. A time-delayed realization that my ill-advised bender would not end well. Was that ever in the cards? The other two emotions were his, my attackers. The pull was distant and quieted by a wet blanket of entirely too much alcohol, but there was no mistaking my attacker's rage. As if the punches weren't already an obvious clue. I dropped to my knees while grabbing at my throbbing skull. I tried to say something, but I'm not sure what actually came out. I do know that despite whatever the plea was, my attacker didn't bother with a response. Instead, a kick to the face slammed me into the back of the bench. Repeated kicks to my gut made my ribs scream out, no doubt bruising under the impacts. I could feel myself drowning in alcohol-induced lethargy. I couldn't fight back even if I wanted to. And I didn't want to. I don't know what I did to this guy for him to use me as his personal piñata, but I knew in my gut it didn't matter. My brother was right. I deserved this. I deserved to be crucified. For abandoning Gertie. For letting her die alone. For not being strong enough. When my attacker's legs grew tired of kicking me, I collapsed and tumbled sideways into the ditch behind the bus stop. I rolled to a halt and felt myself sink slightly into the muddy bottom of the ditch, flat on my back. I wheezed a bubble of blood while staring up at a cloudless night sky, trying to make the stars less blurry as darkness crept around the edges of my vision. So this was what rock bottom felt like. I closed my eyes and tried to get comfortable. This was where I belonged. I heard the squelch of boots in the mud and felt my attacker digging through my pockets. He stood up and I could see that he was stealing my money clip with what was left of my cash. This asshole was robbing me? That's what this was all about? All right, fuck me. This was rock bottom. One more kick to the ribs. Fuck you very much, Abraham Owens and my attacker disappeared into the alcoholic fog from which he had materialized. Fuck me. Abraham Owens. Feeler of all the things. Doer of nothing. Abandoner of the only person who ever gave a damn about him. A broken punching bag lying at the bottom of a random ditch. Yeah.
This was absolutely where I belonged. I wheezed and could feel the blackness beginning to lift me up and sweep me away. As weightlessness enveloped me, a single, inexplicably random thought whispered at me through the fog. What the fuck was that asshole doing with Gertie's face? Chapter 3 It had been a day and change since I dragged my ass out of the ditch. A day and change since I couldn't stop thinking about her face. A day and change spent sleeping off the mother of all hangovers, taking a break only to piss, shit, and kill the last of my emergency supply of alcohol. If you're going through hell, why take pit stops? Valdez, a scrappy private investigator with internal wiring that somehow prohibited detectable emotion over psychic wavelengths, called multiple times, no doubt a wellness check from a concerned friend. Still, I let it go to voicemail each time. If you're going through hell, there's no point dragging someone else along for the ride. It was Sunday morning when I felt a distant pull that was getting progressively stronger. Fear. Panic. Trepidation. I was sprawled across the too small mattress in the back room when the bastard knocked on the door. He either didn't notice the kitschy, go-away doormat at the steps of the trailer, or he intentionally ignored it. The asshole's fear and trepidation made my chest tighten, and I groaned as I tried to ignore the pull. He was young, desperate, but determined. Something bad was going to happen. Honestly, it smelled like a steamy pile of not-my-problem. More knocking on the cheap fiberglass rattled the loose screen door behind it. My brain ached as I tried to make it useful. I needed booze to deal with people, and I was pretty sure I was all tapped out. Thanks to the asshole for my Friday night adventure at Dockside, I didn't have any cash to buy more booze. And then there was the lot rental fee for my trailer. That wasn't due for another two weeks, so I'd have to eventually rustle something up. The kid at the door needed me, which meant a possible job. Best I could figure it, I had two choices. Indulge the kid and maybe take the job, or get rid of the kid and go back to sleep. The pole twanged like an angry piano wire, sending vibrations of apprehension and fear deep into my chest, which only pissed me off more. Fuck this kid. In my line of work, a job was never too far away. When the nuts hit the gravel, Valdez never failed to hook me up with something. I could afford another day in bed, but the kid wasn't going away by himself. I groaned and pushed myself up. A cramped bathroom gave way to the rest of the trailer. A kitchenette with a small pantry, fridge, and a sink on one side, a futon, and a small television on the other. I checked the fridge for any booze that might have escaped my wrath. Another knock. Mr. Owens, please, sir. Hold your fucking cunt, I barked, pulling open the pantry door. I reached into each shelf and dumped the contents on the floor. Cups of noodles, single-serve mac and cheese, tuna packets, stale crackers and hot sauce. No booze. More knocking, more pull. Fuck me, I growled. Just a little bit of anything would do. I went through the counter drawers. One had a handful of plastic takeout utensils, and the other was full of random papers, batteries, and other junk. I dug a hand deeper into the junk drawer and reached around to the back, hoping to find a forgotten mini bottle of Jack Daniels. Nothing. More knocking. Another twang of the pole, and I realized the kid's anxiety was fueling my own panicked search for alcohol. Goddamn thin fiberglass walls. An idea blossomed deep below the mounting desperation I felt coming from outside, and I spun around to the bathroom. In the corner, behind the tiny sink, there was a quarter of green liquid mouthwash sitting at the bottom of a crusty bottle. I grabbed it and looked at the label. A little over 20% alcohol. Knock, knock. Pull. Panic. Anxiety. Somebody fucked up. All right, fuck. This was a new low. I spun the cap and went bottoms up, the mint-flavored paint thinner burning a line of fire down my throat. Sweet fucking Christ on a crucifix. The tension in my chest eased just a little, but a little was all I needed. I wiped my watery eyes and went to the door, throwing it open just as the kid was about to knock again. He wore a preppy purple polo with one of those alligators on the breast, and jeans in that dumb rail-skinny fashion. He stared at me in a mix of surprise and horror, and if the roles had been reversed, I'd probably have the same reaction seeing me on the back end of a bender to end all benders. I hacked, clearing my burning throat. If you're here to share the good news, you can shove it straight up your fucking twat. Please, sir. The kid's anxiety was making him stumble over himself. I, I was told, um, uh, oh, oh, here. 
He held out a six-pack of beer like it was some kind of offering. I turned my red-eyed squint from the booze to the kid and then back again. <sighs> I grunted. Really wish I had known about the six-pack before I guzzled mouthwash. The kid looked like he was going to piss himself. I nodded to the pair of chairs sitting between my trailer and the lakeside. The kid followed my gaze and then jerked a little as he processed my direction. When he turned his head, I saw a small tattoo at the base of his skull, partially obscured by a shit buzz cut. It was a small circle with three prominent dots inside it. I don't know, maybe he had a fetish for punctuation. The kid started for the chairs, and I whistled through my teeth to stop him. Beer, I said, holding out a hand. Confused, the kid looked down at the six-pack in his hands. Oh, 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 sorry, yeah. He handed over the booze, and I immediately cracked a bottle, gulping it down before sitting in the lawn chair. The kid sat down across from me, and I felt my senses settle. I reached for the second bottle, twisted the cap, and tossed it into the dirt under the trailer. Uh, uh, Mr. Owens. Mm. Quiet. I drank half the beer while eyeballing the kid. He was twitchy. I didn't like it. But he brought beer, and all things considered, that seemed like a fair trade at the moment. Booze in exchange for some semblance of listening. The beer was cheap and fizzy, and as the edge began to ease, I figured maybe I didn't have to pay much attention, just tossing a nod and a mm-hmm every now and then. Plus, he was twitchy, and twitchy people annoy me. As he talked, I took another drink and glanced sideways at the door to my 32-foot, seen-better-days pull-behind trailer with orange, swoopy decals that were either faded or in various stages of failure. I wish to hell I had found a couple of spare minis. Beer takes the edge off, but whiskey numbs the pain. I've always had a tendency toward cheap alcohol. At first, it was because I got more bang for my buck, an essential motivator in today's gig economy. But then, after the whole empathy problem became a permanent fixture in daily life, the cheap stuff played more to my masochistic tendencies, burning my throat with stinging punishment before succumbing to the eventual numbness. The twitchy boy had grown silent and I cocked an eyebrow at him, tossing him an obligatory, uh-huh, too little, a little too late. Are, are you even paying attention to me? Typical. Always about him. I fucking hate these Gen Z ankle biters. Of course. I lied with an indifferent wave of my beerless hand. I brought the other hand up and took a long, necessary drink. I swished for a moment before swallowing, trying to recall what he had been talking about. You're part of a club. Then you got out. The twitchy boy stared at me as if I was supposed to be saying something more. Well, fuck this bespectacled jackass with a bad haircut. He came to me. Get to the point or get the fuck out. I killed the current bottle, tossed it aside, and cracked a third. The twitchy, four-eyed, Gen Z cock muncher shot to his feet with some kind of self-righteous indignation. Y you know what, Mr. Owens? The little shit asked, attempting to assert himself despite his wavering voice. You came very highly recommended, and, and, and I thought for sure you would be the answer to my problem, but, but obviously this was a mistake, a, 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 a huge a, a, fucking mistake. The walking tit turned in a huff, I shit you not, and stormed off down the path around the lake. Huffy indignation aside, it was the other thing that he said that pricked me. God fucking damn it. Wait, I growled. He stopped and glanced over his shoulder. I don't know if this was the reaction he had hoped for, and honestly, I was getting too buzzed to care. Who sent you? I asked. The walking, talking twat twisted around, pushing those fucking awful hipster glasses up his nose. Uh, Josephine Watson? God damn every single inch of that shit-licking cunt bag straight to fucking hell. The overgrown beanpole of a toddler got a shitty look of hope in his eyes. I really hate that fucking look. Does that, uh, change your, uh, position on things? Shut the fuck up, I said. He took a step back toward the beat-up lawn chairs. Please, Mr. Owens, I really, really need your help. I said, shut up, I growled again, and sit down. The fucking twit actually had to fight a smile as he dropped back into the chair. I needed a moment to think. Chapter 4 Josephine Watson I could count all my friends on one hand and still have a finger left over to tell you to fuck off. Joe was one of those friends. She was older, smart as fuck, and had an eye for cutting through the bullshit. She was a reference librarian and shared her love of books with anyone who cared to listen. She helped fill my copious amounts of isolated downtime with a curated reading list. Joe had been there for me from the beginning, 
when my life started going to shit, the empathy, my religious nut of a brother, Gertie's migraines, everything. Joe was the one who counseled me to leave Gertie. Not that I ever blamed the librarian. I really didn't, merely a statement of fact. But she had been there for me during an impossible situation. Joe was also the one who helped me figure out that alcohol could numb the worst effects of the pull. She knew the kind of gig work I dabbled in, and, more importantly, she knew better than to send me assholes. Which meant... I took another look at the twitchy, buzz-headed, four-eyed, Gen Z shit-fuck in the purple polo. Nope. Total asshole. Then it must have been something else. God damn it, Joe. I emptied the third bottle from the six-pack and tossed it. I nodded at him and said, Talk. Uh, from the beginning? He asked, obviously confused. I grunted in response. That seemed to suffice as the kid quickly started talking. Uh, okay, um... He shook his head. It looked like he was trying to figure out how far back he was supposed to go. Well, yeah, I, like I said, um, I, I joined this group a few months ago. Not far enough. Name, I said, cutting him off. He blinked at me. Come again? Come again? Your name, Twitchy. What is it? He shook his head again, or twitched it, and I couldn't really tell anymore. Fucking mouthwash. Uh, b b Beckett. Be Beckett Miller. I grunted. Beckett. Figures. Anyway, I, I, I joined this group a few months ago, and now you want out. See, I was paying attention. Kind of. I did get out. I said kind of. But, but, but now I need to talk to a friend and convince her to get out too, and I have to go to a rally that the group is holding in order to do that. Either I was missing something, which was likely, or this kid was an idiot, which was also likely. So why are you here? Twitchy Beckett Miller blinked at me again which only made me want to punch his dumb face even more. It's, it's a rally, Mr. Owens, he said slowly. A white nationalist rally? Look, I'm not stupid, just excessively lubricated with alcohol most of the time. It took all of two seconds for the kid's words to process. Fucking Nazis. The Gen Z dipshit suddenly transformed into an apologetic, whiny little bitch. Or maybe he always was, and I was just seeing him clearly for the first time. I, I should have known, I, I know that now, and, and I really should have known better, he said, his eyes welling up. But I thought it was just this social thing, people I could talk to who like a brotherhood. Of fucking Nazis, I interjected. And they say they're not Nazis, and that there's a huge difference between white nationalism and Nazis. But they're fucking Nazis. Tears were rolling down the kid's face at this point. Well, at least his buzzed head made sense now. I swear to God, as soon as I, you, you know, really, really understood what was happening, I, I, I bailed, he babbled. But these guys, Nazis, they're fucking serious, man. I saw them nearly beat a guy to death for even suggesting he'd say something to the cops. I mean, I mean, I got out, but not without them threatening to fucking kill me. And, and if I show up at the rally tonight, I know, I know they're going to fucking sure as shit try. The kid needed a tissue, but since I wasn't offering, he wiped his snotty nose on the sleeve of his polo. I grabbed the fourth beer to think for a minute. On the whole, I did my best to keep myself isolated, but I wasn't oblivious to the escalating racial tensions in the city. Valdez kept me in the loop on some details about the growing white nationalism movement and the abject failure of law enforcement or city officials to do anything about it. It used to be everyone knew Nazis were the bad guys. The sky was blue, the grass was green, and Nazis were evil. But somewhere along the line, an orange-faced, pussy-grabbing reality TV host was elected president, and all of a sudden, years of bullshit PC culture paved the way for some massive fucking social blinders. Nazis weren't Nazis anymore. They were white nationalists. White pride is no different than black pride, right? Or blue pride, or fucking black and gold pride. Fuck that. Those jackals can call it whatever they want, but the sky's still blue, the grass is still green, and a turd still stinks no matter what label you put on it. I've done some bad shit and worked some shady gigs, so it's not like I'm claiming to be Fred fucking Rogers, but even I know Nazis are evil. The ultimate bad guys. Who is she? I asked. Back at Fuckface Miller didn't understand my question. I explained. The girl you want to extricate from our local chapter of the goddamn Nazi fucking white supremacists. Who is she? Beckett dropped his head and shook it. My psychic pull was long dulled, but I could still feel his sadness and despair. She's a good person, Mr. Owens. She really is. 
She's a Nazi, I stated with wide-eyed clarity. Look, I just need five minutes, and I, and I think I can get through to her. You can't just text her an emoji. What? what Skip it. Did you just... I said, skip it. The, the, the group, they, they, they cut her off from the outside world. They screen her calls and texts, and there's no other way to reach her. And if I don't get to her tonight... My two options, take the job or take another day in bed, were quickly narrowing. I needed the money, and I was going to help him as a favor to Joe albeit begrudgingly, as is my typical prerogative. Also, fuck Nazis. You said something about going to the cops, I said. The kid sighed helplessly. Since they're Nazis, I continued, I'm guessing they already did something, as if being a Nazi wasn't bad enough. The kid rocked his head back and forth. I swear if I had known from the start I would have never gotten involved. Just spit it out, kid. He looked like he was bolstering his courage. They, they killed someone, he finally said. A, a, uh, a, a black, or, uh, African-American someone, obviously. Uh, fucking Nazis. I, I, I mean, he was homeless, but, but still. But still? Goddamn Nazis. And there might be more, I don't know. I think there were more, maybe. Probably. Because they're Nazis? I pointed out, in case he forgot. And if I don't get to Corey tonight, well, she doesn't know it, but they're on some kind of eugenics kick and want to tighten the ranks, cleanse the group, you know? And this Corey, I said, she's a, uh, her parents. Uh, no, 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 she's white, Mr. Owens, but she's a girl. These guys, these guys are fucking insane. It's an incredibly short hop from white nationalism to white supremacy and an even shorter hop to male superiority. Between the assorted ditches and gutters I do business in, I would know. And the thing of it is... The tears started up again, his voice hitching. She, she, she wouldn't even be involved with them. If it, if it weren't for me... Beckett Miller looked up at me with pleading eyes, tears streaking his cheeks. Please, please, Mr. Owens. I, I have to make this right. I have to try, but I... I need protection. And, and, and Josephine said you're the best. I, I can pay. I can... I'm not cheap, I demurred. Beckett pulled a handsomely fat wad of cash from a pocket and held it out to me. This is what I have right now, but I can get more later. Hmm. I eyeballed the cash wad and wondered how much more the preppy purple poloed kid was good for. I charge extra for Nazis. I, I've got a small portfolio I can empty. Please, this is important, and, 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 and it, it, it's just one night. Just one night, sure. Just one person. Just one punch. I opened the last of the cheap fizzy beers and drank as I mulled it over. It sounded simple enough. Show up, intimidate, maybe rough a few people up, collect some cash, buy some booze, and retreat back into hibernation with a fresh stack of books from Joe, safely tucked away from people and their useless fucking emotions. But a rally? Literally the opposite of the Abraham Owens prime directive of avoiding large crowds. But Joe wouldn't have sent Beckett Miller my way if she didn't think it was worthwhile. I could go back and forth with the pros and cons, but it boiled down simply enough. I needed the cash, preferably as soon as possible. And Joe, well, she gets all the favors she needs. Also, I fucking hate Nazis. Chapter 5 As a general rule of thumb, I don't drive if I don't have to. To be fair, the spirit of this rule applied to everything in my post-Gertie life. I didn't leave the trailer unless I had to. I didn't work unless I had to. I didn't talk to people unless I had to. The reasons were the same across the board. The psychic pull that cranked my empathy all the way up to unbearable made driving on busy roads near impossible, each passing car a whip snap of emotional torture that was as invasive as it was explosive. And if I was lubricated enough to dull the psychic crush of the pull, that just meant getting behind the wheel would be a world-class level of dumbassery. Most of the time, I took the bus. If I was working a job with Valdez, I rode shotgun. Since my gig with Beckett Miller wasn't until that evening, I found myself faced with one of the rare opportunities it was worth taking the truck out. Beckett had left me flush with cash, and Owen's manner was drier than a nun attending midnight mass in the presence of his holy popeness himself. Unless she gets off on that sort of thing. To each their own, I guess. Point is, 
I had more than enough time to blink off the cheap beer and antiseptic mouthwash so I could drive like hell a few miles to Murph's. That's how I ended up sitting in the far corner of the parking lot outside Murph's Liquor. His small shop was located at the end of a strip mall anchored by a low-rent supermarket situated at the opposite end of the building. Murph sat between a seedy adult video store and a large plot of undeveloped land. The video store didn't open until late afternoon, and the empty plot of land was just that. Empty. If I wasn't already sporting a dangerously high, pull-numbing blood alcohol level, Murph's was the safest liquor store in the city to restock my booze supply. It was still morning, and there weren't any other cars on my side of the parking lot. I had backed my truck in and was keeping a careful eye on Murph's storefront. After a few minutes, I was pretty sure there was just a single customer inside. As I waited for my path to clear, my thoughts turned back to the strategy for the day. Step one was simple enough, despite all the necessary guardrails to protect against the pull. Acquire booze. Step two involved minding that first general rule of thumb and dump the truck back at Owen's Manor. This would likely be the best part of my day since I plan to lean heavily into the results of step one and thoroughly drown my super empathy before hopping on a bus to see Josephine. Step three was all Joe. Since she allegedly sent the Beck and Miller twat in the first place, I needed to hear confirmation of his story right from the horse's mouth. If everything checked out, I'd then see what my favorite reference librarian could tell me about the city of St. Charles' growing Nazi problem. Step four, lunch. Preferably large, greasy, and drowned in booze. I'm not sure what step five would be, but it would probably involve more booze. Step six was easy. Meet Peck and Miller at the rally, and punch a Nazi. Step seven, collect the rest of the money from Beckett Miller before returning to the manor. Step eight involved the complex process of drinking even more booze and enjoying a victory cigar to celebrate not having to work another gig again for several months. As I sat there alone in my truck, I smiled. It was a good fucking plan. The lady inside the liquor store finally made her way to the register and paid for her booze. She exited the store and got into a car parked in the front row. About fucking time. I climbed out the cab of my truck as she started to drive off, grabbing my army jacket from the passenger seat and pulling it on. Ah, fuck. The lady was driving up my lane to exit the parking lot. I shuffled around the backside of the truck as she passed by. The pull snapped sharply. The invisible piano wire pulled taut between the lady's head and my chest. With the lady's close proximity and the growing lack of a proper alcoholic dam, the pull yanked powerful vibrations down the invisible wire. I felt a strong, uncomfortable tug deep in my chest, and a second later, my brain flooded with something smooth and warm. I grabbed the edge of the cargo bed to brace myself. She was excited. But, like, really excited. A familiar, tingling arousal spread through my groin, and I felt the telltale signs of an unwanted erection. This lady was horny as fuck. She was planning for a long sex weekend because... Oh, wow. Okay. Her husband was out of town, and she was already soaking in anticipation for one extremely hard and throbbing. The connective, psychic wire snapped as the car pulled away, and I gasped in relief. I rubbed my mouth as I straightened, scanning the parking lot to make sure there would be no other unexpected encounters. The coast was clear. I quickly hoofed it to Murph's front door, while trying desperately to forget that the last time I had properly gotten my dick wet was before Gertie had her first migraine. It was during one of those marathon sex weekends that my new friend eagerly anticipated. One of those days you just committed to staying in bed and doing what needed to be done over and over and over again. Yeah, it's been a while. I pushed through the door and Murph glanced up from behind the register. His face was hidden behind a week of dark scruff, but his eyes were wide and bright, if not strangely distant. Murph wore a dark cardigan and had a general way about him that made me think he was constantly wading through a pool of molasses. I could feel the immediate tension of the piano wire. This time, though, there weren't any of those pulses that vibrated into my chest, rattling my bones and setting off a cacophony of unwanted emotions inside my head. Bushy eyebrows went up, and a slow smile crept across Murph's lips. Mr. Owens, he said, words rolling out gently like Grandma hefting a bowling ball down the lane. Been a bit. He shuffled around the counter as I grabbed one of the tiny liquor store shopping carts. He casually patted me on the shoulder as he passed, throwing the lock on the door and flipping the open sign to closed so I could shop in peace. We've danced this routine once or twice before. 
Despite his closeness, despite the unsettling physical contact, I still wasn't picking up any vibrations from Murph. Putting aside the liquor shop's location and proximity to other stores, this was the main reason for coming to Murph's. The pull was there, but it was as if something was inhibiting the emotions on the other end. I didn't know much about Murph, but I did know he fought in one of those pointless wars, took a bullet in the head, and miraculously survived. Suffice it to say, Murph must have had something scrambled upstairs. Either that, or Murph Wilkins was just one massively chill motherfucker. Whatever it was, I was just grateful for the friendly, if not a little odd, purveyor of liquor. I heard about Dockside, Murph mentioned as he eased his way behind the register. I hesitated before starting down the aisle. Admittedly, that night at the bar wasn't my finest hour. Word around the block is that big ol' Abraham Owens is just this side of Breaking Bad, Murph mused slowly. Who says I haven't already? I asked. Murph chuckled, but even that overt expression wasn't sending any vibrations down the wire. Been my experience that the line between good and bad tends to get so fuzzy sometimes even the good guys don't know where they stand. I grunted. Standing for something is a quick way to get yourself knocked down. I go where the money is, plain and simple. Well, no, Murph replied with a slow shrug. You seem to be anything but. Murph tended to have a way with words, and that way tended to be confusing. And it wasn't like that otherwise overactive sixth sense was being any help. Murph nodded, registering my confusion. Plain and simple, Mr. Owens, he explained. You are anything but. Okay, how about this? I won't make any assumptions as to whether or not you're a bad guy, as long as you don't, either. Hmm, fair enough, I muttered, turning back down the aisle. You take your time, Abe. I'll be here when you're ready. I grabbed the first bottle of whiskey at the same time my phone started buzzing. Valdez was calling again. I tossed a glance back to the register to confirm that Murph was behind the counter and the door was locked. The only place better to talk to Valdez was back at the manor, but I had already postponed this chat for too long. I guess it's nice knowing there's at least one person out there worrying about you. I was about to flip the phone open when glass shattered violently from behind me. Even as I spun around, I realized I hadn't felt anybody approach. Empty the fucking register! Chapter 6 After discovering the front door to Murph's liquor was locked, Two thugs busted the glass window across the door and ducked under the metal frame. Neither one wasted time hiding their identities. They were pale, angry fuckers, hair buzzed to nearly nothing, wearing white t-shirts with black suspenders. Each sported a small tattoo on the back of their heads at the base of their skulls, three simple dots surrounded by a larger circle. Their eyes bulged with fury and spittle flew as they screamed at Murph, pointing semi-automatics at the man. Huh. <sighs> Nobody cares how big your gun is. Nobody wants to compare sizes. And yet fuckers like these always insist on whipping them out and shoving them in faces. The thugs didn't bother to sweep the store, and they didn't realize I was in the aisle behind them. I assume when they found the door locked, they figured the store was empty except for Murph. Bottle of whiskey still in hand, I pocketed the still-buzzing phone and took a step forward. And then that strange reprieve from the sickening pull evaporated, like my sobriety on days ending in Y. The rage coming from the two thugs slammed into me like a sucker punch to the gut. I fell to a crouch in the aisle as a storm of anger erupted in my head. Almost instantly, it became a deafening roar. Sweat pricked across my skull, coherent thought took a leave of absence, and the room began to spin. The two thugs kept screaming, but I couldn't hear their words. The only world I could comprehend had started in the heads of the thugs and now existed in painfully vibrant living color inside my own head. It was a world of pure hatred for that goddamn ape-headed jungle bunny. Murph's molasses-like movement to empty the register felt even slower in the swirling chaos. Money, you fucking nigger! One of those guns whipping back and forth finally exploded from all the useless friction, and a bottle of alcohol shattered behind Murph, spraying booze and glass across his shoulders. Okay, fuck these cunts. I groaned something angry and guttural as I tried to claw my way out of that unwanted world of hate. I twisted the cap on the bottle and started sucking whiskey down, desperately focusing on the burning liquid as it splashed down my open throat, tearing bright lines of fire as it went. If the rage from the thugs was dialed to 11, taking the edge off brought it down to a 9. I could deal with a 9. A hey, fuck twats! 
I called out, pushing myself off the ground. The screaming stopped abruptly, and the two thugs turned slowly on their heels, obviously caught off guard that they weren't committing a racist lynching of a black liquor store owner in private. I rose to my full height, squaring my shoulders. One of the thugs looked a little more worried than the other. He hissed at his dickless fuck buddy. Dude, it's the guy! I whipped a whiskey bottle at his head, and it thunked sharply, dropping the asshole flat. Murph had wanted to know if I had become one of the bad guys, if what happened at Dockside meant that, plain and simple, Abraham Owens had given up his last remaining shot at being the good guy. Murph would probably take this as proof, then, that I wasn't as bad as I looked. But the truth was that bravery is easy to summon when you have nothing to live for. Asshole number two swung his big gun up, but I was already charging down the aisle. I threw my shoulder into the punk and slammed him into the counter with the full weight of my body. The gunshot went wide, and when he tried to bring the gun around, I grabbed his wrist and twisted until he screamed and I heard bones grind and tendons snap. I knocked the gun across the floor and barely noticed the phone still buzzing in my pocket. Someone screamed from behind me. Fuck you, Owens! The first thug had scrambled to his feet and aimed his gun at my head. I grunted, trying to think around the waves of rage still splashing around my skull, creeping their way back up to a ten. Wait, did these fuckers know me? I pushed away from the sobbing asshole with a busted wrist. Another sharp click from behind me. I gently eased around and saw Murph pointing an obscenely large revolver past me, aiming it at the thug with the gun to my head. Some men whip out their big guns because they're compensating for something. Other men, when they do finally whip it out, aim to take care of business without blowing their load. All right, put it down, son, Murph said in his absurdly calm tone. I turned back to the thug. He was an arm's length away. The semi-auto was literally in my face. His chin was shaking, and the pull told me that his blinding rage had dissolved into a desperate fear. Murph continued to try to defuse the situation, that beast of a revolver steady as a goddamn rock. Now, let's not be doing anything. The fuckhead's semi-auto wavered, and I snapped into action. To hell with peaceful resolutions. My left hand swiped, knocking the gun out of my face, and my wrecking ball of a right whipped out and punched the thug in the nose. He went down hard, sprawled backward on the tile. The pull continued to ease as Murph's calming influence somehow numbed the psychic empathy down to a distant... nothing. The thug with a broken wrist sobbed softly. The buzz of my phone was suddenly all too loud in the quiet of the liquor store. You should get that. Murph commented passively, reaching for his own phone, no doubt to call 911. Weird dude. I flipped open the phone as I stepped back into the aisle to grab a fresh bottle of whiskey. Owens, I grunted by way of greeting. The response was fast and hushed. Oh, thank fucking Christ, where in the name of fuck have you been? Look, never mind that now. I'm stuck in a real fucking situation here. Fucking Valdez. I could tell from the agitation in her voice that it would be useless to explain how I'd been in the middle of my own real fucking situation. Slow down. What's going on? Dude, God damn it! I told you, I'm fucking stuck! She hissed from the other end of the call. You know, this is exactly why I wanted you with me on this. Didn't you get my fucking message? You know what? Fuck, no, it doesn't matter. Just get your ass down here for the love of fucking Christ! I sighed and briefly considered how my plan for the day, that beautiful, simple, booze-filled plan, was already getting fucked sideways. Where are you? I'm trapped in a fucking corpse cooler, Abe! Valdez whisper yelled over the phone. I turned slowly in the aisle, phone to ear, bottle of whiskey in hand, a portrait of idiotic confusion. The hell are you talking about, Valdez? There was an angry huff on the other end of the line. St. Charles General, I'm stuck in the goddamn morgue, the fucking refrigerator to be exact. It's fucking cold and I can't open it from the inside, so get your goddamn fucking ass down here, you Rambo reject ambulatory jockstrap. She has such a way with words, especially when asking for favors. What the hell are you doing at the morgue? I can explain it when you bust me out of this fucking fridge, Abe. I looked down at the bottle of whiskey in my hand. Fucking Valdez. I was really looking forward to getting wasted. I'm on my way, I said before flipping the phone shut and pocketing it. I took the single bottle to the counter, stepping over the two thugs. Murph looked up with that same wide-eyed, distant expression on his face. You should split before the cops arrive. No need for you to get tangled up in any of this, he said. You sure you'll be okay? Murph chuckled. I don't think the fella you clocked is getting up anytime soon. And if the other guy tries something, 
Murph waved his pistol in the air nonchalantly. I grunted and fished a bill out of my pocket. I'll try to swing by tomorrow for the rest of it. Murph nodded slowly, like he was underwater, or under jello, or just under. I'll be here. Emergency sirens rose in the distance. I turned to the shattered door, flipped the lock, and pushed open the empty frame. Hey, Abe, Murph called out as I stepped outside. For what it's worth, you're one of the good guys. At least in my book. Chapter 7 I took the back roads where I could, but like death, taxes, and inbred racist white assholes, crossing the paths of other drivers proved inevitable. Every time I passed someone on the road, the whip snap of the pull came with an instant flood of emotions that evaporated as quickly as they manifested. At red lights, where more and more vehicles stacked up around me, the mounting deluge felt like a slow-motion tsunami of feelings in an already overflowing kiddie pool. And it's rarely just happy or sad, which is not to say that even basic emotions aren't problematic. It's a complex spectrum of rapid-fire conflict, hammering incessantly at my useless brain. And the anxiety? Jesus fucking Christ nailed to a crucifix. This world is drowning in anxiety. I kept my eyes locked on the road ahead, desperately focusing all my attention on Valdez and getting to St. Charles General as quickly and safely as possible. Even though I didn't see any of the faces, I still felt everything. Whip snap. Nervous. Heart racing. Sweaty palms. Should have taken the beta blockers. Why the fuck am I this stressed out about getting a raise? All the work I do? I earned it, goddammit. I deserve this fucking raise. And if he doesn't want to acknowledge that... Whip snap. Frustration. Panic. Why hasn't he called yet? What the hell is wrong with him? At least fucking text. Or is that it? Is he fucking ghosting me? After I let him stick his pathetic cock... Shit, now he's calling? Whip snap. Rage. Anger. These assholes need to learn to fucking drive. Go back to your own fucking country, you goddamn oriental... Whip snap. Desperation. Uneasy. Sick. Payday isn't until Friday, and all the money is already spent. Still need to feed the kids dinner, but the overdraft fees. Whip snap. Excited. Lustful. That new phone is the tits. Haven't paid off the old one, but fuck it. Whip snap. Not another fucking commercial. Whip snap. Government just wants to control us. Whip snap. Taking our jobs, taking our money, taking our women. Whip snap. Go to Fun World this weekend. A selfie at the Creamsicle Wall will get a ton of likes. Whip snap. And on and on and on. Jesus fuck. By the time I got to the hospital, I had a hard time catching my breath. I stayed on the outskirts of the parking lot until I located the morgue, and then I backed into a spot at the far end of the lot. With a long, exhausted breath, I slumped over the steering wheel and let my eyes fall shut. The drive had left me emotionally drained and physically worn out. I've had shit drives before, bad episodes full of crippling, unwanted emotions, on and off the road for that matter. During the worst of it, the idea of killing myself was never too distant, anything to escape that endless mental torture. Maybe one day I'll go through with it. It's not like I've got a whole lot to live for anyhow. Until then, there's isolation. And failing that, booze. My head felt like a 16-pound bowling ball had been crammed into my skull, but I managed to lift it looking at the massive, multi-level hospital campus in front of me. And then I proceeded to curse out Valdez. Again. The tension in my chest throbbed, snagging hard on the hospital. I thought I had parked far enough away, but the amount of emotion, grief, anger, frustration, horror, sadness, hopelessness, all condensed into one location, it was like the hospital exuded its own emotional, gravitational force. A goddamn pulsing black hole of empathic fucking doom. Those unlucky enough to cross the event horizon would get sucked in and lost forever into the void. Even at my most lucid, I couldn't think of a worse place for someone with super empathy to visit. Fucking Valdez. I grabbed the bottle of whiskey from the passenger seat, cracked the top, and started drinking. If you want to know how to suck down an entire bottle of whiskey in 30 seconds, the first thing you need to learn is how to open your throat. This involves taking a small swallow right when you start chugging. Second, Commit to the chug and don't even think about pussing out. If you hesitate or change your mind after you start, that'll only make it worse. Once you're going, it'll burn like shit, so better to get it down as quickly as possible. Third, find yourself a crippling condition that necessitates such drastic measures. Finally, the three Ps. Practice, practice, practice. It also probably doesn't hurt to have a kind of super level of tolerance. My point 
Don't try this at home, kids. And if you do, you're a fucking twat, and you'll probably wind up in the hospital. The last of the whiskey splashed down my throat, and I tossed the bottle into the passenger footwell, where it clattered against other empties. As the warmth from the alcohol spread to my extremities, the tightness in my chest loosened. The glowing nuclear reactor of emotional distress that was St. Charles General dimmed gently, easing into a mild case of whiskey-goggled normality. I pushed the door open and climbed out of the truck. After a cautious half-turn and confirming that distinct feeling of a shit-ton of whiskey sloshing around inside, I searched around for any of those pesky, useless... feelings. Nothing so far. I put one foot in front of the other. Despite how the ground would occasionally twist under my feet like a cheap, off-brand jello, my world seemed to have returned to what passed as normal. With a satisfied grunt, I started across the parking lot. Hang in there, Valdez. I'm on my way. Chapter 8 The trick to not being bothered by stupid people is to always look like you know what you're doing. It probably also helps if you look like you could beat the shit out of anybody who crosses your path. Look, I know my strengths, and the main one happens to be punching things. After clearing a double bank airlock of sliding doors, I ignored an information desk, went straight to a bank of elevators, and pressed the down button. While waiting for the doors to open, a spindly, tweedy, twatty man in a coat with elbow patches stepped up alongside me. I glanced sideways, and he gave me a courteous nod. I squinted at him, then I growled. Nothing overt, just a subtle, guttural rumble that made my tweedy friend look around in confusion. When he realized the noise was coming from me, he took a half step back before reconsidering the use of the elevator. Doors slid open, and I stepped inside the elevator alone writing it down to the morgue level. There are a lot of things people could say about me. I'm big. I punch like the rock on steroids. If someone is dumb enough to punch back, I can take a beating better than that phone Nokia used to make. I cry like a fucking pansy during Pixar flicks, but I probably try to convince you that has more to do with super empathy than Pixar's inhuman ability to cut to the emotional core of any given story. I can also hold my fucking booze. If a normal person drink what I had just sucked down, they'd probably be dead, or at least passed out. If they were awake, their brains would work like Play-Doh through that plastic spaghetti press. And while I don't pretend to be the sharpest tool in the shed, I do end up with my own flavor of Play-Doh brains. Just without that spaghetti press thing. Yeah, I can hold my fucking booze. During the short ride down, I tried to work out the best way to get to the body coolers where Valdez was trapped. The elevator bell dinged, and I stumbled into a long hallway leading to the morgue. I tripped over myself, falling to the wall and sliding down a bit, crying out as I went. Okay, maybe it was a bit much. An attendant sitting at a small desk halfway down the hall looked over. She rose to her feet as I put on my best distressed face, pushing off the wall and stumbling for the desk. Sir, are you okay? The attendant asked as I approached her. She must have been in her late 20s or early 30s. She wore a black sweater over pale green scrubs. Her eyes were wide with concern, and as my brain swam laps in that Olympic-sized pool of whiskey, I felt a distant tug of panic coming from her. Her hand hovered near the hospital phone while her personal phone sat on the desk, some mobile game paused on the screen. I hacked and cleared my throat, leaning into the whiskey and playing the bereft human. They told me... I can't fucking believe this is happening. You know, one minute you're alive and everything is fine. The next fucking hell. Look, I was told my friend was here. D the body? Fuck. She looked like she was going to need more convincing. Sir, if I could just... I slammed my hand on the desk. They told me St. Charles was the place. They told me to come down here. Are you now telling me you don't know where the body is? The attendant's jaw set. Sir, I'm going to need you to calm down. There's a reason I prefer to just punch things. Acting, subterfuge, and subtlety made me feel like I was prancing around in a goddamn tutu. I slumped forward on the desk. Oh, come on, lady. I'm the only guy he's got. They said he was down here. Wait, are you talking about the John Doe stabbing Vic? Bingo. I resisted the urge to look at her directly. I just need... Look, if you could maybe... Ah, fuck, lady. I just need to see him. One last time. I finally rolled my head up and did my best to send her a pleading look. 
She let out a long, wispy breath through her nose. I usually get a heads up on a body ID, she said. But you're already here, I guess. Score one for not punching things, I guess. Follow me. The attendant took me a little farther down the hallway and into a large room with widely spaced stainless steel tables. The whole of the far wall was dedicated to a massive refrigeration unit with rows of small little stainless steel doors, each sporting its own handle. Valdez had trapped herself in one of those corpse coolers. The attendant moved to one of the doors on the left of the unit. She opened it and pulled out the sliding tray. We stood on opposite sides, looking down at the naked corpse of a middle-aged man of African-American descent. Is this your friend? I sucked in a shallow breath and avoided her eyes. Uh, could I maybe get, uh, you know, could I get a moment alone with him? She nodded slowly and stepped out of the room, leaving the door open a crack. I took another look at the corpse, clocking the multiple knife wounds and deep slashes across his torso that flayed his skin apart. Sorry, pal. I grunted. I turned away from the corpse and started pulling open random doors, whispering Valdez's name. I was hoping it hadn't taken me too long to get there and that she was still okay. And then I heard a soft tapping coming from further down the refrigeration unit. There's my girl. I flung the door open and yanked the tray out, revealing Valdez curled and shivering, her normally olive skin an unseemly shade of ass-freezing pale. Motherfucker! She hissed, pushing herself up and off the tray. I slipped out of my coat and put it around her shoulders. It took you fucking long enough, you goddamn Jurassic lug nut. Yep, there's my girl. I started reclosing all of the open fridge doors. Look, I assume we need to sneak you out of here. Fuck me sideways. Valdez shuffled over to the body of the John Doe. Is this the guy, Owens? I had no idea who the guy was supposed to be. And knowing Valdez, she probably didn't know either. He's a John Doe. Knife attack. Valdez pushed curly black hair behind her ears as she leaned over to inspect the body. She looked smaller than usual, swimming inside my jacket. And when she started nodding enthusiastically, Valdez looked downright childlike. This is the guy, Abe. I couldn't find him earlier and then I got stuck in the fucking fridge, but this is my guy. I glanced over at the door. Not sure how much time we've got before the attendant comes back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold up. Valdez started taking pictures with her phone. She started at his head before moving to the knife wounds, getting close enough to capture the details left by the knife after it flayed the man's skin. I'm working a job for Will Jacoby at the St. Charles Sentinel, she explained as she photographed. He's putting together an expose on the Sons of the Golden Future. There have been five questionable deaths of African Americans in the last two weeks. One is an open murder investigation, and the other three are being called suicides. But it's more likely that there are lynchings. Jacoby wants to see if they can't all be tied back to the Sons of the Golden Future. And this guy... Valdez gestured to the dead man in front of her. Could be the linchpin. Valdez glanced up, horror in her eyes. Fuck, she grimaced. I did not mean it like that. I held up a hand. How about we get you out of here first, and then you can tell me all about your linchpins. And then something clicked. Shit sticks. She called them the sons of the golden future, and my Play-Doh brains took forever to process everything that had been laid out right in fucking front of me. The John Doe stabbing Vic was probably the black someone Beckett fucking Miller had been talking about. The sons of the golden future were the fucking Nazis. And then, add to all of that how the African-American proprietor of a local liquor store was nearly robbed and probably almost murdered. Valdez was investigating a Nazi murder conspiracy on behalf of the local newspaper. God fucking damn it. This gig with Beckett Miller might not be as simple as showing up and punching a Nazi after all. I felt that distant, muted tug on my chest before I heard the soft padding of shoes beyond the door. The attendant was on her way back. Okay, we need to get out of here, and then we can compare notes. I growled, grabbing Valdez's arm and guiding her so she would be behind the door when it opened. Compare notes? What the fuck does that mean? I waved a hand to shush her and returned to my original spot next to the John Doe a second before the attendant swung the door open. She stepped over to the body and held up a clipboard to write on. I realize this is a difficult time, sir, the attendant said, putting on her compassionate face in the same way I put on my bereft face. But if you could provide me with some information about your friend... Behind the attendant, Valdez snuck around the door and into the hallway. 
In a glacially dumb realization, it dawned on me that she was still wearing my jacket. Great fucking genius, Owens. In an even bigger stroke of Play-Doh brain genius, I had all of nothing to tell the attendant about the John Doe. Certainly nothing that would make logical sense or get me out of here quickly. Name, date of birth, the attendant said. Nearest living relative? Fuck. The attendant's face twisted into a curious expression, and she cocked an eyebrow. I think she just realized I wasn't wearing my jacket anymore. Time to go big or go home. Those fucking Nazi bastards! I exploded, grasping at the nearest thing my Play-Doh brains could make sense of. The attendant blinked rapidly in confusion and shifted awkwardly. Oh, uh, excuse me? Those goddamn racist fucking cunts! I cried, cranking up the volume. This isn't the first time those Nazi scumrags did this, and I swear to fucking God if the cops in this city don't do something about these white supremacist Nazi pig fuckers, I'm gonna rip their fucking heads off and take a fucking shit down there. Sir, I need you to calm down. Ah, uh, there it was. Calm down? I roared. You want me to fucking calm down? My friend was murdered by Nazis, and no one is lifting a goddamn finger to do a single fucking thing about it. The other trick to not being bothered by stupid people? Be big, loud, and don't give them a goddamn second to react. I stormed through the door and down the hallway to the elevators. Sir! My fist shot out sideways and slammed into the wall. I pulled my arm back and kept walking, leaving a chunky hole in the drywall. The attendant decided not to pursue any further questions. And look at that. I still got to punch something. Chapter 9 Valdez was smoking a cigarette between a panel van and the building. It was an area that must have served as the loading dock for the morgue. She was stomping her feet to warm up as she paced the length of the van. When she noticed me standing in the gap, she sighed in relief. Oh, thank fucking Christ, she said. We gotta bounce. Jacoby thinks a city councilman might be connected to this whole mess, and there's a closed-door meeting in about an hour. Hold on a sec, I said, cutting her off. You shouldn't have come out here by yourself. Valdez jabbed me in the chest. Her fist was small and stung about as bad as a mosquito bite. If you would have just answered your fucking phone, jackass, it's not like the job doesn't pay. I was a little preoccupied, I growled. Look, whatever. She tried to walk around me, but I grabbed her arm. Valdez! Pretty sure we can talk in the car, Abraham. I sighed, frustrated. Plato brains and Valdez is a fast way to go crazy. Listen, this whole Nazi thing is more complicated than it looks. You're telling me they're having a rally tonight, and if Jacoby's suspicions about the councilman are right, the police might be too fucking busy scarfing donuts if any violence breaks out. You're not hearing me, I said. I'm doing a job at this rally. Valdez's face twisted in simultaneous confusion, disdain, and disappointment. What? What the fuck are you doing working at a goddamn white supremacist rally? I shook my head. It's not anything like that. This kid hired me to help him talk to his girlfriend. Wait, what, you're adding relationship counselor to your fucking resume now, Abe? Valdez rolled her eyes, and before I could clarify, she grabbed my arm and pulled. Can we please just get going? We need to get to the city council office, and I'm fucking starving as fuck. All right. Priorities. Plus, a big greasy lunch would help me get back on track with the day's plan. I conceded and turned to the gap. A police siren let out a whoop-whoop, and a cruiser pulled up, blocking our path to the parking lot. Through the passenger window, we could see an officer wearing a black uniform. He was talking to dispatch over the radio. A moment later, he climbed out of the cruiser and looked across the roof at us. Fuck. This wasn't good. It took me longer than I care to admit to recognize the cop. And thanks to the Plato brains, it took another second to register the black latex gloves that cops wore when they knew they were about to deal with something dirty. And speaking of dirty, the cop's face finally clicked. Officer Stu fucking Sampson. If I'm being honest, I have a face cops like to hit. It's broad with a nose that's been broken a few too many times. Officer Sampson just so happened to be responsible for a good chunk of that violence. This cop was as dirty as they came. He was the proverbial bad apple that spoiled the barrel. Abraham fucking Owens, Samson said, a smug grin twisting his face. This guy was so dirty, slime practically oozed from his pores. 
Just the low-life fucktard I was looking for. Oh, this is definitely not good, Valdez muttered from behind me. What in the holy name of fuck was Officer Stu Sampson doing at the hospital? Sampson walked around his police cruiser while Valdez and I collectively stepped backward into the impromptu alley between the panel van and the hospital campus wall. My Play-Doh brains weren't functioning at any level remotely appropriate for this situation. But as long as I stayed between Samson and Valdez, I figured she'd be able to duck out behind the van if shit went sideways. Officer Samson, I said, lifting my hands up and displaying open palms. I knew you liked to send people to the hospital, but I guess I didn't realize you liked to visit them after. Keep your hands where I can see them, Owens, Samson growled, resting that black surgical gloved hand on his holstered gun. I glanced at my hands, already on deliberate display. Fucking asshole. He nodded to the stuccoed surface of the hospital wall. Put your hands on the wall and spread your legs. Valdez snapped. The fuck, man? You can't just roll up. I took another step back, prompting Valdez to move closer to the rear of the van. To Samson, I said in a steady voice, It'd be real nice to know what this is about. Pretty sure I haven't done anything. Samson stepped into the narrow space. At least, I mused, I haven't done anything yet. Plenty of light left in the day, Samson sneered. Plus, I've got a pair of witnesses that placed you in an attempted robbery this morning. I felt Valdez's eyes on me. We really needed to compare notes. I racked my brains and cursed the whiskey. With the Beckett Miller gig happening in a few hours, I didn't have the luxury of playing victim to a dirty cop's perverted fantasies of law and order. And with Valdez riding shotgun, it didn't seem wise to resort to violence. A goddamned rock in a hard place, and me with whiskey-drowned Play-Doh brains. I said, hands on the wall, Owens, Samson ordered. I took another step back and nodded at Samson's shoulder. A small plastic box with a round, protruding lens was clipped to his uniform. That thing on? Officer Samson gave me a toothy smile that dripped with sleaze. Nah, man. See, it's all about timing. Start rolling too soon, people might get the wrong idea. Start rolling too late, you run the risk of raising the kind of questions no one likes to answer and having evidence dismissed. The trick is to set everything up just right. And hope to God someone else isn't filming you, right, motherfucker? Valdez pushed in next to me, her phone in the air, recording the interaction. Samson frowned. His hand was still resting on the holstered gun. He thumbed the holster lock, and I could see he was trying to calculate how long Valdez had been recording. His eyes went dark, and then he smirked. It was the look of a man committed to doing whatever it took. I've dealt with bigger shits after my morning coffee, little girl. Like I said, dirtier than a gravedigger's shovel. Yeah, what are you gonna do, you fucking pig? Bust us for what? Fucking breathing? I fucking dare you, you cocksucking son of a... For once, I deeply regretted the booze. I needed to come up with an exit strategy that wouldn't completely fuck us over. But between the whiskey and the lack of any helpful pull, I was at a distinct disadvantage. And Valdez, well, she was just getting warmed up. I needed to sober up, fast. Hands still in the air, I committed to my own whatever-it-takes course of action and took an otherwise ill-advised step toward Samson. Easy, Owens, the officer ordered. My eyes darted deliberately down to his holstered gun. Don't tell me you went out of your way to back me into a corner just to shoot me. Samson's jaw clenched, and his fingers tightened on the gun. I was getting closer to him, but the pull was muddy and distant. All right, fuck it. Desperate times and that whole bucket of jizz. Abe! Valdez tried to reach for me as I took another step forward. Samson's eyes went wide. I said, hands on the wall, Owens! I took another step toward the dirty cop, knowing that Valdez had her phone trained on us. What's the matter, officer? I asked, letting the question trail off. Another step, and I was right in his face. He looked like a man who was suddenly questioning his life choices. Ah, uh, performance anxiety. The command came down through gritted teeth. Back down, Owens. Ah! I bellowed, letting my eyes go wide as I grinned in Samson's face. Literally the exact opposite of what your mother said. Abe! Samson's fist exploded like a ramrod, slamming into my nose. 
I stumbled backward, electric pain pulsing through my head, starting at my nose, curling around my eyeballs, and then stabbing through the gray matter before knocking on the back of my skull. Blood spilled from my nose, and that whiskey-drowned Play-Doh fog lifted. A piano wire twanged in my chest. Bingo, motherfucker. Chapter 10 Jesus Christ, Abe! I ignored Valdez and swung my head up to assess Samson with clear eyes and a fresh pull. For the first time, I noticed Samson's other hand. His gun was still holstered. He had punched me with his shooting hand, but his left hand gripped a hunting knife. The piano wire in my chest throbbed, and for once, I embraced the flood of empathy and all the psychic insight that came with it. Anger. Rage. Impotence. Officer Stuart Samson a beat cop at the St. Charles Police Department for over a year, but he was dirty as fuck, always had been, wherever he went. Every time the shit started to catch up with him, and a department was getting too hot, he bounced to another city. Records like that should follow a cop, but they don't. And Samson had made a good career out of it. It. Something about it. The body cams were designed to hold cops accountable. But Samson was a pro at using them to his own advantage, weaving and manipulating the narrative to suit his needs, and using obviously unimpeachable video evidence to back up his claims. He didn't just plant evidence, he manufactured it right alongside the crime, the perpetrator, and whatever the fuck else he needed. Whatever the fuck else he was paid to do. Fuck. That was it. Yeah, Samson was dirty, but when the money is right, most people don't mind getting down in the muck and slinging mud. Officer Samson was hardly a lone wolf, and definitely no criminal mastermind. He was on the take, meaning someone else was behind the money. Which might explain the impotence. Sure, Samson was just another dirty cop, selling his services to the highest bidder. But maybe he was caught in the middle of a power struggle, or conflicting bidders. And for that matter, wait, nervous. Samson was more nervous than he was letting on. Maybe about Valdez and her camera. Or maybe it was just me. I had crossed paths with Samson and a few other of SCBD's less than finest enough times for them to know that it's generally a bad idea to stick me between a rock and a hard place. Now that I felt his nervousness, I could see it more clearly in his eyes. He was trying to assess me quickly, turning the knife handle around in his hand. No, scratch that. He had already plotted. Samson had all this mapped out long before he had cornered us. Right now, he was calculating how to execute his next step, and he was nervous about fucking up. That was the it. Listen, I said, speaking low and forcefully. I was leaning into the pull, forcing my own vibrations down the wire. It took a lot of focus, and certainly wasn't as simple as just punching someone, but every now and then. Valdez tried to reach for me, but I waved her back. Samson's eye twitched as his subconscious struggled against the pole, and I was worried he was wound too tight to affect anything substantive. His mouth fell open, compelled by that invisible vibration he felt in his own chest. But his arm was already in motion. The hunting knife swung wide, and I reacted without thinking. I knocked his arm sideways and grabbed his wrist, twisting it sharply until he dropped the blade. I thought briefly of the punk at Murph's with a busted wrist and immediately released Samson. He was still a cop, and still wearing a body cam, even if it wasn't currently on. Samson stumbled back, and I quickly scooped up the knife, before I promptly realized my galactic-sized fuck-up. Goddamn fucking Play-Doh brains. Officer Stu shithead Samson rose to his full height, a smarmy smirk plastered across that sleazy face. He clicked on the body cam. I looked down at the knife in my hand the knife he had swung at me while wearing those black fucking latex gloves. Gloves that were made for handling dirty things. Dirty things like murder weapons. Murder weapons that you didn't want your fingerprints all over. Samson didn't have to say a single fucking word because the pole told me the whole story. I looked down at the knife and saw trace remains of dried blood. Blood from the John Doe that Valdez and I had just visited. He had been stabbed and brutally carved in such a way that the cops withheld the details in hopes it might help identify the killer. Not that it would matter anymore. My fingerprints were on the goddamn murder weapon. And now Samson had a video of me holding the knife. Dirty as they fucking come. And Samson was relieved. 
Despite Valdez still recording the entire encounter, the scumbag was actually feeling a sense of accomplishment. He was able to pull off this little scam of his without even drawing his gun. Well, fuck you, Stu Samson. You picked a bad day for this, Samson, I growled. Not like I had a fucking choice. In the same way I took a step back and let the pull do its thing, I put a foot forward and let my other marquee ability take the lead, which is considerably easier since it's my fist. My turn, motherfucker. The knife dropped from my hand, and my fist rammed into Samson's face. I could hear the cartilage in his nose snap and saw blood gush. The knife clattered to the pavement. Samson stumbled into a crouch, cupping his bleeding nose with a hand. He tried to use the low ground to aim an uppercut at my jaw. I twisted and grabbed the front of his uniform, throwing him violently into the hospital wall with enough force that a few finger bones snapped in a poorly placed hand. The dirty cop collapsed to the ground, and he immediately tried to push himself up, clutching his busted hand to a handful of bruised ribs. Stay down, pal, I warned. It seemed reasonable to assume that body cams were automatically backed up somewhere. On the other hand, that would present another layer of complexity to Samson's manipulation of evidence. Hedging my bets, I ripped the unit off his shoulder, threw it to the ground, and stomped the shit out of it. If Valdez was the only one with video evidence, then at least we had the upper hand. I scooped up the knife and started wiping my prints off it with my shirt. I nodded at Valdez. We should get out of here. I let the knife drop back to the ground and started for the rear of the van, Valdez in tow. Fuck you, Owens. Yeah, yeah. I didn't bother turning around. If you think this changes anything, it doesn't, Samson yelled after us. The sheer number of contingencies he set up, trust me, you are great. A fucked Abraham Owens. Valdez and I stopped and looked at each other. That vibration I had sent down the piano wire was still working on Samson. I looked over my shoulder and growled. Come again? Samson pushed himself to his knees, clutching his fucked up hand to his chest, spitting a mouthful of blood to the pavement. He shook his head. Nah, I ain't telling you shit. I turned to face him, squinting as I focused on the connection between us. Buddy, come on, that's not how this is gonna work. He shook his head again, defiant. But? Oh, it was a simple frame up, sure. Words tumbled out as vibrations hit his chest. Slice up the nigger, plant the knife, fingerprints, body cam, God all fucking mighty, the great Abraham Owens is locked up and hand-delivered, easy fucking money in this way. Jesus fucking Christ. Samson let out an absurd burst of laughter. <laughs> the other guy wanted to pin the murders on Peter, if you could fucking believe that. I took a step towards Samson. Who the fuck is Peter? Who the fuck is the other guy? Valdez piped. The punching and the vibrations were fucking with Samson's head. He was rocking on his knees and grinding his teeth. It doesn't fucking matter, but fuck! Peter's gonna think I can't handle a simple fucking job! The other guy, Valdez insisted, kneeling in front of Samson and grabbing his shoulders, pushing him back against the wall. Is it Councilman White? Is that the other guy? Are you working for Councilman White? I go where the money is, Samson said, eyes manic. Again, not that it fucking matters, Peter. <laughs> Samson trailed off as my focus waned. His face twisted in disgust, sneering at Valdez. <sighs> Get the fuck off me, you spick-licking bitch! Samson shoved Valdez back, and she tumbled to the ground, banging her head against the bottom of the van. Her phone clattered to the side, and Samson sprang to his feet, his eyes locked on the phone that had been recording the entire encounter. He was only able to take a single step toward the phone, before I poured every ounce of strength I had into a punch that sent him spinning. He rebounded off the hospital wall into the van before collapsing face first into the pavement. Yeah, he probably wasn't getting up anytime soon. So here's the thing about getting stuck between a rock and a hard place. I am the hard place. Chapter 11 Valdez was behind the wheel when we left the hospital. She took us to a drive through for a few bags of burgers, made a pit stop at a liquor store for some emergency supplies, Valdez did the driving there, too, while I waited in the truck, and finally parked in a shaded, isolated corner of a municipal parking garage, located across from the city administration complex. We had a clear view of the four-story building, and Valdez was transfixed. I shoved the last half of a final burger into my mouth, and swallowed the massive lump after a few chews. 
I could almost feel the greasy mash of meat, bread, and potatoes as it soaked up the remaining drops of my hospital whiskey bomb. Valdez may have been the proverbial wrecking ball to my day, but lunch was a heaven-sent sidebar from what was turning into a bleak reality. A plan delayed never tasted so good. I crumpled the burger wrapper and tossed it over my shoulder into the back of the cab. Valdez was practically stoic as she stared intently at the admin building. I rubbed a hand over my mouth and cleared my throat. <clears throat> Last time I was out this way, I was paying a code enforcement fine with a backpack full of pennies. I said, they had to count every single red cent. Figured if code enforcement was going to be a pain in my ass, I might as well be a pain in theirs, too. Valdez's focus was unflapped, and she responded in a monotone without looking at me. Code enforcement provides a critical service to municipalities, establishing clear guidelines for citizens to follow in order to maintain sensible order. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. I offered a grunt of indifference in response. That was Valdez in a nutshell. She was either obsessively focused on a singular task, or cursing up a storm with no regard for social norms. Most of the time, Valdez sounded like she had a mouth of a sailor who fucked his cousin, sucked up the cream pie, and then snowballed it into a hooker's mouth. She was practically the little sister I never had. I shot another glance at Valdez while she was focused on the building. She was still wearing my jacket, and after we left the hospital, she pulled her curly hair back into its usual ponytail. She was simple and efficient that way. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've never seen her wearing a lick of makeup. Not that it would ever be a topic of conversation, but I imagine she saw as much use in lipstick as I did with, well, people in general. Back in the day, I might have written her off as just being weird. Thanks to Josephine's ongoing influence, I can describe Valdez as being something of an autistic savant. This went a long way to explain how her moods could turn on a dime and how she could be laser-focused on a single task one moment, and then a rage of emotions the next, all while sporting a kind of special programming that left these inexplicable emotional whirlwinds blind to my psychic pull. Also, Valdez lacked the average person's social filter, which only made me like her more. You gonna fill me in on what we're doing here? Valdez twitched as if I had startled her awake. She scratched her cheek and pointed to the corner of the administration building in front of us. See that side entrance with a green canopy? I did. It was connected to a small gated lot full of reserved parking spaces. A white luxury sedan was parked near the canopy, probably a Cadillac from the looks of it. Next to the automatic gate, at the other end of the private lot, was a rent-a-cop security patrol in a golf cart. That's the private entrance for elected officials. Mayor, council members, tax collector, you, you get the idea. Valdez explained. The privileged 1% get quick, unobstructed access to chambers so they never have to face their constituents. At least, not without a mute button to cut the microphone during public comments. I raised an eyebrow. Long ago, Gertie had been one of those constituents who had her microphone cut off when the city council had heard enough of her thoughtful and well-reasoned arguments against the invasive spread of parking lots. She knew how to work a system, but city government still only amounted to headaches for everyone involved. The caddy belongs to one Ernest David White, Valdez continued. He's the District 3 councilman, four terms running. Well, either the Honorable White is taking advantage of taxpayer-subsidized long-term parking, or he's putting in some weekend hours. Valdez nodded curtly. It's not unheard of for elected officials to work the weekend, but it is rare. They're usually too busy knocking balls around on the links or fucking barely legal pool boys. Anyway, they all keep public calendars, and obviously Jacoby follows them closely, you know, for reasons. Councilman White? He had a one-hour meeting scheduled today. Even though the city is closed for business. Bingo. See? I'm not as dumb as I look. So, who's he meeting with? Valdez turned in the driver's seat and reached into the back of the cab, digging a camera out of her bag. The heft of a long zoom lens made the small-framed girl grunt softly, which made me smile. Well, that's what we're here to find out, she said, clicking the camera on and aiming it at the canopy. Of course, any helpful meeting details were conveniently left off the public calendar, which honestly just raises more red flags, and instead of potentially spooking the councilman from having the meeting, Jacoby wanted me to scope it out and see if we can't answer that question ourselves. I twisted the cap off a fresh bottle of whiskey and looked from Valdez's long lens to the green canopy. After a swig of whiskey, I murmured, What goes in must come out. Valdez propped the lens on the steering wheel and adjusted the focus, studying the screen on the back of the camera. 
While she made her adjustments, I popped open the glove box to retrieve a travel humidor I kept stashed for occasions like these. There were one and a half stogies tucked inside. I took the half-finished one, saving the last good cigar as a victory dance for when this whole mess was behind me. By the time I rolled down the window and got comfortable, the cigarette lighter popped, and I used the glowing coils to get the stogie going. The cigar was strong, bitter, and over-smoked. I chased it with another swig of whiskey, and almost, almost, felt normal. Valdez flipped open a reporter's notebook and started a log for the stakeout, noting the time, date, and location. She even sketched out a bird's eye diagram to visually represent our vantage point of the private entrance. She fancied herself a private investigator, complete with a license from the city and this dopey hipster fedora she sometimes wore at night. Although, to be fair, she somehow makes it work. If I'm being honest, she's not all that bad at the gig. Maybe one day she could be great, but right now she essentially operated as an extracurricular freelancer for the St. Charles Sentinel. The newspaper itself was mostly a digital operation these days, run by a skeleton staff and helmed by a trust-funded millennial moon-eyed navel gazer named Will Jacoby. In other words, Valdez was a beat reporter without any of those pesky journalistic responsibilities. You know, like actual writing. She did field research, stakeouts and low-level investigations, ran down leads, collected evidence, and then handed it all over to Jacoby. He would turn around and spin it into whatever narrative fit his liberal agenda. Most of the time, Jacoby was able to use the intel Valdez surfaced to turn the screws on more important people. People like District 3 Councilman Ernest David White. You want to talk about Dockside? Now it was my turn to twitch in surprise. She asked the question as nonchalant as ever, not even taking her eyes off the building. I grunted dismissively and responded, I'd rather talk about why Jacoby thinks this white fella is connected with Nazis. Valdez responded quickly, flatly, and still with zero movement. They're called the Sons of the Golden Future. Come again? Valdez went back into her bag and pulled out a folder thick with papers and photos. She handed it to me and repeated, The Sons of the Golden Future, just another way of saying Nazis, like white nationalists or white supremacists, the alt-right, patriots, and the Republican Party. I grunted, flipping open the folder. I spat out the word patriot to emphasize how much the word had been bastardized. Valdez dropped her head in a single nod. Exactly. This country has been bent over backward to normalize white rage, and now we're slapping all kinds of fucking labels on it to distract stupid people from the truth. Those proud boys, the GOP, the motherfucking sons of the golden future. At the end of the day, they're all just a bunch of fascist nationalist goddamn fucking Nazis, I said, finishing her thought. The folder was full of background on Nazi Germany between the 1920s through the 1940s. Hitler, Aryan master race, the Holocaust. The background turned to post-World War II neo-Nazi and nationalist movements, blossoming into the rage-filled good people on both sides of modern politics. Word on the street is that you got your ass kicked, Valdez said, her eyes still trained on the admin building. I looked up from her Nazi research folder. I didn't get my ass kicked. That's not the word on the street. What street? You know what I mean. Valdez finally met my gaze. What the hell were you even doing at Dockside? What do you think I was doing? I scoffed and turned back to the folder. She had highlighted a specific section of the text and scribbled, Sins of Our Fathers, in the margin. What's this about an American racist model? Valdez let out a humorless snort through her nose. Huh, <laughs> karmic justice for the greatest motherfucking country in the world, she said sarcastically. Racism was so institutionalized in America, the country was built on the backs of African Americans, slaves were constitutionally defined as three-fifths of a person, and no one but the white man had the right to say jack shit about how our society should function. It was so institutionalized that Hitler saw it as a model example and an inspiration for the Nazi party. My stomach turned with an unexpected sourness. If Hitler is the father of the Nazi movement, Valdez continued, then, the United States of America is the goddamn grandfather, but don't you dare fucking mention that at Thanksgiving dinner. Fucking Nazis. Fucking America. So these sons of the golden shower. Future. I grunted, like it made a difference. These circle jerk cum swappers are the ones keeping the dream alive. I flipped another page in the research and took a series of puffs on the stogie to keep it burning. Valdez's research jumped forward to the Obama administration. They're no different than the Ku Klux Klan, only with fewer wizards and fucking normalized to shit, she said. 
They officially organized in 08 with some kind of horseshit about the first black president ushering in the Great Recession as a way to oppress the great white male. The anonymity of the internet helped the group legitimize, although those are Jacoby's words more than mine. Anonymity means no accountability, which just means angry white assholes are free to say whatever's really on their mind. And then we got an overgrown Oompa Loompa in the White House. And one by one, the angry white assholes began stepping out of the shadows and into the golden light of a brighter, whiter future. Valdez finished. Normalized. Institutionalized. Fetishized. They even have a fucking website. I flipped another page in the folder and, sure enough, she had printed out the first few pages of the Sons of the Golden Futures website. The word Nazi was obviously nowhere to be found, but it was clear how thinly whitewashed the white rage was. The website proclaimed white men were a minority in their own country, and that white pride was about remembering, preserving, and continuing a culture that the mainstream media had proclaimed misogynistic, outdated, and hateful. I flipped through more website printouts but found no information about the organization's leadership. So, who's in charge of this circus of chauvinistic junkie monkeys? I asked. Therein lies the comically ironic twist of the modern Nazi movement, Valdez answered. In order to be a member, you have to pledge a loyalty oath to the organization, come out to the fucking world by publicly instigating fights in support of male supremacy or some other bullshit, and get a fucking tattoo. Three dots on the base of your shaved skull, one for God, one for country, one for the sons of the golden future. And whoever's organizing this shit show, they stay in the shadows, veiled by the exact same anonymity they deny their followers. And Jacoby thinks this Councilman White character is your prime suspect? Valdez nodded in agreement. Me, though? That name Samson dropped earlier? I've heard it a few too many times for it to be a coincidence. I sifted through the soggy remains of the Play-Doh brains and pulled the name back up. Hmm. Peter. I said. Peter and the other guy. Councilman White, hypothetically. You think they're working together? I think we're close to finding out. I took a long drag on the dwindling stogie and rolled the smoke around until it burned. You know, if you needed booze, you could have called me, Valdez said in an uncharacteristically soft tone, though any sense of sympathy was quickly erased with a more on-brand bit of snark. Cause, like, running around town and getting your ass beat kind of diminishes your credibility on the Muscle for Hire network. I barked out an unexpected chuckle and fished for my flip phone. Tell that to Beckett Miller. He hired me this morning to back him at tonight's rally so he can talk to this girl. I pulled up the text Beckett had sent me containing the girl's picture. I turned the phone to Valdez so she could see the image. It was low resolution and grainy on the postage stamp screen. Valdez literally winced. Jesus fucking Christ, Abe. We have the technology, man. Kids and their fucking technology. Like it mattered. I noted my displeasure with a grunt and flipped the phone shut. Even with the super empathy giving me no read on Valdez, I could tell she wasn't thrilled about me working the rally. The reason was no mystery either. Putting aside the sheer volume of people, it was going to be ground zero for a goddamn nuclear bomb of abject hate, anger, and violence. The way that confluence of emotional nightmare fuel would race down the piano wire of the pull, well, that was what really worried Valdez. Abe. I'll be fine, I said flatly. Valdez looked at me, her eyebrows knitting and those big brown eyes turning stormy. Abe, you don't know how... I cut her off, gesturing to the green canopy with the stub of the stogie. Game time, kiddo. Valdez whipped her attention around and raised the camera to start shooting. The shutter clicked rapidly in a shitty impression of an automatic firearm. The first two men who emerged from the canopy were in plain clothes, jeans and polo shirts. One carried a messenger bag over his shoulder and was stuffing papers inside while the other was putting on sunglasses. Even at my distance, I could see the one in the sunglasses was the chief of police. Interesting. Next out of the building was a uniformed officer walking with a stagger and holding something to his face. Stu fucking Samson, Valdez said underneath the sound of her rapid-fire photos. I guess I didn't hit the bastard as hard as I thought. Come on, come on, Valdez whispered, pivoting the lens away from Samson and back to the door. I squinted and leaned forward. The door opened one final time and a tall, narrow man with a head full of gray hair stepped out. He wore a shiny blue suit with a red tie. Gotcha, Valdez hissed, camera snapping away. A city councilman meeting with a contingent of dirty cops, led by none other than the police chief himself. Definitely interesting, definitely not good. Abe, uh, 
I grunted. Valdez turned those dark, stormy eyes in my direction again. She had gotten everything Jacoby needed. Look, I know you're going to do what you're going to do, and you know I've got your back no matter what. Mmm. But if you want my professional opinion, she continued, I would strongly recommend staying away from that rally tonight. She wasn't wrong. Putting aside my own super empathy issues, if Councilman White was behind the Nazis and the city's police force was in on the action, this rally was shaping up to be a tinderbox. Unfortunately, twelve grand begged to differ. I am serious, Abe, Valdez said in her low, monotone voice. If White is using the police to clear the way for the Sons of the Golden Future, I cut her off firmly. The only way I'm torpedoing this gig is if Josephine can't corroborate Beckett Miller's story. Valdez's expression flashed neutral, the storm evaporating from her eyes. She nodded. All right, then. I raised a curious eyebrow at her sudden pivot. She turned the key in the ignition, bringing the truck to life and shifting it into gear. Let's go talk to Josephine. Chapter 12 As Valdez drove, I worked on my bottle of whiskey. She was better than I was at staying on the back roads, which probably had something to do with how I had spent the last few years living mainly as a recluse, while Valdez had been busy pounding pavement as a rookie private investigator. On our way to the library, we passed through low-end neighborhoods where the whip snap of the pull was more like the slow pivot of a cheap sprinkler arcing lazily over a brown and dying lawn. The distant emotions that made their way to me were either sleepy, high on drugs, or just indifferent. Who cares, why bother, and who gives a flying fuck? Another long pull from the whiskey bottle was followed by the final puff of the stogie before I flicked the sliver of a nub out the window. Dear City of St. Charles, Fuck your feelings. Sincerely, Abraham Owens. The whiskey did its job, and a thought occurred to me. I cleared my throat with a rolling rasp and glanced at Valdez. You said word on the street. Valdez shot me a confused side eye. Nothing quite like continuing a conversation the other person didn't know you were having. Dockside, I clarified. You said the word on the street was that I got my ass kicked. Valdez nodded slowly, fixing her eyes on the road. I heard some guy smashed a bar stool across your back and then beat the shit out of you at the bus stop. At least I'm assuming it was the same guy. I scratched the stubble on my chin. Yeah, me too. I never got a look at him. Jesus, how wasted were you? I responded with a long swig from the whiskey, and then... I was at Dockside, wasn't I? Fuck me. Valdez muttered, conceding the point. These chatty fuckers putting the word on the street, I asked. Did they mention who my secret admirer was? Valdez shook her head. If I had even the vaguest idea, I would have already run the fucker down and given him a piece of my mind. She turned those dark eyes to me, brows joining in concern. What did you do, Abe? I lifted a shoulder helplessly. Other than drink? He robbed me at the end of it, so fuck if I know what it was about. She scoffed in disgust. God, I don't care how much you were sucking down or how much they were sucking down. No sane person looks at you and thinks, hey, now there's a guy whose money I can just, you know, take. If he was trying to send a message, the effectiveness and clarity of said message have been greatly diminished. Valdez shook her head. I could tell the mystery had wormed its way into her brain, and she'd be chewing it over until it was either solved or she had it surgically removed. She was a good kid that way. Hey, look, I said, rubbing my nose and trying to play the whole thing off. Maybe he got in a few lucky hits. Maybe he's just as dumb as he sounds. She didn't meet my gaze that time, and I could tell she didn't believe it any more than I did. Not that it merited any further discussion since we had arrived at the library. Valdez pulled off a side road, past a bus stop, and pulled into the parking lot of an old, freestanding supermarket. The supermarket chain had folded nearly a decade ago, and the building had been converted into a branch of the local library system. The place wasn't busy. Thanks to the likes of Google, Netflix, and fucking Facebook, it hardly ever was anymore. And thanks to my drive-time drinking, I was well insulated to the few people still patronizing the library. I grabbed a hardcover book from the back and pushed the door open. Let's go, I said, climbing out of the truck. Inside the library, I led Valdez away from the main circulation desk and over to the reference desk near the no-man's land of the non-fiction stacks. Josephine Watson looked up from an old computer terminal, her eyes brightening behind dark blue glasses when she saw us. Mr. Abraham Owens, she said in a slow, easy tone, clearly in no rush to get anywhere at all. 
Her voice was smooth, but you could hear her age crinkling at the edges. You're about a week late if my recollection of that due date is accurate. She nodded to the hardcover I pushed across the raised counter of the desk. It was a copy of John D. MacDonald's A Deadly Shade of Gold, a story about a man trying to avenge a murdered friend and unravel a mystery behind a golden Aztec statue. Like most of MacDonald's novels, the hero makes a plan, and then shit goes sideways. The dust jacket was covered in a clear plastic with a library barcode laminated to the front. Figured I'd give you a break from my ugly mug, I said. Joe's eyebrows went up. This unintended break doesn't have anything to do with what happened at Dockside, does it? I did nothing to tamp the low growl that came next. The street is turning into quite the mouthy motherfucker. I glanced at Valdez to see if she was Josephine's informant. She was busy patting down my jacket and finding a small, ratty paperback in the inside pocket. She pulled it out and handed it to Joe. This one going back to? Valdez asked me. Josephine took the book and looked it over. It was an old, well-read copy of The Dying Earth by Jack Vance. As she turned it over in her hands, the cover, which had been dangling by a thread since I found it abandoned on the bus, finally rejected its tenuous bond with the rest of the book. Ah, Miss Watson, I said, dredging up a tone of abject disappointment. What's next, burning them? Her already thin lips went invisible as she held up the book. You want this back? Consider it a donation. It was Josephine's turn to growl as she tossed the remnants of the dying earth into a bin of reject books behind the desk. Your generosity is overwhelming, as always, Abe. I can't help but notice you're straying from my reading list. I shrugged. Although I'm not a particularly fast reader, that last installment of MacDonald's Travis McGee saga resonated deeply with me, and I finished it quickly. So you're ready for the next one? Joe asked, typing away at the computer to locate another book. Not right now, no. Valdez turned and leaned her back against the counter, sighing impatiently. Josephine's fingers fell flat on the keyboard, and she met my gaze. She was a small, thin woman with narrow shoulders that seemed to end in the sharpest of points. They squared, and her head canted forward almost imperceptibly. Well then, Mr. Owens, she said, to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? Miller, I said. Beckett, Miller? Those eyebrows twitched again, and the corner of Joe's mouth turned ever so slightly upwards. She nodded slowly. I was wondering when he planned on talking to you. A soft tone played over the air, and I glanced over my shoulder. A small family of four had entered the library, and the kids ran to the children's section. The simple happiness that resonated from them put a smile on my face. Let's talk in my office, Josephine said, standing and moving to a closed door located off to the side of the reference desk. Chapter 13 Valdez and I followed Josephine into what had once been the supermarket's employee break room. It was situated at the front, far left of the building, and a series of large, floor-to-ceiling windows offered a view of the parking lot and the street beyond when the privacy blinds were lifted. An old round table and plastic chair sat at one end of the room, alongside a refrigerator and a small kitchenette. What looked like a thrift store reject desk sat at the other end, complete with another outdated computer terminal and barcode scanner. Joe went to the desk and sat behind it, gesturing to the two chairs opposite. Valdez and I sat as she reached into one of the lower desk drawers and withdrew an expensive bottle of brandy and three glasses. For our friends, she said, referring to the small family and any other patrons lingering among the snacks. She carefully poured a half finger in the first two glasses and a solid three fingers in the third. When offered one of the small glasses, Valdez waved it off, and Joe silently poured the contents into my glass. I didn't bother telling her about the pregame whiskey because, this close to the street, I could still feel the faint whip-snap of passing traffic. The constant tug of the pull had a draining, numbing effect, and after too long it left me exhausted. I rolled my shoulders and took a sip, appreciating Josephine's predilection for quality booze. The subtle, sweet tang of the brandy helped to center and sharpen my muddy brains. Josephine regarded me with nearly expressionless silence, but I could feel the compassion emanating from her. It came in strong waves, almost indifferent to that invisible, psychic wire altogether, swirling around me like an emotional shield. It was a familiar effect, and seemed to be unique to Josephine Watson. 
Her compassion was almost like a durable, heavy-duty raincoat protecting me against the worst of the emotional thunderstorm that persisted around me. From the corner of my eye, I saw Valdez checking her watch. She wanted to get the SD card with her photos over to Will Jacoby at the Sentinel. On to business, then. Another long sip of my brandy, and then... Beckett Miller wants help getting to his girlfriend at the Nazi rally this evening. Josephine idly rotated her glass on the desk. Hmm. Valdez leaned forward, her impatience getting the better of her. Is this neo-Nazi reject legit, or is Abe getting himself into some shit? I could feel my jaw clench as the whip snap of traffic compounded my irritation at Valdez. When he was in high school, Joe began slowly, indifferent to Valdez's tone, Beckett volunteered here at the library, only once or twice a week and just to reshelve the returns. But he was here just the same. Seemed like an alright kid at the time, but I never got all that close to him. I knew he was dealing with the things kids deal with. Parents going through a separation. He struggled to find a friend group at school. He has this physical tick on the side of his face, you see, and the other kids would tease him about it. Mmm, Twitchy Beckett Miller. I can't say I didn't feel a little guilty learning the kid's twitch was a medical something or other, but I wasn't about to tell Josephine that. And then one day, she continued, the boy just stopped showing up to volunteer. Honestly, I didn't think much of it, since kids like Becca come and go all the time. After a few months, Ruth Miller, that's Beckett's mother, started coming in. When I realized who she was to Beckett, we got to chatting, and I learned more about the Millers and what was transpiring with their son. And, well, I won't lie, the weekly or bi-weekly updates became just about as exciting as something I'd watch on one of those premium cable channels. Valdez sunk back into her chair with a silent huff. Ruth and her husband were, in fact, Separated and going through a rather contentious divorce, he was, is, the CEO of an investment firm, and was already paying alimony to his first two wives. He had money, but a third alimony payment was a bridge too far, and whether Ruth deserved it or not, the man ended up taking out three marriages worth of frustration on her. Okay, look, sorry, but does this have anything to do with the little shit stain? Valdez snapped. I'm getting there, Joe said, before taking a slow, deliberate sip of her brandy. Lawyers, manipulation, threats, and all flavors of emotional abuse ensued. Beckett Miller, well, the boy was caught up in the middle of all of it. Both his mother and father tried to gain his loyalty and turn him against the other parent. Truly, I will never understand or relate to a human that could do such a thing to their child. But, Joe nodded intently at Valdez, Beckett was caught in a storm between two ports. And, he chose the third. He pulled away from both parents and with no friends to speak of at school, he spent most of his time by himself. And even more time on the internet. Josephine leaned forward on the desk. You know, with the way these websites work these days, the algorithms and machine learning and artificial intelligence designed to manipulate our brains into wanting to spend more and more time scrolling our damn lives away. It doesn't take a whole lot for a few bad actors to manipulate the algorithms. Beckett started down this path, watching these videos that attempted to explain what was happening in the world around him, and... Even though he came from a moderately left-of-center-leaning ideology, he fell down what we now know is the alt-right rabbit hole. Valdez scoffed quietly, and despite my implicit trust in Josephine Watson, I agreed with my impatient friend's sentiment. It's not like Beckett Miller didn't have an informed choice in the matter. He was a fully functioning adult who chose hate. As if she was the one with the psychic vibrations, Josephine nodded in understanding. Maybe he knowingly chose it, and maybe he didn't. What you need to understand is that he was desperate for a sense of belonging. Josephine met my eyes with an intense gaze. A sense of family. When his own family failed him, when his own social circle failed him, he kept looking. 
the sons of the golden future might not have held the answers Beckett Miller was searching for, but they were who he found. Valdez stabbed the top of the desk with her index finger. The sons of the golden future believe feminism and trans women are a conspiracy to emasculate men and that far-left politicians are colluding with the media to oppress and replace white people. I felt myself chuckle. It couldn't be helped. It just sounded so absurd, even to me. Josephine nodded in agreement. And that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of their ideology. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is to get ahead of? Valdez pressed, her frustration getting the better of her. Beckett Miller knowingly and willingly embraced the sons of... Nothing is ever so black and white, Josephine interjected. Valdez crossed her arms as she sulked back into her chair. In this case, with fucking Nazis? Yeah, it is exactly black and white. That made Josephine pause. She clicked her teeth thoughtfully before her eyes shifted back to me. Ruth Miller had no idea what was happening to her son until he showed up with a haircut and a tattoo on the back of his head. After that, she started realizing the trouble he was getting himself into. Week after week, I kept hearing about all the horrible things the sons of the golden future stood for and what they were doing. Josephine held up a hand to cut Valdez off before she could interrupt. Bear in mind that, for the most part now, this was the first time Ruth truly and intimately understood the poisonous nature of white nationalism. I did what I could to educate her, and together we kicked around different ideas on how we could get through to her son. Remember, she's going through an extremely litigious divorce while at the same time trying to pull her son out of the alt-right. I finished off the brandy and nudged the empty glass back toward Josephine. Obviously, she got through to him. Josephine placed the empty next to the other two. Actually, no. Whenever she tried to talk to him, it always ended in a fight that only seemed to push him further away. Which is exactly how these manipulative ideologies work. I'm right, you're wrong, and never the twain shall meet. Eventually, Beckett just stopped coming home at night. She found out later that he was staying with this Peter person. I glanced sideways at Valdez, who immediately met my gaze. There was that name again. And that was when Beckett truly began to appreciate the reality of his choice. The sons of the golden future celebrated physical attacks against their perceived oppressors and went out of their way to glorify the body count left in their wake. He saw firsthand their stockpiles of weapons and military gear. He watched as other young men were radicalized. Then, and this is where things get really interesting, it was the same kind of internet videos that took him down the rabbit hole in the first place that helped pull him out again, Josephine explained. The way he explained it to his mother when he finally came home, it was that Peter character himself who first showed him a video that began chipping away and dismantling that alt-right ideology. Valdez and I exchanged a curious look. Josephine acknowledged it with a nod. I know, I needed clarification on this point as well, she continued. I guess it came down to a kind of opposition research. Peter was examining the arguments against the alt-right and using it to develop new rhetoric to fire up a, a, a righteous rage amongst the sons. Look at what they say about us. Look at the lies. Peter used these videos to dig in deeper, to dig others in deeper. But for Beckett, well, many of these messages in these anti-alt-rat videos rang true. The simple truth is that the boy ended up pulling himself out of the rabbit hole. Valdez and I exchanged another look. Anticlimactic, for sure. Eventually, instead of Ruth stopping by the library, Beck and Miller came in himself. Josephine continued. He came to express his gratitude for how I had been available for his mother, listening and talking and whatnot. And then, Josephine leaned back in her chair, a thoughtful look crossing her face. And then, he apologized to me, what with, well, Josephine gestured at her own dark complexion. He felt guilty. 
He personally knew black folk. He knew the ugliness of what he had done, and he felt guilty. Valdez scoffed loudly, and Josephine nodded in agreement. For the most part, I had the same reaction, she said. I told him to save his apology. I told him he knew what was right. I told him that, instead of apologizing, he should go out there and start doing something about all that wrong he participated in. Now, maybe Beckett Miller trying to save a delusional ex-girlfriend from the same hate group that would just as soon see her dead, maybe that ain't exactly right. Valdez, with a dripping sarcasm, Oh, you think? Josephine smiled as she nodded. They are all, indeed, grown-ass adults, capable of making their own damn decisions. But, just the same, it ain't entirely wrong either. And maybe Beckett doesn't stand a chance at getting through to the girlfriend. But, maybe the very act of trying is a step in the right direction. Josephine folded her hands on the desk. You asked if Beckett Miller was legit. And I say, yes. That's why I sent him to you, Abraham. She shook her head, almost in disappointment. The times we live in. Lord knows the boy has been on the receiving end of plenty of nudges in the wrong direction. I would very much like to think that you could help nudge him in the right direction. Valdez still sounded unconvinced. That's still a pretty fucking tall order, Joe. Abe walking right into the middle of a Nazi rally just so some guilt-ridden slack-jawed shit stain can try and atone for her sins and convince a self-hating Nazi she shouldn't be a fucking Nazi? Valdez had a magic way of breaking things down, and while I appreciated her concern, I still had 12,000 decent reasons to keep my appointment with Beckett Miller. Josephine locked her piercing gaze with mine and lifted her shoulder in a small shrug. Maybe we all have. Just a bit of atoning to do. I couldn't hear Valdez's snarky response, because my entire consciousness suddenly spiraled around the thought of Gertie lying alone and dying. And just as quickly as Gertie bubbled up into my brain, a tsunami-like wave of hate and anger slammed into me. Because of the brandy, it was a piano wire I hadn't even noticed. The suddenness of it snapping taut knocked the air out of my lungs. I doubled over in my chair, wheezing. I'm sure both Valdez and Josephine must have been confused or concerned or worried, but the intense vibrations that raced down the wire and hammered me were too distracting. Gah! I grabbed the edge of the desk as waves of intense anger flowed into me. The psychic line felt like a fucking railroad spike. Distant voices called out to me, and I could feel Valdez's hand on my arm. The room was spinning, and blackness was creeping along the edges of my vision. And then the moment froze. A single pinprick of light shone like a spotlight in my brain, and I realized this entire experience had only lasted two or three seconds, but the sensation was getting stronger, a lot like an oncoming freight train or even a... Clarity washed over me like one of those ice bucket challenges, and my hand shot out instinctively. One hand grabbed Josephine's blazer by the collar, while the other wrapped its fingers around Valdez's arms. Vibrations kept slamming into me with impossible force, as if to explicitly say... Fuck you, to all the alcohol sloshing around in my belly. With a massive burst of instinctive do-or-die energy, I hauled Josephine across the desk and swept her along with Valdez across the room. Just as a city of St. Charles Green Line bus smashed through the floor-to-ceiling windows and into Josephine's office, we slammed into the table and chairs by the kitchenette as glass exploded around us. The bus rammed into the old desk we had just been sitting at. Wood splintered and exploded as the bus plowed forward through the next wall and into the stacks beyond, where it finally came to a halt. Dust and smoke filled the air, and I could faintly hear Valdez hacking and coughing and cursing up a storm. But Joe? Was she... I got her out of the way, didn't I? She had to be alive. A loud pneumatic hiss cut through the cold silence, and the passenger door at the rear of the city bus swung open. One by one... The Nazis came out to play. Chapter 14 You know that missive about fighting fire with fire? It's fucking horseshit. No one has ever looked at a raging house fire and concluded that the best solution was to point a flamethrower at it. 
Well, no one except for maybe those idiots in D.C. This was probably why Josephine always counseled me against succumbing to the emotions transferred by the pole, especially when those emotions were anger, hate, and rage. My early lesson in this phenomenon took place shortly after Gertie died. My recently born-again Jesus-loving fuck of a brother tried paying me a visit at the newly minted Owens Manor at the RV park. Since isolation was the only way I knew to muster any control over the pull, Malachi's simple act of showing up on my doorstep eliminated all hope of a reasonable encounter before he said even a single word. Like all good brainwashed evangelicals, Malachi had come with the explicit intention of saving my soul for Christ. He said that Gertie's death didn't have to be in vain if I would just repent, beg God for forgiveness, and accept Jesus as my personal savior. He talked some bullshit about how he had been praying for me, praying for Gertie, praying that God would show us the light, and that he would move us to change our sinful ways. Then, after Gertie died, and these are Malachi's words, he realized God's plan was for Malachi himself to show us the light. Malachi said he failed Gertie, and her soul was lost. That was on him, he claimed, and he would never stop repenting for that. But there was still a chance for him to save my soul. The self-assured, arrogant twat's words couldn't have been more hollow. The pull was in full effect, and the piano wire buzzed with everything I needed to know about the blackness that had poisoned my older brother, a man I had looked up to, ran a business with, grew up and shared a close bond with. He blamed me for not being able to save Gertie's soul. And underneath the blame was that poisonous hate. At first, I couldn't comprehend it because I didn't even have words for it. Later, I would understand that Malachi's religious indoctrination had narrowed his worldview to such a pinpoint that when he saw me break the bonds of marriage by walking away and abandoning Gertie, all he saw was sin. When he looked at Gertie, succumbing to her migraines, he saw a secular Jezebel paying for her sins against God. The vibrations coming down the wire were clear. Gertie deserved her suffering, and the eternal damnation he believed she now endured. Malachi had gone mad. I punched him in the face and told him to fuck off. I was pushing myself to my feet when Malachi stepped off the bus and into the wreckage of Josephine's office. The sight of him after all these years felt like a slap to the face. I stumbled, feet sliding across loose debris, before I fell back on my ass. Malachi moved closer as his contingent of a half-dozen Nazi fucks spread out around him. He looked surprised to see me, and the pull confirmed it. Fair enough. Malachi was the last person I expected to see stepping off a city bus after it crashed into the library. He hadn't changed much, aside from maybe gaining more muscle mass. We had similar builds, honed by years of physical labor and construction, and now Malachi looked a little bigger. We had the same shaved head, although Malachi had a clean-shaven face. He wore black pants and a white t-shirt, and black suspenders matching the copy-paste uniforms the rest of his Nazi goon squad were wearing. His face stretched into the shittiest, shit-eating grin I had ever seen. Well, well, well. Brother Abraham, Malachi crowed, his voice carrying an infuriating, big tent preacher quality. My little baby Abe, the sinner who abandoned his damned old lady. Malachi spread his arms wide, turning slowly for his personal collection of Nazis, gesturing broadly at me. With his head turned, I saw the telltale tattoo, three small dots inside a larger circle. But Malachi seemed to have a unique variation on the logo. The larger circle was encased inside a solid vertical rectangle that ran down his neck and under his shirt. I would have speculated more on the tattoo, but the Nazi twats had been reeking of anticipation. Waves of emotions lammed into me, and I could feel my heartbeat quicken in response. Whether or not I wanted this as badly as they did, thanks to the empathetic pull, it didn't matter. But then the vibration shifted. And then my head spun in confusion, right along with the Nazis, as they realized what Malachi was saying. What the hell was I even doing here? And finally, the waves of confusion crested, and a giant grin split my face in two. These fucking racist shits were actually gleeful I was here. Me, specifically. Abraham Owens. 
I felt a chuckle start in my belly, but I'm pretty sure it came from one of the Nazis. Although I'd be lying if I said the notion of pounding some of these faces didn't inspire a deep sense of joy. One of the punks was actually rubbing his hands together in excitement. There was a sudden twinge of pain in my jaw as my teeth ground sharply in defiance of the unwanted emotions. Joe! Valdez! I snapped, not taking my eyes off Malachi. Debris shifted to my left, and a chair tumbled sideways. I'm good, Valdez said between coughs. Joe's here, but I think she's unconscious. There was another cough, but that one sounded like Josephine. Uh, I ain't dead yet, she wheezed. A wave of relief washed over me as I felt her distinct vibrations. I could feel her faith and confidence in me, and I found myself drawing a kind of strength from her that helped push back the uninvited emotions. Her strength focused my mind, and I pushed myself to my feet. Malachi watched, clearly entertained. Get her out of here, Valdez. I growled through my teeth. Malachi scoffed with a blatantly disingenuous tone. Come now, little baby Aby. She mustn't leave. Miss Watson is the bona fide lady of the hour. The Nazi fuck who was rubbing his hands together snickered like a rabid dog. He was skinny, almost unnaturally thin, and his wet, red eyes bulged out of his head. His excitement bordered arousal, and the telltale tingles in my crotch immediately turned my stomach. When Nazi wet eyes spoke, spit gathered at the corners of his mouth. Fuck that dusty-ass nigger cunt. We all know what Peter really wants. Malachi had stepped toward the wet-eyed Nazi, and I saw the corner of his mouth twitch as the shit-slicked maggot uttered the slur. Before the Nazi fuck could finish speaking, Malachi grabbed Wet-Eye's head and yanked it down, ramming it into Malachi's rising knee. The excitement and arousal flashed to blinding pain, accompanied by the briefest migraine I had ever experienced. And then, nothing. The loud crack was followed by the immediate severing of that individual's psychic connection. It was little more than a drop in the pond, but the emotional noise grew just a bit quieter. Cool. One down, six to go. Malachi raised an angry index finger and pointed it between the remaining Nazi shitheads, issuing a stern warning over their unconscious comrade. The good Lord does not abide, brothers. That language is beneath us, and I will personally tear the tongues from every person who speaks in slurs and curses while in my presence. He dropped to a knee and pulled apart the fallen Nazi's jaws. The disgust that turned my stomach would have been bad enough if it was just mine. I was surrounded by the repulsion of Malachi's Nazi cunt commandos and Malachi's disgust at the foul choice of words. He reached into the unconscious man's mouth, dug his nails into the man's tongue, and then gave a forceful tug. Valdez gagged from the other end of the room. Malachi pressed his hand against Wet Eye's forehead, bracing him against the ground as he yanked again at the blasphemer's tongue. A wet, gurgling tear sickened everyone, whether they suffered from super-empathy or not. Consciousness flashed, and those wet, red eyes opened in bright agony. He wailed something high-pitched and incomprehensible around Malachi's hand. The reconnected vibrations sucker-punched me, and I clasped a hand over my mouth as I felt a phantom tearing sensation deep in my tongue. As quickly as the piano wire started singing, it suddenly stopped as wet eyes passed out again. He held the jagged organ before him as he turned in a slow circle, a morbid display for the remaining Nazis. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven, nor by earth, nor by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. He really was mad. Valdez gagged again, swallowing bile as she helped Josephine to her feet. Racist, hateful assholes were one thing. Racist, hateful assholes hiding behind religious righteousness were something else altogether. Malachi finished turning his circle and once again faced me. He tossed the severed tongue, which landed at my feet with a sickening plop. That one's on me, little brother. Between Malachi's righteousness and the swirling anger, disgust, and contempt I was getting from the Nazis, I couldn't take it anymore. You goddamn... Abraham! Josephine hissed from the doorway. Whatever you do... 
Don't succumb to the anger. Sure. Whatever. Josephine felt the need to insist, pleading with me as Valdez pulled her through the door. You are better than this, Abraham. You are stronger than this. Valdez! I barked angrily, encouraging her to hustle out and get Josephine to safety. Maybe I was better than the invisible storm of hate that flowed around me. Maybe I could be stronger than the empathy that crippled me. Maybe I could look these hateful fucks in the eye, turn the other cheek, and move on with my life. I stared down my crazy brother. He continued to smile calmly at me as the remaining Nazi scumbags circled both of us. Maybe I was better. But then again, where's the fun in that? Chapter 15 My fingers strained, balled up inside tightly clenched fists. The pain and stress on the joints did nothing to distract from the emotional storm, and the mere notion of trying to execute a reverse pull on Malachi was laughable. All of the swirling rage had left my brain cloudy and slow. The comment from the wet-eyed Nazi about what Peter really wanted had been rattling around, but I was only just now making sense of it. The Nazi fucks had come for Josephine, but the reference librarian was just a means to an end. What Peter really wanted was... What did this Peter fuck really want? Why was Josephine a pawn in whatever game this twat was playing? And why the fuck? How the fuck? Had Malachi joined forces with the Sons of the Golden Future? You have a lot of questions, don't you, baby brother? Malachi asked, his eyes sparkling with something twisted and devious. Yeah, sure. We could fill a podcast and a subsequent Netflix series with all the questions I had. But I didn't feel like telling him that. Nah, I said. Just wondering when we're gonna get this over with. Malachi spread his arms. Ever the motherfucking saint. I stand ready when you are. Ah, fuck it. I threw my arm up to swing the first punch, and immediately pivoted sideways to clock one of the shitheads on my left. I was lucky, and he didn't see it coming. I heard his jaw crack before he crumpled to the ground. That was two. The remaining four Nazis launched themselves in a flurry. One tackled me in the gut as another threw punches at my face. The other two piled on as Malachi stood back and watched. The weight of the last two pushed me to my knees. You know, sometimes, Malachi mused, beginning to pace across the rubble, when people don't want to listen to the good word, we have no choice but to resort to alternative methods. However we choose to communicate, though, God's love remains the same. Tell me now that that is not a gift. God's love smashed a knee into my gut as God's other love rammed a fist in my face. All right, enough of this shit. I grabbed the first wrist I saw and yanked it hard, twisting it until tendons snapped. More fists pummeled as I got a foot under myself, heaving upwards with a bellow. I didn't let go of the Nazi with the twisted wrist, and instead swung him around and used the momentum to knock the other Nazi nutsuckers off my back. Nerves sang out in agony after every hit they landed. Each punch I sent in return came with a wave of emotional hurt that coursed down those persistent, invisible wires. My eyes watered as blades of pain exploded across my body. It was the worst two-for-one special in the history of discount shopping. Fucking emotional bullshit. The only way through this was to thin the herd as quickly as possible. Once the Nazi nitwits were unconscious, there would be no more pain for the pole to latch onto. Malachi's Nazi hit squad were all fighters, driven by a righteous, racist cause, but none were as big or as strong as I was. My grip on the wrist was tight, and the guy yelped as he tried to plant his feet, skidding across debris. When the soles of his boots finally found a grip, he bared his teeth at me, and I felt a furious wave of determination. I saw the balled-up fist of his other arm coming, and immediately caught the punch in my larger hand, absorbing the force of the blow in my considerably larger arm. Fuck! The Nazi squealed, first in surprise and then in pain, as I clenched my hand around his fist and twisted it backward. I yanked the fucker close until he could feel the heat of my breath. Mm, that's my line. I growled before headbutting him. The connection fizzled, and the sympathy pain in my wrist vanished. That was three. There was a distinct series of snicks 
as the remaining Nazi cunts unsheathed familiar-looking black carbon knife blades. The fuckers were clearly creatures of habit. With half of his disposable Nazi contingent already disposed of, Malachi leaned casually against the bus, clearly unperturbed, or even mildly concerned, about the well-being of his charges. Not that I cared either way. I was already halfway home, and if I could focus just a bit more... A bright flame of pain etched across my back as one of the Nazi cum stains made his move, slicing his knife as he ran past me. I snatched at his shirt and belt and used his momentum to spin him through the air. He slammed into the wall, sheetrock caving around him. He immediately pushed himself back to his feet, shaking off the dust. This one was tougher than he looked. Come now, little baby Amy, Malachi said from the bus. Is this really necessary? I turned my gaze to Malachi and focused. Why don't you tell me, brother? Tell me, why the bus? Now. Malachi twitched. The reverse pull seemed to affect him, but there was still too much interference. He scoffed, then laughed, wiggling his shoulders as if he had a bad case of the willies. What in God's name was that? Call off your goons and I'll tell you all about it. Two of those goons slammed me from the side and charged me into the wall that had already been weakened by the last Nazi fuck. We smashed right through to the other side and crashed into shelves of books, sending the entire stack teetering backward. I rolled, punched, and kicked. The two goons backed me against the front side of the bus, and we traded blows. As the bus siding dented under fists and faces, something started tickling at the edges of my brain. Something about the bus. I ducked, and a fist smashed into the window glass on the bus door. I grabbed the Nazi's head and slammed it into the side mirror. Glass shredded the fucker's face, and the mirror sheared backward. He collapsed on a pile of books. That was for... Malachi! I roared, yanking open the bus door and climbing inside. The city bus had run through both the outer wall of the library and the first inner wall before grinding to a halt at the stacks of the non-fiction section. Inside the bus, a nagging hunch was confirmed by the emptiness I found. There were no passengers, and definitely no driver, which meant Malachi, or one of the other Nazis, had driven the bus, intentionally ramming it into the library. The question was... From the side entrance of the bus, the one in Josephine's office, that one tough twat with a knife climbed on board. The last of Malachi's disposable henchmen boarded the bus behind me, blocking me in. Glancing out the window, I saw Malachi stepping backward, watching with a grin. I squinted and focused, sending a pulse down the piano wire to my brother. I saw him blink and twitch before the two Nazis on the bus launched themselves at me. It was the bus. The goddamn fucking bus. I dodged the first knife stab while driving my elbow backward into a nose. Grabbing the knife arm, I flung the Nazi into a pole before turning toward the one with the busted nose. That one thrust his knife at me, and I threw my arm to swipe it aside, knocking his hand into another bus pole. He lost his grip, and the knife clattered to the ground. I took a step, kicking the knife down the length of the bus as the first Nazi scrambled to his feet and punched me in the kidney. Pain exploded up my back, another punch to the other kidney, and bolts of lightning cut through my brain fog. Busted Nose saw his opportunity and started pummeling my face. I felt a boot to the back of my knee, and I stumbled forward. Busted Nose kept wailing and blood splattered on the ground. He grabbed my head, his hands were clammy and hot, and yanked my head down into his knee. Fireworks exploded. The last of the fog evaporated. Blood ran like a river from my nose. More than a few teeth felt a little too loose. But the clarity, beautiful motherfucking clarity, was finally shining through. Fuck trying to bend Malachi with a reverse pull, these two idiots would be way easier. The two Nazi assholes stepped back to study their work. Ah, oh, and here I thought Big Bad Abraham Owens was actually some kind of tough guy, Busted Nose sneered. I chuckled, spitting blood and what was probably a tooth fragment, if not the whole tooth. The connections to both of the fuckers vibrated loud in my chest, and my chuckle expanded into a full-on belly laugh, mirroring Busted Nose's psychotic amusement. Suddenly, he wasn't amused anymore. Hesitant, still confident, but suddenly less so. 
I fixed a bulging eye gaze on him and focused. The boss, I growled, a bloody spit bubble falling from my mouth. Busted nose hesitated again as the vibration went down the wire in the opposite direction. He swallowed hard and then said in a small voice, It was like a missile, a red deck guided missile. At least, that's what Malachi called it. Bobby! In a flash, I spun on my knees and bounced to my feet, ramming my fist into the other Nazi cunt. Blood exploded around my knuckles, and I had no idea how much of it was mine or the Nazis. I hit him again and felt the piano wire pulse with abject fear before snapping away. That was five. Boys! Malachi commanded. From his perspective outside the bus, Malachi couldn't see exactly what was happening. He was starting to sound more than a little nervous. Good. The bus, I said again, turning my focus back to busted nose, sweat pricking across my skull as I strained that invisible muscle. He stumbled backward as the vibrations hit him even stronger this time. He grabbed the pole as he sank to a bench. Oh, we knew it would cause enough damage, and if we didn't get her with the bus, the strike team would finish the job. I stepped right up to busted nose. This was all to kill Josephine Watson. Tears began spilling from his eyes. He knew exactly what I was going to do to him, because that's how the pull worked when reversed. Chapter 16 From outside the bus, I saw Malachi begin to clap. Asshole. I moved to the exit, the same one Malachi had stepped out of when this whole shit show began, and felt my senses sharpen with each step. The poll told me people were gathering beyond the walls of the library, and logic told me that emergency responders would be here soon enough. Do not worry, little baby A.B., Malachi said, clasping his hands together. The sons of the golden future have powerful friends in high places. We still have a few minutes before we're interrupted. I stepped off the bus and turned my entire focus on Malachi. Although every scrape, bruise, and cut yelped at me, the emotional noise was finally quieted, and I could hear Malachi as plain as day. That is, if there was anything to hear. It wasn't like Valdez or even Murph. I could sense the piano wire going straight through my brother, and the vibrations came down the line undisturbed. But instead of the rich twangs of complex emotion, the only thing the pole communicated to me was... indifference. Total apathy. I had felt emotion from him before, I was sure of it. Even between the booze and the other Nazi fucks, I had felt his genuine surprise. But now... now he just didn't care. It was as if he simply turned off his emotions. What happened to you, Malachi? I asked, almost pleading. He grinned, and those sparkling eyes now looked completely dead. Come now, isn't it obvious? I found Jesus. I accepted the Lord our Savior into my heart and embraced the Lord's plan for my life. I shook my head. Oh, this isn't right. I looked around the remains of Josephine's office, the walls that had crumbled into the rest of the library, the bodies littered amongst the debris, the bus, that fucking bus. You meant to kill her, I said. Just another black life lost in the race war the Sons of the Golden Future is adamant about starting. Malachi tipped a flat palm back and forth. More or less. That's why Samson tried to plant the knife on me, I continued. Malachi waved the idea aside. Oh, ho, ho, ho. do not get me started with that megalomaniac. I ticked off my fingers. Josephine, the hospital, Murph's liquor store, my own goddamn brother. Malachi shoved his hands into his pockets and waited. I felt nothing coming from him, so I focused and sent my own vibrations down the wire. The sons of the golden future have been targeting me, I growled. You're helping them, trying to get under my skin, draw me out. Malachi lifted his shoulders in an indifferent, mocking shrug. Clarity is a bitch. I focused again on the reverse pull and saw Malachi's eye twitch in response. Why are they doing this? Why are you helping them? Where did things go so wrong between us? 
Malachi's eye twitched again, but I still felt nothing substantive from him. Wait, strike that. I was picking up the faintest vibrations of hate. Oh, but I did pray for you, brother, Malachi said softly. Jesus, fuck. I backhanded a slick of blood from my mouth, flicking it to the ground before spreading my arms in front of Malachi. Well, here I am, I growled. You want me? Come and get me. In a flash, Malachi sprung forward, and we locked arms, each with a hand pulling at the other's head. Muscles strained, and veins popped, as fire met fire. <sighs> I never thought that the day would be the day, Malachi breathed as we each struggled for dominance. But here we stand through some act of divine intervention. Fuck you! Malachi kicked at my foot and used his weight to throw me off balance. He pulled me forward and threw his first punch at the same time. The blow connected with my jaw, and stars exploded as I spun like a fucking top before slamming into the bus. Whether intentional or not, Malachi had let me wear myself out with his contingent of disposable brawlers. He was bigger, stronger, and way less emotionally drained. Fuck me. I needed a drink. It is time to repent, Brother Abraham, Malachi bellowed. It is time to confess your sins and beg God for his gift of forgiveness. Malachi grabbed the front of my shirt and hoisted me up against the side of the bus, pressing his forearm into my throat. Yeah, the fucker definitely had more energy. How this ends is all up to you, little brother, Malachi said pushing me against the bus until the glass behind my head cracked. But know that no matter what path you choose, I will continue to pray for you. Malachi, I wheezed. He eased the pressure, eyes brightening. Speak, brother. F fuck off. I let go of his forearm and slammed both palms into his ears, clapping his head with as much force as I could muster. The effect was immediate, and Malachi stumbled back, dropping me to my feet. Even the piano wire responded to that one, despite his inexplicable apathy, and my own ears rang in sympathy. Malachi grunted angrily. Oh, you just never learn. And you're just a self-righteous, narrow-minded fuck, I spat back. Makes us about even in my book. Malachi rose to his full height and squared his shoulders. His voice boomed with that infuriating evangelical lilt. There is but only one book, Brother Abraham. Oh, shove it up, your cunt. I scooped up a random hardcover and flung it, the edge of the spine connecting with Malachi's forehead. He grunted again as blood trickled down from the cut, painting his face in streaks of red. He really did look mad. I charged him, and as I saw Malachi's fists go up, I went low, dropping to a slide and punching at the back of his knee. He twisted as he fell to a knee, and I rolled, scooping up more books as I went. Whip, whip. Two more hardcovers bounced off Malachi's head, leaving minor cuts in their wake. Nothing serious, and I certainly didn't need a psychic connection to tell it was pissing him off. Abraham! Malachi boomed. I grabbed the back of one of the chairs Valdez and I were sitting in ages ago and swung it. Malachi spun and hunched, covering his head and letting the chair explode against his back. He turned his head and glared over his shoulder at me. Yeah, he was definitely mad now. He pivoted to face me and stepped forward, brushing off the splinters. Repent, Abraham? Not likely. He grabbed my shirt and yanked me close. Repent? I grabbed his shirt. Why don't you fucking pray on this? We headbutted simultaneously, and I have no idea what happened next because blackness finally swept over me. Honestly, it was a little bit of a relief. But that relief lasted only until I swam back to consciousness, floating through the blackness. Wait, shit. I was floating through the air. No, scratch that. Malachi was holding me over his head and slowly turning in the wreckage of Josephine's office. There was one remaining floor-to-ceiling window, undamaged by the bus, and I saw it clearly as Malachi hurled me through it. Glass exploded, and I tumbled across the sidewalk and onto the pavement. 
glass and asphalt bit into my skin as I skidded across the parking lot. I groaned and my vision swam as consciousness threatened to be elusive. The pull informed me that more onlookers had gathered at the edges of the parking lot. I rolled onto my back and coughed. No, this wasn't looking very good, and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to take much more of Malachi's brotherly love. I tried pushing myself up to get a bead on the fucker, but every inch of my body protested. Malachi stepped through the shattered window before I collapsed back onto the pavement. Nope, definitely not good. Blackness continued to creep along the edges of my vision, and suddenly, my brother filled my view. He crouched over me, grabbed a fistful of my shirt, and... Wham! Repent! Wham! Little brother! Wham! Repent! Malachi released my shirt, and I collapsed. I could already feel my face swelling from his punches. He took a step back and shook his head at me. I could feel the disgust radiating from him. It never had to be like this, he said softly. I turned my head, coughed, and spat blood. You just have to repent. Accept his divine forgiveness. I planted a palm against the pavement and pushed with all my might. My torso rose, but I had no energy to get my feet under me. I opened my mouth but the words that came out were indecipherable. Malachi raised a melodramatic hand to his ear, squatting in front of me. What is it you say, little brother? They were distant, but I finally heard the sirens. Not that emergency responders were likely to help the situation, but it might slow Malachi down. I coughed again to clear my throat, and tried speaking again. I know you're not so poor, you can't buy yourself a fucking clue. I got my other hand under me and pushed up. Malachi shook his head again. You never cease to disappoint. Tell me then, little baby Amy. Clue me in. I slid a foot under me and braced myself, lifting my face in front of Malachi's. Fuck. Off. Just one person. Just one punch. It was an uppercut, and Malachi didn't see it coming. His head snapped back, and he tumbled across the parking lot. How's that for a fucking clue, you goddamn shit brain Jesus fuck? I sucked in a deep breath and listened as the sirens got louder. Blood spattered onto the pavement, and my fist ached like a motherfucker. I really needed a drink. I staggered to my feet just in time to see Malachi push himself up, rubbing his jaw and spitting out a tooth. The onlookers had piled up and closed in, emotional rods of rebar slamming into my chest, sending those unwanted vibrations through my quickly numbing body. Tears began spilling from my eyes, and they cut hot, wet trails down my cheeks. I had no idea where the emotion was coming from, but that was just the way it went, when I was beaten and broken. A dozen feet away, Malachi straightened and turned that apathetic gaze to me. Ah, oh, little baby A.B. I bristled and spat blood. Is that really all you got? He mocked. I tried to think of Josephine. Or Valdez. Murph, maybe. Even Beckett fucking Miller. Some kind of light at the end of this miserable tunnel. Something, anything, that would give me an iota more energy to push through this shit show. The sirens got louder. Malachi cracked his knuckles. The shit show was about to get a hell of a lot shittier. All right. Fuck it. If you're going through hell. I rolled my shoulders and cracked my neck. I swiped more blood from my face, letting it drip from my fingertips to the pavement. I clenched my fists against the tremors that were attacking my muscles. If I'm going down, I'm going down punching. Malachi took another step and was immediately struck by a speeding pickup truck. Malachi went flying, smashing through another plate glass window and tumbling into the circulation desk. The truck skidded, and the passenger door flung open. Valdez yelled at me from behind the steering wheel. Come on, Abe, let's go! I stood in shock, looking from the wrecked library to my truck to the onlookers. What in the actual fuck just happened? Let's go! Valdez yelled again. I climbed into the truck and yanked the door shut. Josephine was lying in the back seat. 
Nice of you to finally join us, Mr. Owens, she said. I, uh, I sputtered in confusion. Valdez never left. I told her to go, but she never left. Fuck me. I felt a pressure in my chest and looked down to see Valdez pushing one of the emergency bottles of whiskey at me. Fuck me. In a complete daze, I cracked the bottle and took a long, deep swig. Don't tell me that fuck job is actually related to you. Drive, I groaned. My voice sounded like gravel. Just drive, Valdez. Chapter 17 Josephine protested at every turn as we made our way to St. Charles General. She insisted she was fine, except for a scratch on her arm and a tear in her dress. Valdez and I, politely, ignored her at every turn. Valdez dropped me, my booze, and a cigar off on the outskirts of the parking lot where the hospital abutted a dense, wooded nature preserve that neighbored the city. A few years prior, there had been some violent attacks in those woods. Will Jacoby at the Sentinel had reported on them, describing the attacks as the result of a bear population reacting to city and suburban encroachment. I wasn't convinced back then, and when I found a rock to squat on, my back to those dense woods, I wasn't any more convinced today, as I felt the unmistakable tingle of creep walking up my spine while I waited for Valdez to circle back for me. I didn't just resist the urge to glance over my shoulder at the woods. I straight up took a fucking shit on it. I took a long swig from my emergency booze, safely wrapped in a brown paper bag and hidden from the dumbest of fucks, and silently invited any deranged, psychotic bear monster to explode from the woods and shred me to pieces. Sure, such an attack might be the most agonizing pain I'd ever experienced, but just think of all the feelings I'd never have to feel again. Between puffs of the cigar, a wave of woozy nausea swept over me and turned my stomach. I wasn't sure if that was courtesy of the blood loss and the beatdown I had just endured, or if it was the hospital's black hole of emotional distress and the sheer fucking exhaustion of the day. And that wasn't even acknowledging the weight of what was yet to come at the rally. Yeah, do your fucking worst, secret monster bear of the woods. I poured some more booze down my throat in an attempt to drown the nausea. The wooziness didn't abate and, all right, yeah, I was probably borderline delirious. The invisible gravitational force of St. Charles General made the pull twinge in my chest. Or maybe that was just a mild cardiac episode instead of a surprise bear attack. The fact that this was my second time today at this fucking hospital made me tip the bottle again. I puffed. I ached. I drank some more. And I waited. For bears, monsters, Valdez, and anything else the world wanted to throw at me. All the while, Malachi was a fucking virus that twisted like a corkscrew through my brain, chewing on what little functioning gray matter I had left. Let's chalk the mixed metaphors up to the delirium. As insufferable as Malachi had become after Gertie died, the idea that my older brother would align himself with the Sons of the Golden Future still felt absurd, despite what my bruised face and my swelling eye tried to tell me. While my brain couldn't rationalize it, my gut said it made perfect sense. Just like it was a short leap from white supremacy to male supremacy, it was probably just a short leap from religion to religious extremism, and an even shorter leap to fascist authoritarianism. I mean, just look at all the shit carried out in God's name. Or maybe they just use God as an excuse to be assholes, empowering the most extreme fuckheads among their ranks. Religion had a way of normalizing extremism, and when it no longer became socially beneficial to call it religion, the powers that be rebranded their belief system as politics. The entire institution was fine-tuned to radicalize and weaponize people. People like Malachi. People like Beckett Miller. Shit, Malachi went from a right-wing evangelical Jesus freak to a card-carrying white supremacist in just a few short years. Probably even less than that. Beckett Miller was a blank slate and got radicalized in months. It's no wonder Josephine always tells me to resist succumbing to anger and hate. Before the monster bear could leap from the woods, Valdez pulled up in the truck. Come on, let's go. 
I took a final pull on the cigar before grinding it out on the rock I was sitting on. I pushed myself to my feet, groaning all the way, and climbed into the truck. Valdez watched my hobbled progress with a weary eye. You still think this rally tonight is a good idea, or did these fucking psychopathic snail brain fuckwits beat some goddamn sense into that thick skull of yours? She asked. Drive. She did. And when we got to the St. Charles Sentinel, or at least what was left of the city newspaper after a decades-long decline of print publishing, and after Will Jacoby scooped it up, dumped the presses, and switched to an all-digital distribution model, Valdez swiped her keycard, taking us directly to the employee lounge at the heart of the building. The expanse of space made more sense when the newsroom bustled 24 hours a day, and the printing presses ran off morning and evening editions. Booths ran along the back wall for privacy, and dinette tables filled the main space. Centrally located was a bank of three wall-mounted televisions, displaying an animated St. Charles Sentinel logo. A foosball and an air hockey table were tucked in a corner, and the refrigerators, vending machines, coffee pots, and other kitchen staples were on the opposite end of the space. Kitchen staples that included a well-stocked first aid kit. Well, maybe well-stocked 20 years ago, Valdez muttered as she inspected a tube of Neosporin. This shit expired a long time ago. It'll do, I said, peeling off my bloodied shirt and laying it on top of my jacket that Valdez had placed on the back of a chair. She kicked out a chair and told me to sit before jogging over to the ice machine and filling a plastic shopping bag. She tied off the handles and tossed it at me. For your face, Valdez said, nodding at my swollen eye. I mean, you gotta at least try and look pretty for your wannabe Nazi boyfriend, right? I offered a less-than-approving guttural response before pressing the improvised ice pack to my face. The sting of cold made me hiss. And if you think that's bad... With her thumb over the spout of the antiseptic wound cleaner, she shook the bottle liberally over my back, rinsing the worst of the knife cuts with alcohol. I winced and hunched over the chair. Yeah, I have no idea how old this shit is, but I'm guessing it probably doesn't get smoother with age, Valdez mused as the cleaner fizzed against the cuts. If you could maybe enjoy this a little less. Tell me you'll blow off the rally and maybe I'll muster a bit of sympathy. She laid out a series of butterfly bandages on the table before patting my back dry with paper towels. You saw what those fuckers did at the library, I said. Yeah, and you saw what they did to our John Doe at the hospital this morning, Valdez shot back. Officer Shithead Samson already tried to frame you for that one, not to mention how many other lynchings these cocksuckers are responsible for. She smoothed the last of the bandages across my back before sitting across from me. Ape, listen, I don't know why you can't see that going to this rally tonight is tantamount to goddamn suicide, especially after what you just went through. I've been in worse fixes. Abe. I pulled the ice pack away from my face and met her gaze. Her dark eyes had gone painfully big, and those brows were deeply knitted. She was genuinely worried about me. Like, maybe a shitty expired band-aid wouldn't be nearly enough to hold my busted ass together after tonight. Again, I marveled at how this person could have such complex emotions, yet they never once triggered the pull. Maybe she was from another world. In a move that surprised me as I was doing it, I took Valdez's hand in my own. She was almost doll-like in my meaty paw. Listen, Valdez. Her face scrunched up, and she pulled her hand back. All right, fuck off with that shit. I just don't want to see you dead is all. The light in the room changed, and Valdez glanced over at the wall-mounted televisions. The fuck is that? The animated logo had been replaced with a view of the Sentinel's streaming studio. It was a wide shot with a table and chairs in the middle, oversized television screens providing a high-tech background, and studio lights were visible at the edges of the shot. Someone was manipulating the camera, and the shot zoomed in, tightening on the desk while removing the lights from the shot. Sunday is the fucking epitome of a slow news day. Valdez muttered, watching the screen in confusion. No one works, no one broadcasts, what the hell is going on in there? On the television, a man stepped into the shot and adjusted the table, pulling it away from the wall a few extra inches. He wore jeans, a brown dress vest, and a white dress shirt. Valdez stood and grabbed her messenger bag from the chair. That's Will. I'm going to give him the councilman photos and find out what's going on, she said. Uh, sit tight and, you know, put a shirt on or something. Valdez exited through a door on the far side of the room, and I pulled my shirt back on. 
An unexpected fuck you level of confidence filled my chest and made me stand a little straighter. I glanced over my shoulder just in time to see the door we had first entered swing open and a young girl in jeans and a t-shirt step through. A keycard badge on a lanyard displayed her photo and identified her as a member of the press. She chewed gum as she held the door open, gesturing to the employee lounge. You can wait in here until Will is ready for you, she said in a monotone. The person she spoke to stepped through the doorway, and I recognized the source of that fuck you confidence. The girl closed the door behind him, and the District 3 councilman stood alone. He was still wearing his blue suit and red tie. The last time I saw him, looking down from the parking garage, I couldn't really appreciate how tall he was. Now, I pegged him at 6'5 or 6'6, taller than me, and accentuated even more with how skinny the fucker was. Councilman White's eyes locked on me, and a smarmy, politician's grin spread across his face. He stepped forward and extended his hand. Ernest White, District 3, he said, a faint southern twang in his voice. Chapter 18 I looked at the councilman's offered hand. He had a gold ring on the pinky with a sizable black gem inset. My eyebrows went up, and I grunted, declining to take his hand. Fuck you, asshole. I'm not a dog, and I don't shake for treats. Councilman White retracted his hand, and I sensed equal amounts of embarrassment and awkwardness travel down the piano wire. But before I could even begin to enjoy making him uncomfortable, the councilman squashed his feelings like an emotional sumo wrestler. Ah, yes, there was that fuck you confidence again. He rubbed his chin as he looked me over, no doubt taking in the cuts and bruises that, unseen to him, were already starting to heal. Call it a very fringe benefit to whatever it was that made the empathy super. The councilman wagged a finger at me. There's something very familiar about you. Did you volunteer on my campaign last year? The poll didn't really tell me if he believed that or not, and all I was getting from him was that smarmy fuck you confidence cranked up to 11. I freelance for Jacoby, I lied, borrowing Valdez's background. You might have seen me at an event or two. White nodded slowly, glancing from me to the open first aid kit on the table. Freelancing tends to get a little rough, does it? I sat back down, casually crossing my legs. I walked into a door. White pulled out a chair opposite me and sat, smiling that shit-eating smile that politicians wear so effortlessly. And did the door punch back, or maybe a wall decided to get in on the action? A strange look crossed his face as he studied me. I felt the pull tell me the councilman was almost confused. You really are familiar, he said. I lifted a shoulder indifferently. Just have one of those faces, I guess. That door's like to hit, White quipped. Mmm, I grunted, bugging my eyes and glancing away. Nothing worse than a politician who thinks he's funny. White held up his palms. All right, I get it. Usually I have my wife polish up the jokes, but as you can see, I'm flying solo today. That confused thoughtfulness came back. White glanced at the wall-mounted televisions displaying the shot of the streaming studio, and then back at me. He pointed a finger in my direction. You're not here for the interview, are you? What fucking interview? I kept my voice flat not inclined to give him an inch. Nope. I could practically hear the gears grind as his wheels turned. The pull wasn't very helpful because that fuck you confidence was overpowering all of his other emotions. Still, fine. This was one of those rare scenarios when mainlining someone else's emotions wasn't debilitating. The councilman's fuck you confidence was downright invigorating. I could take this fucker all day long. So what are you working on? White asked. The words came out of my mouth before I knew what to say. The rally. I'm shooting photos for Jacoby. White glanced across the table. There was still just the first aid kit and my jacket over one of the chairs. No camera? 
white pressed, pointing out the obvious. That's what I'm waiting to get from Jacoby. I lied with surprising ease. The words were just there. Company gig, company equipment. It's a liability thing. Ah, he said. You know, I'm actually here doing this interview because of the rally. I guess you and I crossing paths is a little bit of cosmic kismet, if you will. I really fucking hated this guy. He smacked his lips and leaned forward. You know, let me ask you a question. I mean, you're a big guy. Tough, obviously. Ask any door. I'm pretty sure he didn't hear the growl that started somewhere in the back of my throat. Probably. But be honest, White continued, almost conspiratorially. Do you think this rally is a good idea? I mean, you're going there just to take photos, I know, but you'll be there in the middle of it. And who knows what these people are capable of, what they're even planning on doing. You seem worried. He didn't feel worried, still just that loud, annoying confidence. But I could play along if that's what he wanted. White was mulling something over, tapping the tabletop with a finger. It almost looked like a nervous tick. You know, honestly, I am. This isn't something that should be happening in our city. Right to assemble, freedom of speech, all that aside, this just isn't right. And those who remain silent might as just as well be condoning it. I let his words hang in the air. This was getting surreal. It was only a few hours ago that I saw this asshole in cahoots with a dirty cop who had just tried to frame me for a hate-based murder. And now the honorable councilman was trying out PR lines on me, condemning the actions of the people he was allegedly colluding with. And still, the piano wire sang loudly with that fuck you confidence. When it became clear that I had no intention of responding, White met my eyes with a cold gaze and said, What about you, Mr. Door-Busting Photo Freelancer? Do you condone the sons of the golden future? I'm no fan of Nazis, I replied, eyes going wide again. Never have been, never will be. White spread his hands over the table. Well, there you go, plainly spoken, clear as day. Except... His head canted sideways. And I say this only for journalistic clarity, but the sons of the golden future, they're not Nazis, you know. The fuck you confidence wavered, and I detected a note of annoyance, frustration, some kind of pet peeve. Ah, fuck you very much, Mr. Councilman, sir. I spoke slowly and intentionally. If... It looks like a Nazi, and it sounds like a Nazi. He waved that infuriating finger at me, and I resisted a very strong, compelling urge to snap it in two. See, that's, that's exactly why I have to do this interview. This, this misconception, this misunderstanding. People, broadly speaking, don't understand the movement. And you just want to clear the air? White sucked a whistling breath through his nose, and I felt the politician's confidence ramp back up, quickly eclipsing a note of disappointment. Justice demands clarity. Clarity requires action. The sons of the golden future represents that which will not be tolerated in the city of St. Charles. I nodded slowly. I think I looked agreeable, or at least I hoped I did. Then I smiled, something lopsided and stupid at the councilman. Oh, that's good. You should definitely use that line. The door on the far side of the room opened, and Will Jacoby, in his brown dress vest, leaned through. Councilman White, if you're ready, I can take you to the studio now. White stood and started to offer me his hand before thinking better of it. He nodded at me. Good chatting with you, then. Break a leg, I said flatly watching as the councilman disappeared through the door. Looking over at the televisions, I saw Jacoby and White enter the frame before sitting across from each other. Jacoby fussed with a lapel microphone while that girl from earlier stepped into the shot and helped the councilman with his mic. Are you seeing this shit? Valdez asked as she re-entered the break room. 
She walked right up to the television and raised the volume. Keep it conversational. I have questions, but if the conversation takes us in another direction, and this is live or will it be edited? The councilman interjected. Janie's behind the board mixing the shots live, but we're recording to tape as it were, Jacoby explained. I might do some light editing just to clip out any extraneous bits, but it should be online within the hour. Valdez scowled and muted the television. She stepped back and crossed her arms. I can't believe he's actually interviewing that lying sack of horseshit. It's like, what does Will even think he's going to get from a psycho fuck Nazi loving racist politician? She glanced over at me. Did you know it was the Astrid himself who came to Will for an interview? Fucking White said he wanted to give the Sentinel a one-on-one -on -one exclusive about the rally. Go fucking figure. I thought of White's compulsion to correct me about labeling the Sons of the Golden Future as Nazis. If the councilman is digging himself a hole, maybe Jacoby just wants to lend him a bigger shovel. Did he come through here? White, did you get anything off him? I shrugged. He's hiding something, but that's no mystery. He's oozing confidence about whatever it is he's doing. Also no mystery, Valdez said, her lip curling in disgust. What did Jacoby say about the photos? Gah. Valdez ran her fingers through her hair and plopped down into a chair. Journalistic standards can be a real fucking pisser, you know? I laid out the facts of the John Doe in the morgue, the footage of Stu Sampson trying to fuck you up, and the knife he tried to plant and then the photos of Councilman White leaving a meeting with SCPD's finest, including everyone's favorite fucking officer, and Will is being a giant fucking pussy about shoving it in White's face. Valdez gestured sharply at the muted television. I mean, he's right fucking there. Valdez crossed her arms again and fumed. I stood, went to the television, and turned the volume back up as Councilman White spoke. Should know that, while yes, I was instrumental in the formation of the Sons of the Golden Future, I am no longer involved with the organization, nor have I been for some time now. Let me get this straight, Jacoby said. You are admitting to the creation of an organization of which its sole purpose is to spread white nationalist values and ideals. Valdez was gobsmacked. What the fuck is happening right now? On the television, Councilman White raised a cautionary hand. Yes, again, I contributed to the creation of the Sons, but no, it did not start out as a white nationalist movement. What did it start out as then? Quite simply, it was a place for troubled young men, a place for opportunity, community, and alternative to the slippery slope of gangs, crime, and violence. A place where boys would feel welcomed, no matter the background or struggle or lofty ideals, Councilman. But you can't be ignorant to the rhetoric the Sons of the Golden Future are using. This whole rally, this is straight up white supremacy, and it's akin to setting a match to a tinderbox. White nodded and folded his hands on the table, evoking a certain kind of solemnity for the cameras. You are absolutely correct, and that is why I wanted to do this interview. I thought my history with the Sons could remain unspoken, but recent events, you're referring to the string of murders targeting African Americans, call them what they are, lynchings, violent, abhorrent, inexcusable lynchings, White said, getting appropriately worked up for the cameras. These people deserve justice, and justice demands clarity. As painful as it may be for my ego or my chances at re-election, clarity requires action. Fucker actually used the line. White turned to the camera and put on his best. Trust me, I'm one of you, face. Myself, the St. Charles Police Department, and the city of St. Charles itself do not condone or support the actions, stated or otherwise, of the Sons of the Golden Future. I personally denounce the organization and pledge to pursue unflinching justice for every act of aggression, violence, and civil disobedience committed by these thugs. The city of St. Charles stands for law and order. Our streets will be kept safe and justice against intolerance will prevail. You have my word. Oh my fuck, Valdez blurted, bouncing back to her feet. I muted the television again. 
How can he just sit there? Valdez. No, fuck that, Abe. Valdez started for the studio. I'm gonna... I grabbed her arm to stop her. It's not worth it, kid. Get your fucking paws off me, you meathead. Valdez spat. I let go of her arm and took a step back. She stood there fuming, but at least she wasn't going for the door. Did you get paid? I asked. Valdez scrunched her face up. What? Jacoby, he pay you for the photos? Valdez waved it off. He always pays. The check will be cut on Friday. I nodded. Good. Just another job, then. She stabbed a finger at the television, where Jacoby continued to silently interview the councilman. That is not just another job, Abe. That, I said, nodding to the television, is not your problem. Abe, come on! Valdez scoffed. If people like us don't say something assholes like that... Another angry stab at the councilman. End up getting away with fucking murder. I grabbed my jacket off the back of the chair. What, you need me to cut you a fucking check before you start caring about this shit? Valdez asked, her voice straining and a cord in her neck standing out. I pulled the jacket on and felt something heavy in the pocket. I don't like fights I can't win, and right now... I pulled the heavy object out of the pocket. It was a set of brass knuckles. They were old and tarnished, scratched to hell and showing their age. I held the knuckles up to Valdez. What the hell are these? I asked. Valdez held my gaze for a half second before looking down, her shoulders slumping. She sighed, and for once, I wished the pull would help me out. This kid was so twisted up, but I had no idea what was really going on inside her. Forget it, it, it was a dumb idea, she said quietly. Valdez. They, they belong to my abuelo. I blinked. Who? She snatched the brass knuckles from my hand, turning them around and tracing her fingertips over the finger holes. My grandfather, she said. These were his. He gave them to me before he died, and I... She let out a long sigh, but didn't look up from the knuckles. I had nothing to say to fill the silence, so I waited. He fought in World War II, Valdez finally said. He didn't talk about it much, or, I don't know, maybe I just never got a chance to hear, you know? But I do know that he used these to fuck up his share of Nazis, the, the real ones. She hesitated and then rolled her eyes. I, can, I, I guess they're all fucking real one way or another. But yeah, my abuelo fucked up his share of Nazis back in the day, and now he's dead. And now Nazis call themselves the sons of the golden fucking future. And my boss won't confront the biggest fucking wannabe Hitler in the city. And all I've got are these goddamn fucking knuckles. Another moment passed, and Valdez lifted her head to look me in the eyes. Look, I I know I can't talk you out of going to the rally. I, I don't know if it's a fight you think you can win, or if it's just the money, or if Josephine's right, and this is your way of, I don't know, doing something. She kept turning the knuckles around in her hands. I know you're gonna go, no matter how much I tell you it's the dumbest fucking thing you've done since traipsing around Dockside on a Friday night. Here. She stuck her hand out, offering the brass knuckles back to me. Y you should take these. I don't know what kind of hoodoo voodoo exists in the world, Valdez mused. But I know for sure you gotta have a little in you with that whole empathy thing. And your brother, he certainly seemed to have a little in him too. I took the knuckles back, but I was still confused. Without the pole telling me what she was feeling, this was just a weird, uncomfortable moment. What, what, what I'm saying is, uh, you know. Valdez stumbled over her words and then nodded at the knuckles. I hefted them in my palm, appreciating the weight of the brass. Maybe there's still a little hoodoo voodoo left over in these things, I suggested. Valdez nodded slowly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. I mean, they worked for Abuelo, right? The brass knuckles felt cold and solid, and not at all filled with hoodoo voodoo or anything else for that matter. Maybe I did believe, or maybe it was just to give Valdez a little peace of mind. But I nodded, shrugged, and said, You never know.
I pocketed the knuckles, and Valdez nodded again. Um, all right, she said. All right. I turned for the door. It was getting late, and Beckett Miller would be waiting. The aches and pains from Malachi's beatdown were finally growing numb, and there were Nazis waiting to be punched. Hey, Abe. I turned around in time to see Valdez throw her arms around me. I froze as she squeezed me in a hug, her face buried in my chest. It was weird. My arms hung stupidly at my sides, and I looked around the empty break room. Nope. No one was watching. And on the same note, no one was around to interrupt. This was the most physical interaction I'd ever had with Valdez, and, let's be honest, the most intimate I had been with anyone since Gertie. Very fucking weird. Try not to get yourself killed, okay, you fucking lugnut? I'm no wordsmith, and this was definitely not the moment I would rise to the occasion. Mmm, I grunted. I was about to pull away when I felt something odd. It was as strange as it was familiar. A distant piano wire fluttered in my chest. Valdez gripped me tighter, and the vibration twanged just a little bit louder. Motherfucker. The pull whispered softly to me, but I had never heard anything so clearly. It wasn't that Valdez was somehow immune to my psychic emotional pull. We just had never been physically close enough for it to work. But I felt it now. It started somewhere in my gut, worked its way up my chest, and grabbed a hold of my heart in a warm, soft embrace. Valdez loved me. Not in any romantic, bodice-ripping, doe-eyed bullshit way, but a deep, respectful affection. The kind of love you have for someone you genuinely care about. Someone, someone you cherish. Someone who would leave a hole in your life if they suddenly disappeared. I knew exactly how she felt. And it wasn't just because the pull sent those feelings directly to my head where Valdez's emotions became my own and pricked at my eyes. No, I knew how she felt because, somewhere along the line, I started feeling the same way about Valdez. She squeezed me again, and the vibration pulsed in my chest. Like the hug itself, I hadn't felt this kind of love since Gertie. All right, you fucking twerp. I wrapped my arms around Valdez and felt the piano wire sing out between us. Thanks, kid. Chapter 19 By the time I climbed on the bus, I had already made a pit stop at my truck, and my brain was swimming in the warm, friendly waters of emergency rum. The glass flask was only half empty and nestled safely in the pocket of my army coat. The weight was as comforting as it was tempting, and once I settled in the back of the bus, I kept myself busy looking for moments to nurse the bottle of rum. It was an essential pre-game for my appointment with Beckett Miller, and the rum's happy swirl was effective at cancelling the emotional appointment scheduled by the pole. But even after climbing onto the bus to Lake Stevenson Park, I still wasn't sure if I would be keeping my appointment with the Nazi reject with the alleged heart of gold. The fact of the matter was that, despite my posturing and proverbial tough guy oeuvre, Valdez was completely correct. Keeping the appointment and pushing deep into this alt-right rally of goddamn fucking doom was a bad idea on any day of the week, and even worse today after my knuckle-dragging run-in with Malachi. And while my unique style of hoodoo voodoo, as Valdez so eloquently described it, had me back at about 60 or 70 percent, even my particular flavor of rum-drowned Play-Doh brains knew the odds of getting through tonight's job without severe trauma was low. Yeah, Valdez was 100 percent correct. Fuck you very much. And yet, there I sat. At the back of the bus, not currently hijacked by Nazis, but still on a collision course with a whole lot of pain. 
both physical and emotional. The news of the afternoon's bus attack must have spread quickly, because while the bus lines serving the city of St. Charles were still running, there were only a handful of riders, and they were all nervous. Dodgy eyes stole quick, shifty glances in my direction. To be fair, though, I certainly looked the part of a potential bus hijacker. The cuts and bruises on my face probably didn't help either. That warm, happy swirl was starting to cool off, and those probing tendrils of emotions from the other passengers began to creep across my skin like cold fingers making their way to my chest. There was a young woman in a faded red and gold shirt with an embroidered burger logo. She was exhausted and edgy. She had two young kids at home, alone, because the delinquent sperm donor had disappeared again. Or maybe he was stocking up and prepping for the rally. Either way, after she heard about the bus attack, she decided that leaving her kids home alone while she worked the late shift was a slightly better idea than dragging them to the dive burger joint where they would fall asleep in a cold, plastic booth after a hearty dinner of french fries. Two days ago, she had a working car. One day ago, white smoke started pouring from the exhaust before she could get out of the driveway. Now, she prayed the night would be uneventful and she'd get home safely. My chest tightened as the girl's carousel of anxiety shifted from the burger joint getting wrecked during a riot to bills, endless bills, and now the fucking car. And would she ever be able to afford those steam-in-the-bag vegetables meant to offset the french fries, or maybe it wouldn't be so terrible if she never even made it home tonight? I had to force my attention away from her before the pull sharpened any more. I snuck a sip of the rum, swallowing hard and resisting the cough that strained my throat. There was an old woman sitting in the middle of the bus, almost lost under countless layered coats. Homeless, forgotten by most, and for those family members who still remembered, they simply ignored her. And this was apparently just fine by the old woman since they were liberal fucking skunks fixing to destroy the world with their socialist agenda. Better to be forgotten than suffer fools who can't even pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, whatever the hell that meant. Another long drink. I backhanded my mouth and tried desperately to focus on the sensation of rough stubble scraping against moderately less rough skin. There was a father who was barely containing a nervous panic. He was riding with his toddler-aged girl, who seemed excited to be experiencing the exotic thrill ride that was public transportation. The man was trying to take his kid to the movies, but he couldn't help but think the unthinkable. He spiraled helplessly in a whirlpool of doom as he imagined all the life events his daughter would never get to experience if the worst were to happen to this bus. Sweet Sixteen. First kiss. Boyfriend. Girlfriend. Whatever, he wouldn't judge but instead accept her for the perfect human that she was. College. Graduation. Marriage. Motherfucker. I tore my eyes away from the man and studied my lap, fingering the flask of rum in my pocket. Seriously, what the fuck was I doing here? Even if I was at 100%, this job was the closest thing to a suicide mission I had ever taken. The whole thing reeked of something rotten. From whatever circle jerk Councilman White was engaged in with this mystery Peter character, to Malachi's involvement, SCBD bending over backwards to pin the lynchings on me. The happy swirl grew less happy as the ebbing warmth begged for another shot from the flask. And why the fuck was I even entertaining the notion of this job? So some pussy-footed Gen Z cuck could have a private word with his ex-girl and hope to fucking hell he stands the slightest chance of getting his dick wet again? Hate to break it to you, Beckett Miller, but no amount of chin-wagging was gonna convince that self-hating chick that the white supremacist asshole she's obsessed with weren't two steps away from locking her in a cage and maybe selling her in some kind of sex trade. So what the hell was I even doing here? What else could possibly be wrong with these useless Play-Doh brains? I thought of Josephine. She was safe now at the hospital, but that was only after those fuckheads drove a bus into her library to try to kill her. And if the bus didn't work, Malachi was more than happy to finish the job with his Nazi murder goon squad, adding Josephine to the list of blacks already killed by the sons of the golden future. 
Yeah, Josephine was safe for now. But what about tomorrow? And then I thought of Murph and his liquor store from this morning. I fucked up whatever plan the Sons of the Golden Future had for him, and Murph was safe. Today. But what about the next person those assholes tried to lynch? What about the next city bus the Sons hijack? And again, big bad brother Malachi. Then there was that sinking feeling from when Mad Malachi all but confirmed how everything that had happened, Murph, Josephine, Samson with that knife, Malachi himself, it had all been designed to draw me out. It was almost nauseating, this feeling like walking into some kind of elaborate trap. And what in the fuck did Beckett Miller's ex-girl have to do with any of it? Or the beatdown and robbery at Dockside? Was that connected to Plato brains or not? I couldn't see the connections, much less make any sense as to why I was being drawn out. I felt like I was trying to read one of Josephine's more complex recommendations, but the first half of the book had been torn out, lit on fire, and ashes scattered in a goddamn hurricane. It just didn't make any sense, and it left me feeling like the toddler's father who was trapped in an emotional whirlpool. I was on the bus to the rally, but I had no idea what I would do once I got there. Forget trying to read one of Josephine's books. I felt like I was one of those books, but with the back half torn out. The alcohol muted pull vibrated somewhere in the distance, and I looked over to the father and daughter sitting toward the front of the bus. He had been trying to keep a protective arm around the squirming bundle of energy, but now she was up on her knees, tiny fists gripping the grab bar on the bench and watching me with large, curious eyes. The kid lifted one of those tiny fists, spread her fingers, and waved at me. She peeled her lips back in an exaggerated, toothy smile. I felt another distant twinge of the pull, and my face contorted painfully in a Pavlovian response to the girl's simple, raw emotion. I was smiling at her. It was dumb, and I hated it. Then I found myself lifting my own hand and waving back. Her face squished into a giggle, shoulders thrusting forward and those tiny, innocent hands moving to her mouth. The father glanced over his shoulder, and the girl's simple, happy, was quickly eclipsed with abject fear and anxiety and, please just let us get off this bus safely. My smile melted and my face returned to its resting fuck-you state. Josephine's words echoed in my head. Ever since she helped decode the pull and figured out the range of my superpowered empathy, its triggers, and consequences, she repeatedly warned me to be wary of anger and hate. Since I could naturally feel someone else's emotions, nuclear-level emotions like anger and hatred would always be devastating. Succumbing to those emotions, especially when they belong to someone else, could be catastrophic. This father was fearful and anxious. Underneath, I could taste his hatred for me, a person he didn't even know. I looked the part, and that scared him, so he hated me for it. His daughter, though, she didn't even know what it meant to hate someone. She had no fear because she had no reason to be scared. She had no anxieties, no concerns. Because, what the fuck does a toddler know about Nazis? With Josephine's warning rattling in my head, I realized that this city bus had been slowly succumbing to the hate, anger, and rage fomented by the sons of the golden future. The line had already been crossed, and the logical part of my brain was convinced that nothing short of a Herculean miracle could pull the city out of that whirlpool of doom. If there was one thing I wanted most in the world, it would be to somehow undo what happened with Gertie, or even have one extra moment with her, unburdened by crippling empathy, to simply apologize for abandoning her. Since that was impossible, the second thing I wanted most was to retreat to the quiet isolation of my lakeside manor with a stack of books, a cooler of booze, and no fucks left to give. Away from people. Away from their goddamn feelings. Sweet fuck, I wanted that more than anything. The little girl judged me with innocent eyes, 
and something inside me wanted to beg her for forgiveness. If this child, who knew nothing of hate, could forgive me for walking away, retreating to the safety of my isolation, I told him that instead of apologizing, he should go out there and start doing something about all that wrong he participated in, Josephine had said earlier. And maybe Beckett doesn't stand a chance at getting through to his girlfriend, but maybe the very act of trying is a step in the right direction. The little girl twisted under her father's fearful arm and raised her hand to wave at me again. In my pocket, my fingers drew back from the flask of rum. The pull twisted like a goddamn corkscrew in my chest. Everything is fucking spiraling. I waved back. The little girl giggled. Yeah, I made my decision. Chapter 20 As soon as I stepped off the bus at Lake Stevenson Park, I immediately regretted that decision. Damn them up! Lock, lock them, them up! Lock, lock them, them up! Real men swing real dicks. This feminization trans bullshit is a goddamn plot by those fags in Hollywood to emasculate men and replace us. Hey, I'm just asking questions, man. I don't know the answers, and it's not like it's a federal fucking crime to just ask questions, right? So listen, what are the Muslims doing here, right? Think about it. What's so wrong about being white and proud? I refuse to let them say I'm wrong and somehow guilty just because of the color of my skin. That's the real racism. Evening clouds were turning pink as the sun began to set, and I decided it was cosmically appropriate. Pink, a watered-down shade of red. Red, the color of hate. The sons of the golden pisser. Angry, hateful assholes propped up and normalized by an orange turd and desperate to snuff out all other colors before the watered-down pink pussies themselves get snuffed out by the merciless wheel of time. History may be more generous. But there was no denying that the city of St. Charles had a Nazi problem in the here and now. Lake Stevenson Park was packed. The bus stop ushered riders into a park that spanned dozens of acres, encircling the edge of Lake Stevenson. A large band shell sat near the water with massive speaker arrays, pumping out god-awful alt-right power ballads, battle cries, and bullshit. Fucking Antifa commie cunts, I'm just trying to keep our side of the park clean, organized, and under control. If just being here pushes those radical fucks to commit acts of violence against us, we are not afraid to defend ourselves. Of course it's my body, my choice. The government can't tell me jack shit, and if they try, I'm a jack shit the goddamn fucking White House. They're eating babies, you know. They're handing out abortions like it's the new look for summer, aborting babies, killing children, and eating fetuses. The lasers would totally reach because they faked all of it. That fat fuck who did the shiny, he directed the whole fucking thing. God, Jesus, bless our brothers as they spread your word and guide our hands as we work to change the hearts of the Jews, Arabs, Muslims. Trucks of three essential varieties had jumped the curb and parked throughout the rally, acting as base camps of activity. There were big trucks because, well, obviously... Then there were even bigger trucks, lifted trucks, trucks with massive off-road tires, and trucks that practically announced the owner had a microscopic cock that required an industrial-grade magnifying glass and nano-tweezers just to take a piss. Almost all the trucks sported flags, and while the flags varied in color and design, most seemed to be as large as the truck they were attached to. Some of the flags hung flaccid in the evening air, while others flapped ostentatiously in the breeze of battery-powered shop fans hauled to the rally by thoughtful racists eager to show their allegiance to the Southern Confederacy. All lives matter, blue lives matter, orange turds don't tread on me, and the sons of the golden future. Call it whatever you want. Spill all the white paint the world has to offer until it's covered drowned, and barely recognizable. A Nazi is a Nazi is a goddamn fucking worthless scum of the earth Nazi. The sun's flag was peppered throughout the park at a much higher frequency than the others. 
There were large and small billowing sheets, embroidered patches, and tasteless armbands. The logo remained consistent, so someone in the organization was staying on top of their branding. Thank the fucking lord of racists. It wouldn't surprise me if they hash-plugged a butt tag for the rally, or whatever these fucks do on their phones. The logo was the same three dots set inside a circle, the same shit I had seen as a tattoo on the back of so many heads. On the flags, the larger circle was depicted as a yellow sun. Sprinkled among the symbols representing the mainstreaming of white rage was the granddaddy of them all. The swastikas were on flags, banners, and in some cases, armbands strapped to human shit stains dressed in full SS regalia. Yeah, the city of St. Charles definitely had a Nazi problem. Clustered around the truck islands were barbecue trailers and canopies where vendors sold honest-to-God hate merch. Oh, did you forget your swastika armband? Ten bucks and just think of all the memories. Beer and liquor looked like it was flowing freely. Oh, and those fucking tiki torches. So many fucking tiki torches. It is called freedom of speech for a reason. Just hanging out with like-minded folks, having a drink. I can't control how other people act. I'm just here, and I can tell you, I don't have a lick of hate in my heart or the slightest notion of violence in my head. But if you ask me, those counter-protesting Antifa snowflakes are fucking lucky we are not beating the ever loving shit out of their ignorant fucking brains. Yo, oh, if you think that's big, you gotta check out the gear in my truck. Fully auto bump stock fucking laser sights. I say fuck all the parties because even the GOP don't represent me. I'm a goddamn conservative and proud of it. No, 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 no. Western chauvinist, not male chauvinist. Do you even know what that word means? No, look, let me explain because you do not know how wrong you are and I know you're going to thank me. My stomach twisted and my resting fuck you face went sour, if that was even possible as I took in the sheer volume of people who showed up to this hate parade. I wouldn't have ever believed it if I wasn't staring at it with my own eyes. Worse still was how normalized, institutionalized, and celebrated it all was. Without realizing it, I had drawn the flask of rum to my lips and slowly poured the last of the liquid courage down my throat. Mr. Owens! I pivoted in time to see Beckett Miller scurrying up to me. His eyes were big behind his glasses, and his brows were pulled together like he needed to take a shit. He clutched a brown paper lunch sack so tightly, his knuckles were white. When I heard what happened at the library with the bus attack, I wasn't sure you'd still- Yeah, I'm here, I said flatly, cutting him off. With an awkward thrust, Beckett offered me the paper sack. Um, well, like I said, it's not much, but I hope it's enough. I peeked in the bag and saw a handful of bundled hundred-dollar bills. That was a whole lot of booze money, and it represented a whole lot of blissful isolation, peace, and some goddamn quiet. I just had to make it through the night before I could appreciate any of it. You know, I said slowly, tucking the cash away and buttoning the coat pocket for safekeeping. People usually like to pay the balance after the job is complete. Beckett no longer looked like he needed to take a shit, and instead looked like he just shit his pants. Ah, uh, uh, sorry, I, I just... Fucking kids. I waved it off. Don't worry about it. it. Means you trust me. That's good. The kid was nodding rapidly and turned to face the gathered racist masses. Right, okay, so, uh, this is it. The, uh, the sons have their base camp set up just beyond the band shell. Beckett pointed to the stage with a massive speaker arrays. They're going to have this whole lineup of speakers tonight, and I've heard it's supposed to end with a surprise keynote addressed by Peter. I raised an eyebrow at him. That's a name I've heard a lot today. What can you tell me about him? Beckett shrugged. I don't know, um, well, before I got involved with the Suns, there was some kind of, a uh, power void, I guess. Peter was the person who stepped in and, and basically took charge. And nobody challenged him. <laughs> challenged him? Beckett repeated with a small scoff. I don't think anybody wanted to challenge him. He was too enigmatic, too... Beckett searched for the words. 
He represented everything these guys wanted to be, or at least that's what he made them think. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're asking why someone didn't challenge his leadership, well, uh, you clearly haven't met Peter. No, not yet, I hadn't. But I found myself looking forward to the introduction, especially the opportunity to introduce my fists to Peter's face. But anyway, their base camp is behind the band shell, and Peter should be back there, Beckett continued. Corey's been a shit, um, well, I guess a devout follower of Peter, and, and yes, I know how that sounds. An anxious hand rubbed his eyebrow. But, but if she's anywhere in this mess, she's, she's with him. I nodded. Find Peter. Find the girl. And when I find Peter, maybe I could have a few private words with him. You know, find out why today of all days had been designated shit all over a Bowen's day. We just have to get behind the band shell, Beckett said, quietly underlining the shitty part. Any other day, it would have been a literal stroll in the park. Today, Nazis. So many fucking Nazis. And they were armed to the teeth, obsessed with kill counts, and desperate for any reason to start throwing punches. But, uh, yeah, it, you know, it's really the counter-protesters you need to be on the lookout for. Beckett pointed to the other end of the park, where a modest gathering was protesting against the Sons of the Golden Future. They waved banners, proclaiming, Down with fascism! Nazis not welcome here! And swastikas crossed out with blood-red paint. If they stay on their side of the park, it should be fine, Beckett said. But if someone crosses the line, well, I, I guess I don't have to tell you it's a friggin' tinderbox out here. Maybe one day I'd be able to laugh at the absurd irony of being wary of the anti-fascist nonviolent protesters as I carved a path through a hornet's nest of hateful, trigger-happy, Nazi-worshipping nutjobs. One day... I'd like to think i chuckle at the memory, if I even made it through the night, that is. M M Mr. Owens? I realized I had been frowning intently and staring blankly for a moment too long. I looked at the kid, and his face twitched, that telltale muscle spasmed around his eye. He looked a lot younger than he had just this morning. We, we, uh, we should get going then, right? Beckett asked, his voice betraying an increasing nervousness while his hands twisted over each other. Yeah, I nodded. Stay close. If you lose me, find a place to stay put and wait for me to find you. Another rapid nod, and we both turned to face the rally. Beckett started muttering something to himself, probably psyching himself up. I can do this, we can do this, I can do this, we can... He looked at me again, and those eyes went big. We can do this, right? Ah, oh, fuck, kid. Yeah, sure. I lied. Why not? We stepped into the rally, pushing forward into the crowd of Nazis. So many goddamn fucking Nazis. Chapter 21 Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold up, you maggot-brain pig fucking cum stain! The rally's cacophonous roar of emotion swirled under a distant, wet blanket. But Beckett was close, and his anxiety was like a needle stabbing at my brain. He stopped in his tracks and winced in recognition of the voice that shouted at him. I placed a cautious hand on his shoulder. It was narrow and bony underneath the purple polo, and I realized the kid was scrawnier than he looked. No wonder he wanted backup. Given the right circumstances, he could get fucked up by a strong gust of wind. Maybe he had always been like this. Or maybe the guilt of being a former Nazi had nipped away at his conscience and appetite with equal ferocity. We turned to the person who called out to Beckett. He was almost my height, wearing that typical son's uniform of a white t-shirt, slacks, and suspenders. This one had a red swastika armband fitted across his bicep. His eyes were huge, clearly entertained by the sight of Beckett, and his grin was of the massive, shit-eating variety. He stood at the back of one of the smaller trucks in the park, and it looked like he was selling Nazi merch from the tailgate. Beckett fucking Miller, the entrepreneurial fuckhead said, arms spread wide in one of those bro-culture greetings. 
Hey, they always come back, my man. I told you that, right? They always come crawling back. You got back out in the real world and realized we were right all along. Am I right? We got to stick together, man, because we are the minority now. And if you don't fight back, they will 100% not stop until we are shucked, cucked, and straight up fucking fucked, my man. This twat was the literal embodiment of a piece of shit that had fallen out of the wrong hole. His eyes shifted to me and sized me up. He looked like he was at Fun World, surrounded by roller coasters, and I was his next ride. Every instinct told me to punch him in the face or shove my foot up his ass if his head wasn't already firmly planted up there. And even though the park was packed, I figured if I dropped him at the right angle, I could shove him under the truck and no one would be the wiser. Of course, the risk was still unnecessary and cooler heads prevailed. For now. Beckett's voice was quiet, but I could hear it wavering. Hey, 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 Todd. Todd, go figure. Come on, bro! Todd grabbed Beckett by the shoulders, a little too enthusiastically. This is great! I mean, sure, you were a puddle-fucking pussy shit for trying to dry dick that whole fade-to-black routine, but you're back, just like Peter said, because once the blinders come off, there's no putting them back on! Todd tapped Beckett's forehead. You're awake now, dude. You've been red-pilled. You know the truth. And once you see that shit, no matter how much you try, it cannot be fucking unseen. You know what I'm saying. Todd suddenly frowned, staring at Becca's head as if noticing it for the first time. Aw, fuck off, you shit slick cum bucket. Then he winked at the kid. We gotta get you suited up, my man. As Todd rifled through the merch on his tailgate, Beckett and I glanced at each other. I nodded in the direction of the band shell. For the love of fuck, Beckett, let's keep going. Here, on the house, Dickles! Todd tossed a ball cap with an embroidered swastika at Beckett. On account of you being back, embracing your malformed, pussy-footed mistake, and paying penance by bringing this beautifully badass motherfucker as a recruit. Ah, I'm a recruit now. I guess I looked the part. Todd clapped Beckett on the shoulder. Baller move, little man. Excellent strategy to get back in Peter's good graces. He turned that shit-eating grin to me. I mean, look at the size of this fucker. Probably got a cock like a brick house, am I right? Holy fuck, you look like the Rock and Vin Diesel butt-fucked each other and their jizz was fucking turkey bastard into Jason Statham's asshole. Ho oh, ho, yeah, you will do just fine. Todd took a short step back, clicked his heels, and straightened his shoulders. He whipped his arm out at me, grinning like a fucking lunatic. Hail Hitler! Cooler heads took an impromptu vacation, and my fist snapped out, punching the fucker in the face. I felt the crack in my knuckles more than I heard it, and he dropped like a sack of turds. He wasn't getting up anytime soon. Beckett panicked. Oh, gee, oh, gee, Jesus, shit, Abe! Shut up, I hissed, pivoting so I could help Todd under his truck, rolling him as unceremoniously as I could. His arm flopped and I nudged it back under the truck with my foot. Beckett was turning nervously, scanning the crowd. Damn it, I'm paying you to watch my back, not punch out every asswipe that crosses our path, which, which I don't know if you've noticed or not. Beckett gestured emphatically at the alt-right rally surrounding us. I scanned the crowd to get a sense of anything above and beyond the dull, muted roar of the emotions around us. Fortunately, the whole thing went down too quickly for anyone to notice. This time. But the kid was right. My job was to get him to his girl, and it wasn't like King Fuck Todd was actually standing in our way. Of course, all the places to lose my cool, this could have been the worst. Still, Fuck Todd. I shrugged and quirked an eyebrow at Beckett. Fair enough. You paid for backup. Consider that one a freebie. A freebie? Beckett rubbed his hands over his face and groaned. Oh my god, Jesus Christ, this was such a bad idea. Yeah, I've been meaning to mention that, I said dismissively. Come on, let's get you to your girl. Beckett glanced at the swastika cap before tossing it back on the tailgate. As we started away from Todd's truck, he said, Try not to draw any more attention to us, though, okay? Th th this is hard enough as it is. Shit, if the kid didn't want to draw attention, he should just wear the fucking hate hat. Not that it would have mattered. 
As we continue to push through the crowd, I finally spotted the battalions of police staged at strategic perimeters. They were decked out in the finest riot gear taxpayer dollars could afford, arranged in formations and waiting for action. Standing back and standing by. And like strangers across a crowded room, my gaze locked with Officer Stu Sampson's. His eyes were bruised and angry, his nose taped up under his riot helmet, and his busted hand was strapped securely to his chest while he balanced the stock of a shotgun on his hip. He had been tracking me as we moved through the crowd, so it stood to reason he might have seen me punch out Beckett's buddy. Almost as if to confirm my suspicions, Stu Sampson smiled and winked at me. I got the distinct sense that he wanted me to know he wasn't in any rush. Perfectly patient, as if this was all part of some grand, fucked-up plan. Yeah, so much for drawing attention. They already knew we were here. We pushed forward, doing our best to avoid the drinking racist masses packed so carelessly into the park. Paths were easy to cut between clustered groups, but I still found myself jostled by the frequent, enthusiastic drunk. Occasionally, when we drifted too close to one of those police battalions, I placed a firm hand on Beckett's shoulder to point him in a different direction. What we're really doing is raising awareness for domestic terrorism. With those leftist cucks in charge of Congress, we are the last line of defense. I love my country and the people that make America great. All those fucking niggers need to go straight back where they came from. Our God-given right is protected in the Constitution. A well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Because all the paths lead to the depopulation of Anglo-Saxon Americans. They are threatened by our superior bloodlines, and you know what? They goddamn better well should be. The deeper into the rally we pushed, the more open-carry firearms I saw. Holstered handguns, assault rifles slung across chests, redneck rifles, and shotguns displayed alongside Confederate flag markings. And then there were the complete sets of body armor and protective gear. Shields crafted from halves of plastic barrels, canisters of mace and bear spray. I clocked the occasional samurai katana, but honestly, the assholes waving that shit around were more likely to hurt themselves before their blade found someone else. But guns? They were lazy, senseless, and nine times out of ten, they gave the asshole pointing the gun more unchecked, deadly power over their fellow man than they deserved. I've rarely met a problem I couldn't solve with my fists. And it's been my experience that the only people who brought a gun to a fistfight were desperately overcompensating for something. In other words, it was no mystery that the rally was practically drunk on gunpowder. Soon, we smelled something burning and saw black smoke starting to billow. I heard a distinct whoosh amongst the cacophony of chanting chatter and that horrible, blaring music. Racists were bad. Racists with guns were even worse. Racists setting fire to things with flamethrowers. Covering the rally, would you be interested in answering some questions? It was a young woman with dark hair. She casually held a video camera with a large shotgun microphone pointed at the ground. She wore a shirt with a local television news logo on it. We're not the ones you want to talk to, lady, I said, pushing back and forward. Well, you're here, she pressed. I'd just like to find out what it is about the Sons of the Golden Future that you are standing in support of. I, I do not support the Sons, Beckett snapped. If anything, I grabbed his shoulder again, this time clamping my hand tightly. It was too late, though. The reporter's eyes flashed with a dangerous curiosity, and the muted pull whispered her feelings to me. No, you're right, lady. We don't belong here. And the reason why is indeed a better story. Antifa press, fake news. Fuck the lamestream media and your Antifa leftist agenda. Stop pushing your fake Antifa agenda. You can't spin facts. All it took was one wannabe Nazi punk to call out the reporter, and in seconds we were surrounded by an angry mob. They were only too eager to lay into the reporter. I pulled Becca close as the reporter attempted to reason with the unreasonable. I am not an Antifa journalist. Fuck socialism! I work for WXCB News. I'm just trying to report on the facts of the evening. Hey, I'm not Antifa! One of the punks crushed a beer can and threw it into the dirt. You might not be Antifa, but you're still a fucking Jew! The vibrations from the mob shifted, and a sour, sick feeling turned my stomach. I watched as someone spun a baseball bat 
and more than a few hands began inching toward holstered sidearms. <laughs> hey, you dirty fucking Jew, one of the assholes yelled. What's the difference between a cow and the Holocaust? Oh, fuck. People stopped milking the cow after 70 fucking years. My chest suddenly felt like it was going to cave in on itself. A mix of my own gut reaction to the unapologetic and emboldened anti-Semitism, and the reporter's own raw emotional response. For better or worse, I wasn't the only one disgusted. A group of anti-protesters had muscled into the conversation. Beckett's anxiety flared into my brain as the two sides screamed at each other while the reporter whipped her camera back and forth. Six million Jews were murdered and you're making jokes? Oh, fuck off. This is how fucking pervasive the Jewish conspiracy is. Yeah, here we go, rolling out the Suns' greatest anti-Semitic hits. Oh, why don't you fuck right the hell off? There is literal documentation from the goddamn Red Cross, I shit you not, that proves only 300,000 Jews were killed. So six million, yeah, six fucking million. That is a total fucking fantasy. So you admit the Jews were murdered, you just have a problem with the body count. That's about right, you xenophobic fucking... Yeah, bitch, I got a problem with the fucking body count. It's too goddamn fucking small. The Holocaust was systemic mass murder, but not of Jews. Oh, for fuck's sake, there is 100% zero evidence of any order from Hitler to kill the Jews. If the Holocaust was real, don't you think there'd be something to prove it? And with no order, there were never any gas chambers. So even if you believe the Nazis had an order to kill Jews, there was no practical way for them to kill six fucking million of the kikes. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is wrong with you? It was all bulldozed. All the buildings and the structures, everything was bulldozed before the war was even over. There's no fucking evidence because it's all a fucking hoax by the Jews who are just making themselves out to be the victims to steal power away from the whites. I didn't see who started the shoving, but it was one of the sons who threw the first punch. I grabbed a fistful of Beckett's shirt and yanked him back, trying to pull out of the fray. I heard a loud crunch of smashed electronics and an angry yelp from the reporter as our camera was destroyed. In the distance, Officer Sampson watched the violence unfold. I didn't need my empathy working to know the fucker was enjoying himself. If the Jews were so fucking chosen, wham, why did God let so many of them die? Crack! God has chosen the white man. Foomp! God bless America! Fuck! Master race! Ksh. Stand united in his name, the Lord our God! I threw an arm around Beckett taking that baseball bat to my shoulder as I barreled through the last of the brawling protesters. I whipped my arm out, backhanded one of the thugs that got too close, and then dragged Beckett to the other side of the truck. Relatively safe from the brawl, Beckett dropped to the ground and leaned against the truck tire. He must have taken a hit because a red welt was swelling under his eye and a trickle of blood ran from his nose. What the fuck? He hissed. You okay? I peered around the truck. He wiped at the blood and inspected it. Fuck, I, I mean, yeah, I guess. I peered around the truck. The brawlers were losing steam and the anti-protesters were trying to extricate themselves one by one. Across the way, Officer Sampson continued to not intervene. I dropped back down, squatting next to Beckett. Did you see how quickly they shifted to that crazy god shit? Th 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 those fucking religious fanatics don't even care. Beckett rubbed his face, his arms shaking from anxiety. They, they, they don't even realize how much they're being manipulated. What do you mean? The sons were never religious. I mean, that did not at first, but Peter specifically brought in this evangelical nut job, and suddenly the whole lot of them went crazy for God, guns, and country. Beckett explained. When you become a pledged member of the sons, now, now they make you abstain from any kind of sexual release in order to reach this higher level of purity for God or some bullshit. There was no doubt in my mind. Malachi was the evangelical nut job, and weaponizing pent-up sexual frustration was the oldest trick these assholes got out of the good book. I won't hold it against you, kid, I said quietly. Beckett looked at me, confused. If you want to cut your losses and get the hell out of here, I explained. Beckett glanced around the truck, and I followed his gaze. Behind us, the remnants of the Holocaust brawl, vendors, trucks, and dozens of yards of St. Charles City's finest park 
filled to the brim with alt-right rally-goers. At the street edge of the park, long-haul semi-trucks had pulled in, lined up, and boxed in the rally. Ahead of us, a smoking burn pit, some crazies with a pair of flamethrowers, more guns, more militia, and the band shell nearly within spinning distance. Getting out might be harder than just pushing forward, Beckett said, sounding unsure. I didn't disagree, especially now that the semi-trucks said boxed in the park. The surprising part, however, was that Beckett actually considered cutting his losses. Maybe the kid wasn't as dumb as he looked. Chapter 22 Because race is real, and race matters. I'm not the one denying it, and neither are you. We are standing up and saying, of course black lives matter, but so do white lives, and all the other lives. And who among us can say that one life is more valuable than another? Well, I am proud of my heritage. I am proud of my culture. And I am attracted to our European standards of beauty. It is a simple fact that this instinctual attraction, this ethnic pride, means I value my racial brothers and sisters more than those who are not members of my race. And every other culture feels the same way, because racial identity matters. A twat wearing those idiotic suspenders and, I shit you not, a goddamn top hat was stomping across the band shell stage and I couldn't help but wonder if this was the mysterious Peter character. The alt-right anthems blaring from the speakers had been replaced with a soaring, patriotic instrumental that lent a sense of gravitas to the top-hatted twat's ranting. It was absurd, disingenuous, and blatantly offensive. And the crowd was eating it right up just the same. The tsunami of raw emotions was held back by an ebbing alcoholic dam that had sprung enough leaks to confirm the simmering rage of the gathered masses. They were standing ready, waiting for permission to explode. I'm talking about righteousness, godliness, and honoring the culture and heritage of Western civilization. What I'm talking about is no different from black culture, Asian culture, or Jewish culture. But because of the color of my skin, because I am white, this makes me some kind of unconscionable racist? Well, fuck that, and fuck the real racist pushing this agenda to oppress, subjugate, and eradicate the white man. Oh, they call it diversity and immigration. But who is writing those immigration policies? Who is actually controlling our borders? We see them prancing all over Washington, pushing this ugly and insipid white replacement conspiracy. The Jews will not stop until the white man has no power in our own homeland. They will not stop until we are reduced to useless fucking cucks. Pockets of the fired up crowd began chanting, Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! The twat in the top hat continued, and although we did not come here to commit acts of violence, we will not hesitate to defend our homeland. Because make no mistake, we are under invasion, and our very way of life is threatened by a rising tide of color brought on by those Washington and Hollywood Jews. But we will stand resolute, we will stand firm, and if the situation demands it, we will stand in violent defense, guided by those 14 words. As the asshole on the stage began reciting, the assholes in the crowd joined in. They were words printed across banners and signs throughout the rally. In some places, they were reduced to simply the number 14 blazoned across poster boards. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. The crowd erupted in cheers and whoops. Guns were fired into the sky, and a pair of loud whooshes yanked my attention to the two idiots by the burn pit with the flamethrowers. They let off another set of blasts, and orange flames exploded skywards. Guns were dumb, but I'd be lying if those flamethrowers didn't inspire a moral exception, given the current circumstances. If I could get my hands on one, it's fair to say that righteous justice would never smell so crispy. I was doing my best to give the burn pit a wide berth but it was unavoidable on our path to the base camp behind the band shell. We were close enough to feel the heat of the flames and smell the acrid odor of chemical-laden fabrics, plastics, and papers as they burned in the pit. 
As we navigated the crowd, I saw that they were burning Black Lives Matters flags in bulk. Flames consumed signs and banners bearing the flag of Israel and the Star of David. Anti-protester posters bubbled and curled in the heat. The ones that hadn't been charred unrecognizable proclaimed, Fuck fascism! Nazis go home! No gods, no master race, no KKK, no fascist USA. And then there were the books the racist cunts tossed into the flames, one right after the other. When a book didn't immediately catch fire, one of the assholes pointed a flamethrower and immediately roasted the shit out of it. There were Korans, Torahs, and any other blatantly non-Christian texts. Contemporary books were flung into the flames at a rate that would have made Josephine weep. Slaughterhouse Five, George, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, 1984, Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird, and all the other Nazi-related writing that didn't bend over backward to glorify Mein Fuhrer. If Josephine were here, she'd slap the flamethrowers right out of their hands and then give the assholes a lecture on censorship. Of course, if Josephine were here, she'd also be strung up in a noose and probably set on fire with one of those same flamethrowers at the rate these fuckers were going. Still, as book pages curled and disintegrated into ash and glowing embers floating in the heat, her past exhortations about book banning rattled in my head. If nothing else, the burn pit was a helpful distraction against my progressively leaky emotional dam as we pushed deeper into the rally. Josephine would have explained that the burn pit was a perfectly respectable, albeit extreme, form of political speech. Even though it inspired strong emotions, there was nothing inherently wrong about the burning and destruction of flags and protest signs, no matter what they represented, because it was just another form of expression. But once books were added to those flames, an unconscionable line was crossed. Books carried ideas, and the act of reading was a form of communication that spanned the spectrum from mild to extreme. To burn those books, destroying ideas because they don't align with your personal thoughts, beliefs, and ideology, wasn't simply an act of political speech. It was an outright censorship, fueled by narrow-minded acts of oppression. Josephine liked to defend the concept of free speech. But, looking around at these Nazi fuckheads, I couldn't help but think that every rule deserved an exception. Over there, Beckett said, gesturing to the line of trees that bordered the banjil. Behind that RV with Trump riding a tank painted across the side? Pretty fucking hard to miss. I, I think we can slip into the backstage area there, he said. There was a hole in the tree line just beyond the RV. I glanced back at the band shell and saw that the guns, body armor, and militia were clustered in a higher number the closer you got to the stage. Back in the direction of the RV, things looked somewhat less hazardous. I nodded at Beckett. Let's give it a go. As the top-hatted twat ranted his bullshit racist rhetoric, we scooted around the RV and found the unobserved hole among the line of trees. The brush beyond was thin, and once we got past the trees and crouched behind the bushes, the backstage area was easy to assess. There were three tow-behind trailers, a little larger than the one I called home back at the RV park. The one closest to the stage was hitched to a pickup truck. Across from the trailers were canopies with chairs and tables. One particular canopy had a bunch of people hunched over computers and phones. That's the Suns' social team, Beckett said, following my gaze. You should see their online operation. They probably give the Russians a run for their money. He hesitated and then rolled his eyes. You know, if they weren't all fighting for the same side. I grunted indifferently. Nerds on phones didn't bother me, as much as the total lack of pretense the thugs backstage were strutting around with. Assault rifles were plentiful, body armor and flak jackets standard. Darkness had fallen, and the whole area was lit up with bright floodlights. My emotional dam was almost gone, and with the cacophony of the rally raging at my back, I felt a distinct tension radiating from the base camp. A measured excitement. Anticipation. Hunger. Find Peter or find the girl.
I said, repeating Beckett's earlier marching orders. I nodded at the three trailers. Assuming the asshole in the top hat wasn't the man of the hour, any idea which one he's most likely in? Beckett let out a sigh of frustration. No. No, that guy was definitely not Peter. Which makes this the shittiest game of three-card Monty. I raised an eyebrow at the kid. Definitely not as dumb as he looked. These trailers have ladders on the back, I said. Usually there's an exhaust fan or a skylight to peek through. Dude. Beckett frowned and waved his hand at me. What? I mean, uh, come on, he replied. You're huge. You can't possibly sneak across the roofs of three trailers without someone noticing. Shut up, I hissed. I'm sorry, but... I clapped my hand over Beckett's mouth and pointed his head toward the stage. Three men were coming around the rear corner of the band shell. One was a gussied-up alt-right militia member with an assault rifle at the ready. The other was Officer Samson in a shotgun. Walking between the escorts was Councilman White, still in that blue suit. They were heading for the trailers. For what it's worth, I whispered. The trick to three-card Monty is knowing how to cheat the cheater. Samson climbed the steps of the trailer hitched to the truck. Councilman White followed immediately after, closing the door behind him. The last thug was left to stand guard outside. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Lion's Den. Chapter 23 Under cover of the fading light, I slipped out from the tree line and around the back of the trailer, pulling myself up the mounted ladder as smoothly as possible. I may be big, but I can be light on my feet, and with the pole ramping back up to its full force, I had something of an advanced warning system in case my movements caught someone's attention. I stayed as flat as possible after climbing onto the roof of the trailer, both to reduce my visibility and to spread my weight out to risk the least amount of disturbance. I inched forward on my belly, moving carefully toward the first plastic skylight, and minding the multiple psychic connections tightening at my chest. An invisible tensile pressure increased, and the vibrations the wires produced were getting stronger. Beckett had tried to argue with me, saying he was smaller and lighter. He waved his fancy phone in my face and said he could record whatever he saw through the skylight and report back. Then we could figure out the next move together. And for about a half second, I actually considered it. But what if any one of about a dozen things went wrong? There were too many guns to count, and that was before I could assess what was inside the trailer. The kid hired me to get him to the girl safely. He might have been better suited for recon, but there was too much risk. If, when, something went wrong, I needed to be able to deal with it without having to worry about the kid. I paused as I reached the skylight and let my cheek rest flat against the roof almost dazed by the surprising realization. What the actual fuck? I was worried about Beckett Miller? One-time Nazi fanboy desperately misguided youth? And the idiot who was too girl-crazy to see this shit show was a waste of time? No. That didn't make sense. And I didn't care what Murph thought. I'm not that good of a guy, and Gertie would be the first to agree. Maybe I was just worried about my contract with the kid. A deal he optimistically prepaid and overpaid for. I was worried about fulfilling my end of the contract. Yeah, that was probably it. Abraham Owens, the king of superior work ethic. Beckett fucking Miller. I sighed and inched forward, peering over the dome of the skylight before immediately yanking my head back. It was a clear, bright, and unobstructed view down into the main space inside the trailer. In my quick glimpse, I spotted people at the dinette, others on stools, and movements in the peripheral shadows. It was too clear of a view, and anyone would have to only look up to see my ugly mug staring down at them. I stopped a growl of frustration somewhere low in my throat, and glanced further down the roof. The next outcropping was a vent over the bathroom. I carefully shimmied over to the slatted covering, peeked in, and was immediately assaulted with the odor of a very recent BM. A fan was spinning in the vent, blowing the smell directly into my face. Through the slats, I saw a man press the flusher with his foot, 
wash his hands, and then exit the bathroom. He flicked a switch on the wall as he went, and the fan inside the vent stopped. With the bathroom door open, I could clearly hear the voices from inside the trailer. That was something, but I still needed to get my eyes on Beckett's girl to be sure. Unfortunately, through the vent slats and the fan blades, I could only see a few feet beyond the open door. I twisted my angle carefully and... Bingo, motherfucker. At the new angle, I had a clear view of the bathroom mirror. In the mirror, I could see the rest of the trailer through the bathroom door. Councilman White was mindlessly picking at items on the kitchenette counter while he spoke to someone I couldn't see. He gave the impression of someone trying to play his cards close to his chest. Allowing to Nat to continue to play out unchecked is irresponsible at best, White was saying, and an act of terrorism at its worst. How much longer are you going to play this game, Peter? How many more lives are you planning on ending? A pair of girls crossed White's path, and I'm pretty sure one of them looked like Beckett's girlfriend, Corey. They sat down just out of view of the mirror next to Peter, if my glimpse through the skylight had been accurate. One of the girls said, He just doesn't understand your vision, Peter. There was a sad, drawn-out sigh, almost theatrical. And then another voice spoke. It carried a strangely familiar tone, and my chest tightened in an instinctual response. A dull ache began knocking behind my eyes. I knew enough to tell that my physical reaction wasn't due to any emotional pull from inside the trailer. I could read those piano wires just fine. This was some kind of base lizard brain response to the sound of Peter's voice. I didn't like it one bit. I admit, Councilman, this little tete-a-tete you and I have found ourselves engaged in. The pause this time was definitely theatrical. White looked up from the counter and over in Peter's direction. It's been amusing, a happy little distraction, if you will. And to that end, I can certainly appreciate why you would assume this has all been a silly little game. In fact, I'd be lying if I said I didn't, at times, feel like I was playing a game as well. There are certain pieces being placed across the board. This is not some kind of chess game, White spat, his voice low and angry. No, not for you. Checkers, maybe, but big picture. Another dramatic sigh, as if the simple act of being in the presence of White was an unconscionable burden that lowered his IQ. White wasn't having it. You want to talk big picture? His posture shifted aggressively. Big picture is that with a stroke of my pen, I issue an order to the SCPD, labeling the Suns as a domestic terrorist organization and having you and every single one of your acolytes rounded up and tossed in jail. That's the big picture. I am not playing your games anymore, Peter. You are operating under the delusion that you ever were, Councilman, Peter said, his voice smooth and calm. Samson? White tried to hide a look of confusion when Peter addressed the cop by name. Officer Stu Sampson stepped into view of the mirror, moving next to White. His shotgun was slung across his back, and he hitched his good thumb in his belt. Sampson nodded at Peter. Go ahead and tell the councilman what happens when he strokes his pen, Peter said. Sampson glanced sideways at White. The councilman, for whatever it was worth, had stamped down his confusion and looked entirely too confident in Samson's response. A wire vibrated in my chest, and I could taste Samson's duplicity before he said a single word. What happens? Samson said slowly, turning back to Peter and dropping his head in a single nod. Is whatever you say happens, sir. Another vibration, this one from White. A jolt of fury that matched his expression. So much for playing his cards close to his chest. Our deal predated. You have been very well compensated. White could barely get the words out. Samson lifted a shoulder. 
You did a lot to get the movement started, boss, but it's like the girl said, you just don't have Peter's vision, Samson said. Vision? He's like a child running around after finding his father's gun. White turned to the still-obscured Peter. You do not know the first thing about the power you wield over the sons. All of this... White waved his hands around him, gesturing to the rally at large. This is not a movement. This is not progress. This does not advance the cause that real men, genuine devotees, have spent their entire lives committed to. This is little more than infantile children play-acting on a stage far larger than they would ever hope to aspire to. Silence filled the trailer as a jarring amount of dissonant vibrations twisted the wires in my chest. The girl shifted as Peter rose to his feet. I could see a sliver of his clothing, but his face never came into view of the mirror. I understand, Councilman. Fuck you. You still think we're playing that clever little game. Peter rested a hand on Samson's shoulder. I saw the sleeve of a dark green coat or jacket. You thought the power you wielded over the police force was unimpeachable, and that loyalty mattered? Peter was addressing Samson now. Tell me, officer, have there been times when you weren't fully loyal to me? Be honest. Samson's eyes shifted uncomfortably. I mean, you knew the deal from the start. I respect your vision, sir, but I got alimony and loans and... What he's trying to say, councilman, Peter cut in, patting Samson on the shoulder before pulling his arm back, is that his loyalty lies with money. Not me. Not you. And certainly not any cause. And that's fine. I don't begrudge him his motives. They just don't matter. Samson was helpful, even when he was betraying my confidence to you. A subtle twinge of confusion traveled up Samson's wire. It took him far too long to process Peter's use of the past tense. Wait, Peter. He did his job, Peter continued, speaking directly to White. He was a very useful idiot. Whipped! The shot was swift and effectively muzzled by a silencer. Blood and brain matter splattered across White's face as Officer Stu Sampson fell to his knees. His piano wire sang out, not with pain, but abject confusion before snapping away, forever silent. The dirty cop collapsed forward, dead. Everyone down in the trailer was frozen in shock. All but Peter. He stepped forward, his back to the mirror, and placed the gun on the counter. Clearly, he had no further use for it. White's jaw moved, but the words were slow to come. You fucking psychotic. Spare me, Peter said, his voice flat and indifferent. I told you this isn't a game. This is just the warm-up. Peter started for the door of the trailer, and I twisted hoping to catch a glance of his face. There was something inside me that needed to see who this person was. Where the hell do you think you're going? White shouted. Peter pushed the door open. You bore me, Councilman, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I have an entire army of useful idiots to entertain me. Peter! The door slammed shut, and Peter was gone. Chapter 24 by the time I got back to Beckett at the tree line, I could confirm that Councilman White had exited the trailer and was escorted away by the armed militia member posted at the door. The only people left inside would have been Corey, the other girl, the person taking a shit, and whoever else might have been lurking in the shadows. I was pretty sure the gun with the silencer was still on the counter, but there was no way I could assess what other weapons were in the trailer. I eased down to the ground next to Beckett, resting my back against the tree. It was a quiet moment, and the adrenaline was waning. My muscles quickly reminded me of the abuse they had already been through today. More ranting was coming from the speaker arrays surrounding the stage, but this time I recognized the voice. Malachi had apparently pulled his shit together after his midday terrorist attack, 
and was now preaching the glorious benefits of total sexual abstinence to the amassed incels and fuckwads. A man should never spill his seed unless it is for the explicit intent of procreation. By conserving his sexual energy, he could become a finely tuned weapon in a righteous battle to defend the homeland blessed by God and Jesus and fucking Peter himself. Same shit, different asshole. I, I, I saw Peter leave the trailer and head for the stage, Beckett said after I sat down. W was she in there? D -d -d Did you see Corey in the trailer? I nodded. She's in there. So is the body of a cop Peter killed right in front of her. What? Beckett's twitchy eyes had gone fully round in shock. The gravity of this bullshit was getting more and more real for him. This couldn't possibly get more fucked up. I unbuttoned my coat pocket and pulled out the wad of cash, wrapped in the brown paper bag. Look, kid, I said slowly, my voice low and crunchy. Your girl in there, she knows exactly what she's mixed up in. Peter put a bullet in the cop's head, and she enjoyed it. Y you don't know that. I do, I said, meeting his eyes so he'd know I was dead serious. You wanted a chance to talk to her and help her get out of this mess, and I'm telling you, kid, she doesn't want out. I stuck my hand out, offering the wad of cash back to Beckett. I hated to see it go, but it made no sense to keep going. Against tremendous odds, Beckett Miller already saved himself. He should have a chance to rebuild his life. If he went into that trailer, he might not get that chance. Take the money, kid, I said softly. Let's just get the fuck out of here. His face twisted, and the pulses came down the wire in rapid fire. I gritted my teeth against the pole and watched as Beckett looked at the trailer. It wasn't that he didn't believe me, or even that he didn't want to believe me. On the one hand, beating a quick retreat and putting this whole fuck show behind him once and for all. On the other hand, come on, kid. He turned back to me, eyes big, brows knitted, and I felt his remorse before he opened his mouth. M -m Mr. Owens, we've... We've come this far. Oh, for fuck's sake. And, and, and she's right there. He finished. She won't hear you, I said. He shrugged and couldn't have possibly looked more fucking helpless. I, I gotta try. I pulled her into this mess. If, if I can't at least try and get her out. It was virtue I had felt from him. Yeah, it was fueled by guilt and misguided by youth, but it was virtue just the same. And thanks to that fucking infernal pull, I could feel it blooming inside myself. Even if it was hopeless, it was the right thing to do. And if there was a chance, even if it was as remote as a billionaire paying his fair share of taxes, Beckett needed to finish this. For the girl, sure. But I knew in the long run, it was more for himself. The girl might be lost, but he needed to know he did everything he could to reach her. He wouldn't be able to live with himself if he didn't at least try. Gertie reminded me of that every goddamn day. I returned the money to my pocket and looked over at the trailer. Malachi's ranting from the stage felt like a warm-up to the main event. If Peter was about to take the stage, the girls would probably exit the trailer to watch their dear leader speak. At the moment, the path back to the trailer was clear. Well, if we're fucking doing this, I stood up and felt the profound ache of the day throughout my muscles and straight down to my bones. The rising tide of rage pressed against my back, a constant and building pressure. I reached a hand down to Beckett. His mouth formed a thin line. He was young, he was dumb, but he knew what he was getting into. He understood the risk, because he understood what it would mean to move past this moment, having not taken the risk. Beckett grabbed my hand and pulled himself to his feet. Let's do it. We crossed the distance to the trailer as quickly and nonchalantly as possible. Almost everyone was already focused on Malachi or getting ready for Peter, and we made it to the door without incident. 
With my hand on the door handle, I whispered instructions to Beckett. Come in right behind me and lock the door. Don't move from the door. Let me secure the inside, and then you'll have your shot with your girl. Beckett nodded, and with no more time to waste, I pulled the door open. I took one big step into the trailer and sensed Beckett moving behind me as instructed. I did my best to ignore the pull and acted as instinctively as my lizard brain would allow. One suspended member of the Suns, the bathroom shitter, was leaning against the wall and picking at his fingernails with a knife blade. Yep, that same style of carbon black knife used by the thugs at the library, as well as the one Samson tried to plant on me at the hospital. And speaking of Samson, Three girls, not two, were wrapping the dead cop's body in plastic and cleaning up the blood. It almost seemed too easy. I almost, almost felt bad for these poor saps. I held up a cautionary palm. Everybody stay cool. The bathroom shitter panicked and launched himself at me, sidestepping the girls and the dead cop. Unfortunately, the girls panicked too and scrambled in every direction away from me. As the shitter tried to sidestep, one of the girls slipped in Samson's blood, her legs splaying wide. The shitter tripped and tumbled forward, sweeping his hands under him to break the fall. The girls gathered at the opposite end of the trailer, and the bathroom shitter rolled awkwardly on his side. The trailer fell painfully quiet. Another piano wire weakened, and the light faded from the bathroom shitter's eyes. The knife handle was stuck in his chest. Considering my friend at the morgue had been flayed by a similar knife, it was hard not to see this as a macabre take on karmic justice. The whole thing took about three seconds. I lowered my hand and stepped aside for Beckett. The floor's yours, kid. Beckett was transfixed on the cunt who fell on his own knife. That and Samson half-covered in plastic sheeting and sitting in a pool of his own blood. Wads of bloody paper towels surrounded him. It took me a moment to realize that after all the shit I had personally been through today, this was the kid's first close-up look at the horrors perpetrated, albeit self-inflicted, by the sons of the golden future. Beckett's mouth fell open silently as I placed a hand on his shoulder. I said softly, there's a lot to process here, but you're going to have to do it later. Right now, you need to speak your piece, kid. Oh, he, he's a, uh, holy fuck, he's, he, he's dead, m m Mr. Owens. Beckett stuttered, not taking his eyes off the body. I squeezed his shoulder. I need you to look at your girl, Beckett. Straight ahead. This is why we're here. I need you to look up, Beckett. Slowly. So fucking painfully slowly, the kid's head craned up, his gaze shifting like fucking molasses from the dead bodies on the ground to the girls at the other end of the trailer. When his eyes focused and his mouth closed, I pulled my hand back and stepped to the side. Oh, oh Jesus Christ, Corey, Beckett said in a gasping breath. She stepped forward from the other two girls. They all wore the same white blouse and black skirt, but Corey carried herself with a confidence that was missing from the others. She stood straight, shoulders squared, while the others were hunched forward. The pull told me she was satisfied. At first, I wasn't sure if that was my own emotion, a reaction to how quickly the bathroom shitter fucked himself over, but no. It was a clear, strong vibration pulsing directly from... Beckett's girl. Oh, Corey, we, we have to get out of here, Beckett pleaded over the two dead bodies. And I know, I know these people are fucking scary, and it feels like you don't have any options, but you have to, you, you just, you just have to, and, 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 and Mr. Owens is here, so we can... Oh, shut the fuck up, Beckett, Corey said. And he did. It was the tone of her voice, the directness. Beckett blinked rapidly behind his glasses, trying to process what apparently was the last thing he expected to hear from her. C -c -c Cor, you don't have to be here. You don't have to do this with these people. We, we can walk out of here right now and just put all of this shit behind us. Corey held up a hand. Oh, fuck off. Do I look like a fucking damsel in distress to you? Corey, fuck, don't you ever just shut the fuck up? She snapped 
throwing her hands in the air in exasperation. You are such a fucking pussy, Beckett Miller. I never loved you. I never even fucking liked you. Don't you get that? You and I, we were never real. And to be perfectly honest, I'd rather run a knife through my own chest than even think about being romantically involved with such a shitty little nothing. Because that's what you are, Beckett fucking Miller. An insignificant little blip. Just another one of Peter's useful idiots. So, why don't you just shut the fuck up and go jerk off in the corner or something, okay? Super Empathy has never been a bigger fucking bitch. And Beckett couldn't have been crushed any smaller. His pain, humiliation, embarrassment, confusion, it all screamed so loudly through the pole that it almost made me lose track of something Corey said. My jaw clenched and I turned my gaze from Beckett to the girl. Her mouth split open in a very, very satisfied grin. Oh, is it all finally coming together, M -m -m Mr. Owens? She said that last part in a tone that mocked Beckett's twitchy stutter. She had the looks, barely, but her personality was dog shit. No idea what the kid ever saw in her. Just another one of Peter's useful idiots, I said, repeating her words. Seems like he's got a lot of those around. She lifted her shoulders, mocking, sassy. They're dumb, but they are useful. Beckett shook his head, clearly trying to shake reality loose from whatever sticky web of shit we were currently caught in. What, what are you? I, 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 I don't... Well, why? Why would you say... Corey laughed something vile and glanced at the other girls. He is so confused. Didn't, didn't I tell you he was clueless? All right. Enough was enough. You either start explaining this shit or we're getting the hell out of here. I stopped suddenly, realizing the trailer was moving. Corey turned that stupid grin back to me. <laughs> you were saying, Mr. Owens? Oh, fuck. I went to the door flipped the lock, and pushed. Fiberglass panels bent around the frame, but the door didn't budge. It must have been braced from the other side. The trailer canted suddenly as it started moving at an upward angle. Corey took a step forward, reaching out to the cabinets to steady herself. Peter knew, Mr. Owens, she said. He always knew. She wiggled her fingers in the air, conveying a kind of bullshit mysticism about the whole psychic empathy thing. And even though I wanted to, seriously, I cannot tell you how much I begged him. I wanted so much to be the one who went to you directly. But Peter knew. He knew. You know. That's why we needed Beckett. That's why the little fuck needed to believe. As she talked, she stepped over the bodies. She passed Beckett without glancing at him, her eyes fixed on me the whole time. The trailer leveled off again and slowed to a stop. We needed a useful fucking idiot, she said. A dumb little cunt you'd never see coming and who you would never be able to read the truth from. So I let him think I was innocent. I let him think he was introducing me to the sons. I let him fall head over heels in love, and let me tell you, she cast a poisonous look at Beckett. It was so fucking easy. We were face to face now, and the truth stank worse than a fresh turd on a hot day. Through gritted teeth, I spoke in a low growl. You needed him to bring me to Peter. Because after everything that had happened today, the robbery at Murph's, Samson trying to frame me for murder, the attempt on Josephine's life. I was left struggling to see the connection between Peter's plotting to draw me out to the rally and Beckett Miller showing up on my doorstep. I had brushed it off as a coincidence, but it had been anything but, because everything had always been about me. And it had always been about Peter. Corey winked and tapped her nose.
the trailer had finally come to a stop. The door was pulled open from the outside, and everything went straight to fucking hell. Chapter 25 The sound of Malachi ranting on stage had been dull and distant behind the thin walls of the trailer. Also distant was the growing gravitational force of the pull as the very last of my alcoholic brain sludge sobered up. When the trailer started moving, Beckett's emotional state was something akin to a tornado in a trailer park. I did my best to focus on Corey and the moving trailer, but ignoring Beckett was like trying to ignore a volcano erupting a dozen yards behind your back. By the time the trailer stopped and the door swung open, Malachi's voice had become clear. The simmering cacophony of rage from the rally had risen to a boil. Thousands of invisible piano wires pricked at me until my skin had gone numb from the psychic touch. The fog of emotional overload had crept into my brain without me even noticing it. And when the door swung open, spilling bright, artificial stage lights into the trailer, my vision swam in twisting waves. The light washed inside, carrying with it the unchecked hatred of hundreds of white supremacists. It is time, brother, Malachi said from somewhere beyond the trailer, his voice amplified by those blaring speakers. I looked from Corey to Beckett. He looked like he was about to shit his pants. Again. Stay in here, kid, I said, grabbing at the counter to steady myself against the spinning room. M M Mr. Owens. Ah, fuck it, Corey snapped. She pushed past me, grabbed my wrist, and pulled me to the door. Like a dog on a leash, and feeling just about as useless the harder I struggled against the emotional pressure. Fuck, I needed way more alcohol. I was led through the trailer door and down the steps. My vision swirled and blurred from the movement as a baby migraine began thumping against the inside of my skull. I caught a glimpse of Corey gritting proudly, turning in a dramatic circle and curtsying for the crowd. Malachi had been patched up and redressed since Valdez hit him with my truck at the library. He somehow looked larger than life, a Bible in his hands and a solemn expression masking the evil I felt pulsing from him in cataclysmic waves. The ground shifted under my feet, or maybe the pole was turning my world upside down, and I stumbled dropping to a knee and bracing a fist against the stage. The stage. Under the band shell. I craned my neck to look over my shoulder at the trailer. It had been the one trailer hitched to a truck. A vehicle ramp had been assembled behind the stage. That was the incline I felt when the trailer started moving. The higher functions in my brain were grinding to a painful halt, as the external pressure of emotions and the internal pressure in my head reached excruciating levels. My Play-Doh brains were quickly becoming dried out and crumbly, but one inescapable truth remained clear. They set me up, right from the very start, before Beckett even showed up at my door. Getting me right here on this stage had always been the plan. And I really needed a fucking drink. Little brother! Malachi said, his voice singular and small in front of me, while simultaneously booming all around me. I told you, I warned you, Jesus needs to hear you repent. Your soul needs it. Your wife demands it. Eternal damnation awaits if you refuse. Malachi pivoted to address the crowd of Nazi fucks. Through the bright stage lights and my swimming vision, I could see that, in the dark of the night, tiki torches, that fresh fucked up symbol of alt-right hate, had been lit, and blazing points of light now dotted the park. If these were the angry villagers, surely I was meant to be the monster. A new chant was gathering steam. Fuck him up! Fuck him up! Fuck him up! Malachi spoke loudly to the rally, 
There are those here who think that, for Abraham Owens, the unbreakable strong arm of St. Charles City, there are those of you who believe his die is cast and his fate sealed. And you are right! My own brother! I called him Little Baby Amy when we were kids. He has lived a life of unrepentant sin, and try as I might to show him the path to lead him to the water. Malachi squatted beside me and placed a firm hand on the back of my neck. Like the stubborn mule he really is, he refuses to drink. He turned to me, and I could feel his breath on my face. At least it was something to focus on. If only I could fucking focus. Jesus forgives, little brother, Malachi whispered, speakers blaring. But first you must repent. Damnation is not inevitable. No matter the sin, no matter the transgression, Jesus will forgive. But he needs you to beg for it. Malachi rose to his feet and spoke loudly again, driving a railroad spike of pain through my head. Show these people the power of salvation! Beg for redemption! Repent your sins! Save yourself from damnation so that we might join hands and embrace a golden future side by side as brothers in Christ, as brothers in blood, as brothers in purpose. Malachi pivoted on the stage and stretched his hand out to me. Brother Abraham, his voice boomed. Do you beg for redemption in the eyes of your Lord and Savior, in the eyes of your wife, and in the presence of the sons of our homeland? My hand slipped from my knee and hit the ground. My jaw clenched, muscles straining and spasming. I couldn't see straight, I couldn't think straight, and I desperately needed to get the fuck off this fucking stage. But what about Beckett? What about, fuck, 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 what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about? The anger, the rage, it was all I could feel. Josephine silently berated me. Never succumb to the anger, never lose yourself to the rage. If you do, you'll never be better than they are. Well, maybe I'm not any better than these fuckwits. Of course you are. Then why couldn't I repent? I fucked up. I left her to die. Why couldn't I just fucking admit it? Why couldn't I beg for Gertie's forgiveness? Josephine's silent voice had an answer for that one, too. That guilt you're clutching so tightly. That guilt that's been chewing away at your insides for all these years. Gertie's dead and gone, Abe. And there isn't a whole lot of anything she's capable of forgiving. So maybe you don't want forgiveness so much as you want to keep holding on to that guilt. Clutching it tightly because that's the last damn thing you have left. That guilt isn't because of Gertie. It is Gertie. And giving up that last bit of her would just about kill you now, wouldn't it? Little baby Aby, Malachi said to me yanking whatever consciousness I had away from Josephine's voice. What do you say? Will you step into the light with me? I looked up from the stage floor, blurred vision focused long enough to see him literally standing in the circle of a spotlight, hand stretched out to me, welcoming, encouraging, brotherly. And yet, like a goddamn forest fire, the anger blazed. Jesus saves the sinners, especially the white ones, because Jesus was white, never you mind. The whites are the chosen people. The whites have been blessed by God, and God wants you to save up your jizz, listen to his lies, and be a good, useful idiot. Brother Abraham, Malachi said softly, your time is running out. This is an exploding offer. Only I can save you. Call now, repent, and get rich quick while you're at it. 
With an impossible effort, straining every muscle beyond its max, I pushed myself to my feet. Legs wobbled, and my heart thumped furiously. I locked eyes with Malachi and gave voice to the only words I could manage to push out of my mouth. Fuck. Off. The corner of his mouth lifted. He turned to the crowd and spread his arms wide. The die is cast. Without so much as a glance back at me, Malachi took a running leap off the stage and disappeared into the rally. The crowd waved their tiki torches, whooping and hollering and yelling at me, although I couldn't for the life of me make out a single word. It was a full-on assault to my senses, including that fucked-up, psychic, sixth sense. I staggered back a half-step, a dull buzz filling my ears, and I wondered what could possibly happen next. Hello, Abraham. The voice was soft and subdued, even over the speaker arrays. My head spun around, searching for the source of the new voice. In a blurred daze, I saw Corey on the steps of the trailer, head lolling back and laughing. I saw Beckett's wide eyes peeking through a trailer window. I saw Councilman White standing off in a wing, frowning something sour and surrounded by armed militants. And there, in the opposite wing, on the other side of the stage, a figure stepped out of the shadows. The buzzing in my ears drowned out the noise of the world around me, but her words were clear as day. Hello, Abraham. The earth went sideways, and I stumbled again. It wasn't possible, but her face was right there. I recognized the shape, the curves. It was getting closer to me with every deliberate step she took. And no matter how much I blinked to focus my vision, there was no mistaking it. My mouth felt like sandpaper. When I finally spoke, my voice sounded foreign to my own ears, like it was clawing its way out of a gravel pit. G Gertie! Chapter 26 It wasn't fucking possible. I had her death certificate, and although I hadn't been able to physically see her body because of my worsening condition, her family had seen it. They buried it. I had been to the grave. The idea of some conspiracy involving faking her own death. It was absurd. And yet, that was Gertie looking back at me under the bandshell in Lake Stevenson Park. And when she smiled, every nagging doubt and skeptical thought evaporated. It didn't matter how absurd the concept was. That was Gertie. I wanted to believe. I had to believe. When she spoke, reality twisted again. Her voice sounded strange. I heard my wife, the tone of her voice, that unmistakable lilt and tenor, but something was off. At first, I was sure my ears were playing tricks on me, somehow filtering and translating the sound into what I expected to hear, but then... The lower octave couldn't be ignored. I squinted, focused, and tried to listen. Something familiar? She asked. She waved a hand across her face, and I followed the motion with a hawkish gaze. The hand was all wrong. Bigger than Gertie's. I was distantly aware of the dark green sleeve the hand was sticking out of. I knew it was an important detail, but I couldn't process why. I rubbed my hand across my mouth. Why was it getting so hard to breathe? You're not looking so good there, Abraham, Gertie said. She turned to the crowd, who was watching with some kind of... Reverence? It's them, isn't it? Dockside was one thing. Dockside was bad. But this? This is a whole new level in the Abraham Owens emotional shit show, isn't it? 
My head was reeling. Gertie didn't talk like that. Why was Gertie talking like that? And Dockside? What the hell did she mean by Dockside? Honestly, when it was explained that the biggest, baddest, toughest guy in the city was a recluse and refused to be around people because of feelings, Gertie said, slowly circling me, her voice amplified by the microphone she held in her hand. Well, I just couldn't believe that. It didn't seem possible. And don't get me wrong, I have seen some shit in this city. But Abraham Owens, brought to his knees and crippled by feelings? Gertie chuckled at the audience. He sounds like a shitty superhero who gets killed off at the beginning of the comic book. His only purpose to inspire a real hero. I felt myself wavering, and then I stumbled again. None of this made any goddamn sense. And it seemed clear now that somehow, some way, what was left of my barely functioning brain was now simply betraying me. I'm not gonna lie to you, Abraham. Gertie continued. You're here for two reasons. The first is because you have a reputation in this city. Like I said, people think you are the biggest and baddest there is. Gertie chuckled. Although I'm pretty sure your brother might have something to say about that. Malachi, my brother. Again, I felt like there was something critically important right in front of my eyes, but I couldn't see it. You're here because you are Abraham Owens, Gertie said, and I need my boys to see that absolutely nothing will stand against us. Not you, not the police, not even the good people of St. Charles. When the sons of the golden future march through this city, there will be no opposition, no defiance. Gertie stopped and stood in front of me, studying my face. You're here because of that big, bad, tough guy reputation, Abraham. You're here because of that simple maxim. Find the biggest brute in the yard and beat the living shit out of him. But the empathy? Jesus Christ, I can see it all over your face. It's killing you. It's actually killing you, isn't it? Big, bad Abraham Owens with all his muscles, all his strength. And I could lay you out with a single punch right now, couldn't I? Just one person. Just one punch. Somehow it made sense that at the end of it all, it would be Gertie. She spun on her heel, and the hood of her dark green coat flapped in my face. She addressed the crowd. What say you? Their new favorite chant again. Fuck, Fuck him up! up. Fuck, Fuck him up. up! I worked my jaw and struggled to find my voice. <laughs> Gertie, please. Gertie spun again, my broken brain processing everything in a blur. A fist whipped out and connected with the side of my face, sending a cascade of fireworks exploding across my vision. I spun and collapsed to the stage, blood dripping as darkness crept around the edges of my swimming vision. Hello, darkness. Hello, ground. My dear old friends. You don't get to say that name. Not anymore. Gertie hissed, her voice something demonic. You can't! Don't you dare say her name! Everything had gone numb and distant, but the punch and the pain that followed succeeded at pushing back the crippling pull for just an instant, long enough for me to process a single thought. What the actual fuck? I coughed and managed to roll onto my back. Gertie stood over me, fished a hand into her coat pocket, and pulled something out. I said you were here for two reasons, she said, tossing the object down to me. I'd spell out the second one, but I'm sure even a useless meathead like you can finish putting it all together. I pawed at the object on my chest and grasped it in my fingers. My lizard brain knew what it was before I lifted it into view and stared at it stupidly. It was a money clip complete with a wad of cash. My cash, because it was my money clip. 
The one Gertie gave me all those years ago. The one stolen by the asshole who sucker punched me and beat the shit out of me at Dockside. It was why I agreed to take Beckett's job. Someone stole my money, and I needed more. I was desperate for more. Just like he knew I'd be. And he knew I'd see through Corey's deception, which is why they manipulated Beckett in the first place. Corey was the line, Beckett the bait, and I was the thousand-pound marlin to shit for brains to avoid the hook. No, that wasn't Gertie standing over me, and that hadn't been Gertie's face I had seen in the crowd at Dockside. Fuck. Of course not. Gertie was dead. Always had been. The face I had glimpsed at Dockside, and the face staring down at me now, was indeed familiar. It looked similar to Gertie's more than enough to confuse my dried out and crumbling Plato brains, but it wasn't Gertie. It was her brother. I had never met or seen a photo of him. She had only mentioned him in passing early on, but while my brain had failed me, my gut assured me it couldn't be anyone else. This was her brother, Peter. Chapter 27 His rage was a white-hot supernova, exploding with every kick to my gut, to my side, to my back. And with every blow came flashes of that first night at Dockside. Those same boots, that same guilt over Gertie, the same helplessness to fight back. Only this time, as I slipped deeper into that useless, lethargic abyss, I found myself envying Peter. He lost his sister. Maybe they were estranged, which would explain why Gertie never really mentioned him. And he had lost his opportunity to set things right with her. He was consumed with an anger that was first directed at himself, and then at me. And why not? She was dead, and I wasn't. Peter was angry, and I was deserving or not, loosely related or not, a place for him to direct that anger. And he did. Kick after kick, releasing flaming hot plumes of an anger so virulent it was literally unspeakable. Peter did nothing to fight the rage. No, this motherfucker just let it out, and he didn't care who got swept into that gravitational well. Yeah, I envied the shit out of him. Because right then, as I curled into a fetal ball to protect myself against his blows, as my brain slowly shut down from the stress of that Herculean effort to block out the rally of rage the pull so desperately wanted to let in, right then, if I had the faculties to do it, I'd probably kick the shit out of myself, too. Anything to release all of that anger, frustration, and disappointment. And guilt. Fuck. I should have never answered the door that morning. And a lot of good it did, anyhow, letting Beckett fucking Miller talk me into the gig. A lot of good for Beckett. The fucking kid was trapped in a trailer in the middle of an alt-right rage fest that was on the cusp of turning into a murder fest, and still those fucking cops stood back doing nothing. The kid's entire fucking reality had been shredded right in front of his eyes. Even if he pledged total fealty to dear leader Peter, there was no guarantee Beckett would make it out of this rally alive. Which was my one job here. Protect the kid. I may have been a total fucking failure, but at least Beckett wouldn't be going home empty-handed. Everyone loved a good consolation prize, and Beckett could look forward to me keeping him company as we raced toward our inevitable, fatal fates. And maybe we deserved it. For Beckett, the sad truth was that he played with fire, was smart enough to stop playing with fire, and then was dumb enough to go and throw his whole body back into the flames. Sure, he had been manipulated up one side and down the other, but he could have walked away at any time. He could have told the girl to fuck off. He chose to play with fire, and maybe he deserved to get burned. As for me and my just desserts, well, 
I think Invisible Josephine was probably right. My guilt over abandoning Gertie was all I had left, and if I couldn't let it go, maybe I deserve to have it taken from me by any means necessary. And maybe I deserve to lose my last shred of Gertie to the one person who could actually understand my guilt. And maybe, just maybe, when Peter grew tired of kicking me and the last spark of life faded, Maybe there was something, somewhere, after all of this, where I could see her one last time. Some place where I could ask Gertie for forgiveness, properly, honestly. Yeah, maybe. I just needed to let go and wait for the darkness to take me one last time. My body had gone numb to the violent kicks, and a dense fog had filled my head. It felt like Peter was miles away, and I had a vague sense he was yelling in the direction of Councilman White. Is how you own a city, Peter shouted distantly between kicks. Physical kick. Demonstrations kick. To show your people. Who has the real power? Another kick to punctuate, and then a mad growl. And when they look upon the truth with their own eyes, they will know, and yes, they will fucking follow. Enough! This has to stop, Peter! Peter had grown tired of kicking, and my spark was fading as quickly as I had hoped. I could barely breathe. I was sure several ribs were cracked. Probably had a concussion, but who could tell through all the fog? This is not what the Sons of the Golden Future are about! Councilman White bellowed. His voice was close. He must have stepped out from the wing and was trying to address the rally. This is a movement about brotherhood and unity, not hatred and division. These boys are more united than ever, Peter said, almost amused. This movement is about protecting our way of life, White persisted. They would want you to tear each other apart, poison the movement from within, and this man, this psychopath, has recruited people like Malachi Owens to help twist this movement to further his own personal agenda, which is no doubt motivated by their blind, blatant need to steal your identity and your power and your very way of life. The councilman turned to Peter, but spoke loud enough for the crowd to hear. Tell me, Peter, just who is it that you work for? Who is it? Pulling your strings, DHS, FBI, or does it go deeper? Who sent you? Who ordered you to infiltrate the sons and destroy it from the inside? A hush had fallen, and I'd be lying if I said I hadn't pushed myself up with a hand to watch through blurry, bruised eyes. Maybe it was the fog, or maybe it was the pull of belief from the crowd. Or maybe I'm just a shit-for-brains fucktard with more in common with a monkey than a high-functioning human. But the councilman made a hell of a lot of sense. Was it possible that Peter was the good guy all along? Sent by some faceless government agency to blow up the alt-right hate group from the inside? As if he sported his own psychic powers, Peter burst out laughing. He doubled over, and the laughter turned to cackling. Behind the councilman, Corey stepped away from the trailer, her dumb face a mask of amusement. Peter straightened suddenly and wiped the tears from his eyes. <laughs> well played, councilman, but your conspiracies, they hold no power over my people. Laughter started piping throughout the crowd and the councilman frowned. This is not power, White said, his voice low. Although I knew he wasn't talking to the crowd anymore, I wasn't sure if he was still talking to Peter. This is chaos. Peter's entire demeanor shifted, 
as foggy as I was, even the pole sang out something different. It was as if Peter had instantly become another person. Chaos is power. Peter and Corey must have shared an unspoken communication. Behind the councilman, Corey's arm lifted, and the gun with the silencer, the same one Peter used to kill Officer Sampson, nestled into the base of Councilman White's skull. A piano wire screamed with fear before being silenced. Councilman White fell forward, and the crowd erupted. Peter turned to them and spread his arms. This, he shouted, is my city. The crowd cheered. Flamethrowers erupted into the sky. Bursts of gunfire followed suit. Chants were lost in the hollering. This is our our city! This This is is our our city! city! And then the screaming started. I heard the throaty growl of an old truck, its engine whining as tires spun in the distance. I craned my neck to look out over the rally and saw that someone had blown past the long-haul semi-trucks, bordering the park, plowing through vendor tents, smashing through barbecue grills and coolers alike, and aiming straight for the stage. The Nazi fox dove left and right, trying to avoid the path of the out-of-control pickup truck. Like a laser-sighted homing beacon, I felt a distinctive, familiar pull cutting through the dense fog of rage and hate. I was immediately filled with equal amounts of hope and dread. The hope came from Josephine, sitting in the pickup's passenger seat. The hope was hers. It came bundled in a warm, welcoming blanket of faith. Faith in me. Faith. Belief. That even here, in this darkest abyss of humanity, I would find a way to persevere. Josephine believed in me, and the message was pulled down the psychic line into my chest, and I could feel her quiet strength pricking at my fingertips. The dread was mine. What the literal fuck was Josephine thinking, racing into the middle of a Nazi rally? As quickly as I asked the question, the pole vibrated an answer. Hang on, help is on the way. Now get on your feet, you goddamn Jurassic lug nut. Chapter 28 Chaos had erupted in the wake of the truck. Anti-protesters and the do-nothing SCPD poured through the hole punched by the pickup. And, for the first time, I heard the helicopter circling above. Flashbangs went off and smoke billowed, gunfire piercing through the cacophonous, chaotic screams and shouts. The pickup truck, my truck, skidded to a halt in front of the stage as I used Josephine's impossible psychic strength to push myself up and get my feet under me. Through the windshield, I locked eyes with Josephine, and she nodded once at me. The vibrations from her were coming through stronger than ever. Take what you need. Take it all. I did, and what started as a prickling in my fingertips had spread throughout my body. I could feel the fog dissipating, and at the same time, a propane tank exploded in the middle of the park, sending a shockwave of fear and rage at me. I staggered. Peter finally took notice, and decided he wasn't too happy to see me on my feet. Malachi! He shouted, his voice pitching higher at the end of my brother's name. Corey spun, and I took two steps, grabbing the wrist of the hand holding the gun. I squeezed as hard as possible, and the gun went off, sideways. She yelped in agony, and her finger spasmed, dropping the gun to the ground. Malachi! Peter yelled into the crowd again, pleading. I twisted Corey's wrist, yanking the girl close. Through gritted teeth, I issued my only warning. Run! I released her hand. And she did. There was no thought, no debate, no concern for her dear leader, Peter. She just took her fear and ran away. I staggered again. Josephine's strength was helpful, but it wasn't nearly enough to keep my head above the suffocating crush of the emotional pull. Peter noticed my stumble, got a cocky look on his face that I desperately wanted to punch off, 
and then took a very ill-advised step toward me, his own fists balling up. Fuck me. Abraham! Peter and I both twisted simultaneously and saw Valdez, you beautiful fucking crazy girl, leaning out of the driver's side window, arm cocked at a strange angle. Drink! Valdez swung her arm forward, hurling a bottle of whiskey into the air. Time slowed as the bottle spun lazily, arcing slowly across the stage in my direction. The assholes with the flamethrowers shot off uncoordinated blasts. Helicopters thup thup thupped from above, and shotguns fired non-lethal beanbags down at Nazis and anti-protesters alike. Malachi barreled through the crowd, literally throwing people aside and leaping for the stage. Peter turned to the shadows he had emerged from, no doubt hoping to disappear into the chaos he had inspired. As the bottle spun closer, I continued to fill up on Josephine's faith and confidence. I could see the lengths Valdez had gone to provide me a little backup, and I decided that maybe, just maybe, today wasn't the day Abraham Owens was going to die. But if it was, I damn well would take as many Nazis down with me as I could. In a movement so fast it made Valdez shoot me a double take, I snatched the bottle of whiskey out of the air, cracked the cap, opened my throat, and started guzzling. Liquid fire poured down my gullet, splashing into my gut, releasing an intense warmth that crept quickly up my body and pressed into my head. I sent down reinforcements, and then more reinforcements for the first reinforcements. When the bottle was more than halfway gone, Malachi came crashing into me like a freight train. The whiskey bottle flew out of my hands and spun across the stage. We rolled, and Malachi wound up on top of me, hands clenched around my throat, his eyes bugging and looking crazier than ever. This isn't going to end the way you think it is, little brother, Malachi hissed through clenched teeth. I choked for oxygen and pulled at his wrists. The pressure eased, and I was able to squeeze out. You're goddamn right. It's gonna end with my fist in your face. Malachi let out an absurd battle cry and pressed harder into my neck. The whiskey continued to do its job as my brain was robbed of oxygen. And her the eyes of burned, the debilitating pull bright, cleared just as defiance. blindness crept into the edges of my vision. All right, fuck it. I released Malachi's wrists and put every last bit of energy I had into boxing his ears. His grip on my neck immediately loosened and his hands cradled his head. I sucked in big gulps of air, grabbed a fistful of his shirt, and yanked him down into an upward thrust of my fist. Malachi spun off me, and I scrambled to my feet in time to see Valdez gunning the truck's engine. The Nazis were crowding around her, and as much as I would have plowed right through them, Valdez exhibited far more restraint. The crowd in front of the truck suddenly parted, but she didn't have a path to pull free. Instead, one of the assholes with a flamethrower blasted the front of the truck with fire. The fucker rode the trigger, and it didn't take long for what was left of the truck's paint job to start bubbling and crisping under the heat. Valdez! I bellowed. Run! Through a trademark string of expletives, Valdez pushed Josephine out the rear window and onto the bed of the truck. Fucking hell! Why did she bring Josephine? She climbed out behind Josephine while the asshole kept dousing the front of the truck in flames. Valdez and Josephine moved to the back of the bed as the crowd began dispersing around the truck. The two women took a leap from the truck to the edge of the stage, and the front of the truck exploded in flames. A second later, the gas tank caught, and a second explosion sent waves of heat rolling across the stage. For the moment, my two girls were safe and the flaming wreckage of my truck barricaded the front of the stage from the raging Nazi uprising. The sides of the stage, however. I started for Valdez and Josephine, who were helping each other to their feet. God damn it, Valdez, I growled. You can yell at me later, Valdez snapped. Let's just get the fuck out of here. A loud gunshot, way too close, stopped us all in our tracks. I spun and saw Peter holding that infernal gun. He had spun off the silencer. 
Malachi moved alongside Peter, wiping blood from his mouth. Peter fucking laughed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I am not nearly done with you, Abraham Owens. Cause you thought I was done with you, you goddamn fucking malformed, shit-swilling piece of cum-stained cunt discharge. I cracked my knuckles and took a step forward. Abe. A weak voice called out from behind me. Wait, that fucking gunshot. Joe. Oh, fuck. Valdez panicked. Fuck, 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 fuck. No, God damn it, Joe. For the second time, the world around me slowed to an impossible halt. I pivoted to see Josephine collapsing to her knees and Valdez pressing her hands into her chest. Blood seeped from between her fingers. Josephine's eyes met mine, and no amount of whiskey could ever deaden my connection with this woman. God fucking damn it! Valdez kept repeating, lost in a hopeless panic. There was nothing she could do to slow the flow of blood. Josephine gritted her teeth against the pain. And her eyes burned bright with defiance. I wanted to call out to her. I wanted to say something, anything. But what do you say when your closest friend is dying right in front of your eyes? What do you say when she's dying because she was trying to help you? Ranks of alt-right Nazi shits began to surge up the steps of the stage from the wing behind Valdez. Josephine's mouth moved, but I couldn't hear a thing over all the noise. Not that I needed to. I heard her words loud and clear in my head. Fuck his shit up, Abraham Owens. The only piano wire that ever mattered, the only one after Gertie, snapped, and the world spiraled away from me. Josephine was gone, murdered for no other reason than to get my attention. The senselessness of it was a gut-sucking reflection of this entire fucking night and the entire fucking alt-right movement. What was the point? To make me hurt? Because of the color of her skin? Peter himself probably couldn't even answer those questions. Peter. The world kept spinning. I had nothing to hold on to. Why in the fuck did Valdez bring her here? Never mind the fact that I would have already been dead if she hadn't brought Josephine. I would trade my life for Josephine's without hesitation any time, anywhere. Not that I was even given a choice. As I turned in a disorientated circle, a dark, black vibration whispered out to me. It was immediately pushed aside by Josephine's past exhortations. Of all the emotions, you mustn't succumb to hate. It is a virus that will consume you, it will change you, and it will control you. Remember, Abraham, you are and will always be stronger than their hate. The hate was a rally-sized storm that flurried around me. It followed me and called to me and taunted me as soon as I stepped foot into that fucking rally. Even as the fog gave way to the effects of the whiskey, the hate remained a crystal clear vibration as persistent as it was consistent. It wasn't that I didn't feel it. It was that I ignored it. But now, now this bottom barrel shit stain murdered Josephine. And sometimes, yes, you do have to fight fire with fire. I didn't just open myself up to the tsunami of hate. I fucking mainlined it. Chapter 29 Peter's face was begging for a beating. 
I knew the Nazis were surging through the wings. I knew Beckett had finally scrambled out of his hidey hole in the trailer to help Valdez, and now they were both being grabbed by white supremacist militia twats with tiki torches. I knew that law enforcement and an alphabet soup of government agencies were pushing into the chaos of the rally, attempting to shut it down before more lives were lost. I knew Lake Stevenson Park was turning into a nightmare zone, explosions rocking the earth as fire spread, seeking out every combustible material these nationalist fucks brought with them. And there was a lot. Brawls turned to riots. Those with an iota of sense tried to run. Most chose to stay in the fray, taking shotgun beanbags to the chest and chemical sprays to the face. I knew all of this was happening. And I didn't fucking care. None of it mattered. None of these people mattered. I felt nothing but blind hatred raging through my veins, setting every nerve on fire. I stomped across the stage, swatting assholes aside like they were gnats buzzing around the pile of shit that was Peter. He saw me coming, and his confident, manic, amused expression flashed to fear. Pure, unadulterated fear. That's right, motherfucker. I'm coming for you. Peter brought the gun up and started squeezing off shots. I didn't flinch because they didn't bother me. Like the riots, spilling into the streets beyond, I knew it was there, but it didn't matter. The first shot went wide. The second went into the stage floor in front of me, splintering the wood. The third shot went into my shoulder. I was aware of a distant sting, but what did it matter? Josephine was dead. Gertie was long dead, and who even knew about Valdez and Beckett? The only thing that remotely mattered was beating the shit out of Peter, the architect of all this insanity. I kept stomping forward. The fear in his eyes turned to panic. Malachi pushed his dear leader aside and threw his fists up, more than happy to stand in my way. Peter scrambled away behind him. Malachi sneered. I told you this wasn't going to end. Fuck off, asshole. With rage guiding my reflexes, I slapped his fists aside while simultaneously driving my fist into his jaw. The crack of bone was satisfying, although I had no idea if it was Malachi's face or my fist. The result remained the same, and my brother went sprawling. The hit was fast, clean, and caught him by surprise. Somewhere, deep beneath the anger, I knew I had gotten lucky. A dozen feet away, Peter stole a glance over his shoulder and saw me continuing to stomp after him. Malachi! Peter screamed at his fallen lieutenant. More Nazi fucks tried to intercept. I think one of them might have been the top-hatted twat from earlier. I took hits and kicks. When someone struck my shoulder in the gunshot wound, I felt that the most. But otherwise, I flung them all aside like rag dolls, my eyes lasered on Peter. Scampering Peter. Tiny Peter. Pathetic Peter. Ice caps could have melted. The moon could have fallen to the earth. Oxygen could have vanished from the air, and none of it would have mattered. Not as long as I got to Peter. When I looked down, I saw fistfuls of that fucking green coat in my hands. A body squirmed and struggled underneath my vice-like grip. When I looked up, I witnessed that strange transformation I had noticed earlier. But this time I could see it close up. The fear and panic drained from Peter's face. His expression relaxed until it was almost neutral. A distant look crossed his face as if he was looking past my scowling mug. And then the corner of his mouth turned up. And then the fucker laughed. It was a small giggle at first, and he tried to take it back. But it escaped his lips and chittered its way into a full-on chuckle. As it built into something more manic, Peter's eyes remained vacant. He couldn't have been more unsettling if he had tried. You really should think about shutting the fuck up, I growled. <laughs> Hit him already, Peter barked in amusement. You fucking brute, you meathead, you insufferable dim-witted fuck. Is this what you want? 
responding to senseless violence with even more violence. Peter bared his teeth in a manic grin. Then hit him already. Do it for the darkies. Do it because you like it. Whatever the reason, it's like the fucking shoot people say. Just do it. I cocked my arm, fist clenched, and found myself hesitating. Beneath the roiling rage, my brain was whispering to me, What the fuck was this guy talking about? Peter's face melted into abject fear, brows burrowing into each other, and tears streaming down his face. <sighs> oh, fuck no! He is gonna fucking murder me! And I cannot fucking help you if I'm dead, you cocksucking! You're the last person I'd ever ask for help, I growled. Shut the fuck up! Peter yelled at me. I can't, I can't, god fucking damn it! There has to be another way! We have an army! Another lightning quick change in personality, and Peter's tears stopped, his mouth twisting and stretching into a nightmarish grin. We never wanted an army. We wanted chaos. Another flip, and the wailing Peter returned. Please, this is how you get it. Think of the possibilities. Think of all we have left to do. You are so weak. The grinning, manic Peter responded. Weak? Peter snapped back at himself. You're, you're literally nothing. I have given you everything. What would you even be without me? You, you owe me. He screamed the words in my face, but he was talking to someone else. Something else. He didn't flip immediately this time, and the anguished Peter, the real Peter, started laughing something sad. <laughs> They say that, he said, and I got the idea he was finally talking to me. When, when man plans, God laughs. But where is God when chaos plans? Peter descended into a fit of giggles. I didn't get the joke. I yanked him close and shook him violently. I don't know what your problem is but I'm sure it's hard to pronounce. His eyes flashed with fear and panic. Abraham! I punched the motherfucker straight in the face. I felt his nose snap and bone fracture, cartilage driving straight into his skull. His head snapped back, and his body immediately went limp. Blood began trickling from his ruined face. Just one person. Just one punch. The rage was boiling so hot that I had no perception of Peter's piano wire. Maybe he was dead, or maybe he needed a few more hits just to be sure. I pulled my fist back, with every intent to send Peter to whatever maker he believed in, when I was suddenly knocked sideways with all the violent velocity of what felt like a goddamn Mack truck. Chapter 30 This night was... Never going to fucking end. Malachi slammed into me, and we careened off the stage, through the dying flames of the truck fire, and into the ground. As we rolled to a stop on trampled grass, the reality of that absurd observation struck me with only slightly less force than Malachi's full-body tackle. This night, this whole fucking day, just kept fucking going. It was a shitty song that was never going to end, and right when you thought the final notes were coming, BAM! Some coked-up DJ, strung out of his own mind, hits the repeat button. But it wasn't the observation that struck me, as much as the fact that I had the observation. The rage was gone. The pull of the anger had simply been extinguished. The numbness of the whiskey was still floating gently in my brain, but the blinding emotions weren't just a constant muted background noise. They were gone altogether. Lake Stevenson Park hadn't suddenly emptied either. The rally turned riot continued to rage, while police and government agencies made futile attempts to scrape the shit off the proverbial fan. I could think clearly. The pull had been silenced. I might as well have been back in my trailer, sitting in my ratty lawn chair in private isolation from the world. 
or at Murph's liquor store, where the enigmatic man always flipped the door lock, allowing me to shop in peace. My idiot brain's first instinct was that Malachi somehow knocked the pull right out of me. But even I'm not that stupid. As we rolled across the ground, struggling for the upper hand, it took a half second to realize that the muted pull wasn't just similar to that strange effect Murph had on me. It was exactly the same. With Malachi swinging for my fucked up ribs, I didn't have time to question the sudden clarity. It was there, the pull was gone, and I was the most clear-headed I had been all night. Whatever the reason, I was grateful. Wham! Crack! A coughing wheeze exploded from my mouth, spraying blood across Malachi's face. His eyes were popping, and his teeth bared. One fist slammed into my broken ribs, and another smashed into the bullet wound in my shoulder. Without all that rage to overwhelm my other senses, electricity exploded from my nerves as my pain receptors lit up like it was Christmas. Malachi! I wheezed, barely even getting the word out. Please! He grabbed my coat and lifted my torso off the ground, spitting in my face. Please, Malachi, please! He mocked. You already had your chance, little brother. He slammed me back to the ground and stars exploded. Again, he yanked me up. I never wanted it to come to this Abraham. Malachi growled. Peter told me I'd have to be ready to do the Lord's work, but I told him it would never come to this. I blinked and tried to focus. Malachi. He slammed me back down and started ramming my face. Right fist, left fist, bam, bam, bam. Exploding stars turned into a light show worthy of a final bow, the final show, the last hurrah. I always knew God wanted me to save you, brother. Malachi spat madly. I wanted you to repent for what you did to Gertie, to beg for forgiveness and save your soul. But when you failed to come to me, he brought me to Peter instead, and that's how I knew. Wham, wham, wham! God wanted Peter to bring me to you. This was God's plan. This was always his plan. Malachi finally eased his barrage and rose up above me. My head flopped to the side, blood and teeth falling from my mouth. I had no idea how I was even conscious, or why, why, why the fuck, why was I so muted to the pole just to feel my brother beat the living shit out of me? Not that I had any chance of figuring it out. Malachi had knocked my brain to mush. Bloody eyes were swelling shut. Broken bones stabbed at me from underneath, shearing muscle and flesh. And then I felt the sensation of lifting off the ground. Of course, this is the end, isn't it? The final act, a soul or whatever consciousness existed, finally leaving the body. But no. It was just Malachi dragging me through the melee of the riot. I clawed uselessly at the ground, but I had little strength to call on and nothing to grab hold of. He ranted senselessly as he stomped forward, his words melting into the background noise of roaring flames, screaming voices, and general chaos. I couldn't process a single word, not that any of them mattered. He had gone so far off the deep end, and all he was doing was repeating total nonsense. People tripped over me. Assholes kicked at me. No one tried to stop Malachi. And why should they? He was Peter's ordained hand of fucking God. I wheezed, trying to fill my lungs, fighting for every breath. Underneath all the pain and the struggle for consciousness, a quiet sadness pulled at my heart. It took me a moment to realize that I was still in that peculiar emotional cone of silence and I wasn't feeling the emotions of Malachi or the rioters or law enforcement or, or anyone else. Which meant the sadness was all my own. And when the tears began spilling from my swollen eyes, those were all mine too. 
I couldn't help it. Not that I would have wanted to. The sadness came from a profound sense of loss, a creeping emptiness fueled by a profound and painful pointlessness. My brother was gone. He was lost on such a fundamental level that no amount of time or reason or compassion would ever reach him. And the finality of that realization wasn't even the worst of it. Like with Gertie, I had been too crippled by the pull to ever try and reach him. I was too crippled to try and connect with him. If I had been there, maybe he wouldn't have gotten so lost in the deep end of whatever crazy consumed him. Clear-headed and unaffected by the pull, I accepted the loss. I blamed myself, but then again, maybe it didn't even matter. My brother was gone, and if there wasn't anything I could do about it when I was crippled by the pull, there certainly wasn't anything I could do now crippled by the fists of my own flesh and blood. So he dragged me away, and my fingers stopped, reaching for a purchase on the ground. What else could I do but accept fate? Free from the pull, my sadness settled into a simple kind of peace. Soon, soon I'd have all the peace and quiet. I had ever wanted. Soon. When he finally stopped and released me, my head cracked against a sidewalk. Malachi had dragged me to a concrete path and positioned me so my skull would rest against the solid surface. My head rolled sideways and my fading vision filled with Malachi's boot. Ah, so we've come to this. He squatted down next to me and placed a hand on my cheek. It was awkward. Little brother, he said softly, eyes bugging manically. I am going to save your soul. I promise you, even if I have to send you straight to hell to do it. Like I said, mad as a goddamn fucking hatter. I saw the boot rise in the air above my head. As Malachi's foot hung, suspended for an impossibly long time, the invisible Josephine lurking in a dark corner of my brain spoke out to me. Her voice was clear, and I was sure if I turned my head, I'd see her face on the sidewalk next to me. The times we live in, Abraham. Lord knows that boy Beckett got plenty of nudges in the wrong direction. And it sure seems like people like your brother are the ones doing a whole lot of that nudging. Lying, twisting, manipulating, impressionable young minds. Poisoning them before they have a chance to properly think for themselves. Maybe it won't actually count for a whole hell of a lot in the end. But maybe, just maybe, keeping that Jesus fetishizing, not so loving fuck of a brother from nudging any more boys. Well, Abraham. I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe the simple act of trying is a step in the right direction. Hmm. Without realizing it, my hand had found its way into my coat pocket. I was vaguely aware of a hard, smooth object under my fingertips. My fingers sought out four large holes in the object and slipped through them. I don't know what kind of hoodoo voodoo exists in the world, but I know for sure you gotta have a little inside you with that whole empathy thing. Your brother certainly seemed to have a little in him, too. And maybe there's just a little bit of hoodoo voodoo left in these. Malachi's boot shot down to my skull. At the same time, I felt a jolt of energy surge up through the hand in my pocket, twisting up my arm, curling across my shoulders, and exploding into my other arm. I instinctively snatched at the boot with my free hand, yanking it violently to throw Malachi off balance. The sudden movement caught him off guard, and he came crashing down over me. My hand slipped out of the coat pocket. 
the brass knuckles from Valdez's grandfather caught the flickering light of nearby flames, muted against the aged and scuffed surface. Twisted off balance, Malachi started coming down. My fist rocketed up, arcing a path that crossed my body. It was like a missile, and the knuckles were an atomic payload. I'm sure they would have shot forward, even without my arm behind them, burning with the fuel of dozens or even hundreds of Nazi souls from a past that echoed far too loudly. Malachi fell, and my fist went up. One last time. Epilogue I twisted the screw cap off, tossed it under the trailer, and guzzled the cheap, fizzy stuff. Shitty beer never tasted as good as when enjoyed in the quiet solitude of home, watching the sunset over your private lake. The cooler beside the lawn chair was almost empty, and a worn-out paperback copy of Bright Orange for the Shroud, the next book in MacDonald's Travis McGee series, was splayed open on top of it. I needed to take a piss. I pushed myself off the chair, groaning as my mending bones and stiff muscles protested loudly. Even with my special hoodoo voodoo, shit hurt, and some more shit took time to heal. Stepping over the kitschy, go-away doormat, I pulled open the trailer door and climbed the steps. Inside the luxurious Owens Manor, I made my way to the bathroom to relieve myself. My phone buzzed in my pocket, and I checked the screen before flipping it open. I'm a little indisposed, Valdez, I said. I've got a job for you, she said tonelessly. Wait, are you pissing? I told you, indisposed. Then why don't you just wait to answer the phone? You know what, never mind. Jacoby wants me to run down this lead on an alleged sex trafficking thing. I'll stop you there, I said as I tucked and zipped. I don't need money, and I don't need booze. Oh, for fuck's sake, Abe. Don't be such a goddamn fucking physical embodiment of hot dog water. You ass munching. Ah, there's my girl. Valdez. What? I have zero fucks, I said. But be safe out there, kid. She let out an exasperated sigh. I added, call, if you get stuck in a tight spot. Fuck off, Abe. The line went dead. I smiled. Love you too, kid. I pocketed the phone and stepped to the kitchenette, thinking about how I had laid into Valdez for bringing Josephine to the rally, raging at her almost as bad as any of those fuckheads from that night. She took it the only way Valdez knew how to take things. Silently, detached, like a goddamn alien. When I finally ran out of steam, she explained how it all had been Josephine's idea. She even had a fucking video on her phone, a simple message from Josephine as they were leaving the hospital, verifying Valdez's story, and chastising me against yelling at the only other person who puts up with my shit. I broke down, unable to hold back the tears. Valdez eventually offered me two pats on the back. It was the best she could manage, and it helped. Valdez was going to be just fine. Her work on Jacoby's expose on the Sons of the Golden Future, as well as her cell phone footage of the late Officer Sampson attempting to plant evidence on me outside the hospital, set the record straight on Councilman White, and had led to federal investigations into the city council and the police department. It wouldn't be easy or fast, but the city of St. Charles was trying to mop up its Nazi problem. And trying, well, at least it was a step in the right direction. I'd like to think Josephine would approve, while simultaneously pointing out how every single point of systemic institutional failure would doom the effort from the start. I couldn't attend her funeral, but I was able to watch the burial from a distance, no matter how cliched it might have been. I had seen Beckett Miller in attendance. There hadn't been any reason to talk to him after that night at the rally, but I knew he was trying his best to move on with his life, and do better. And I have no doubt Josephine would approve. As for Malachi, well, when the fucker gets released from the hospital, he's going straight to another hospital with padded walls. The feds froze his accounts in connection with the Sons of the Golden Future investigation. 
when a bean counter saw that one of the accounts was for a construction business that still had my name on it, that money was released back to me. Between that and Beckett's cash, I was set in the lot rent and booze money department. At least, for a little while. On my way back outside the trailer, I grabbed a fresh six-pack from a well-stocked fridge. Murph had surprised me with a visit earlier, truly and unintentionally creeping up on me because of his trademark psychic dead zone to the pull. He had arrived under the auspices of a store-to-door delivery, but I knew better, and not just because I hadn't ordered any booze. We had sat outside and enjoyed the lakeside view for a good while. It was an easy and comfortable silence, punctuated only by sips and cigars. I didn't press him, and he left me well alone. It was perfect. When Murph finally spoke, he did so in very few words, explaining that he had been in a building across the street the night of the rally with nothing but a pair of high-powered binoculars and his own special brand of hoodoo voodoo. I called him a long-range emotional sniper, and he didn't disagree. Much later, when he finished his cigar, Murph clapped his thighs and said it was about time to get going. Now, as I stepped back outside into the cool evening air, I was once again surprised to see someone hobbling up the path along the lake. The pull had given me no notice, and as I focused on the man, I felt no piano wires and no vibrations in my chest. Hmm. I sat down and placed the six-pack beside a smoldering cigar on the cooler. I cracked a fresh beer as the man approached, eyeballing him cautiously. He was using a cane, but he certainly wasn't old. Maybe late twenties. Looked like he had a busted knee or something. As he got closer, I saw that his face didn't look too good either. Scar tissue from what had been a pretty fucking nasty burn ran from his jaw straight up the side of his skull. His hair was patchy over the scar tissue, if it grew at all. He was buttoned up, though, certainly presentable in a collared shirt and jeans. His face could be friendly if it weren't for the scars and the neutral expression it carried. When he was within a dozen feet, he stopped and nodded a greeting, lips pressed into a thin line. Still, no pull. He had my interest. I took a long swig of fizzy beer and waited for him to talk. Abraham Owens? Something tells me you already know that. The kid nodded slowly. Jeremy, he said, by way of introduction. I'm transferring to the SCPD, detective rank, but uh, that's not why I'm here. He added quickly. I drank. I didn't tell him to go. He clicked his teeth, mulling his words. I, uh, I think we have a mutual acquaintance. Is that so? Jeremy shifted on his feet, leaning forward on his cane to relieve the pressure on his leg. He let out a strained breath. I was hoping you could tell me anything you know about this guy connected to the Sons of the Golden Future. It wasn't the pole, but something twisted in my chest. You got a name? Jeremy nodded his lips forming that thin line again. I didn't need to actually hear it. It was the one person left unaccounted for after the night of the rally. The one person who had somehow managed to vanish into the night and escape any kind of justice. Jeremy said the name anyhow. Peter. Author's Note If you've made it this far, I owe you my deepest thanks. This audiobook was an absolute train wreck. But, hopefully, you never noticed. While this isn't my first novel, it is my first audiobook production. And with hindsight being 2020, I can say I picked the absolutely worst possible title to cut my teeth on. Abe Owens has been a voice in my head since 2017, when I first started writing this novel. So when it came time to record audio, well, I either had to do the voice, or literally shut the fuck up. And since Punch Drunk is told in the first person, I not only had to do the voice, but I had to do the voice all the time. And of course, if I'm doing a voice for the main character slash main narration, I should probably do voices for the rest of the characters. Granted, no other character had such an extreme or challenging voice, 
but that didn't alter the sheer vocal challenge in front of me. Okay, let me put it this way. A third-person narrative can simply be, well, narrated, which would be an excellent way for a novice audiobook narrator to cut their teeth. A first-person narrative demands to be performed, and when the first-person voice is murder on this narrator's throat, resulting in 30-minute max recording sessions, you can probably see why I elected to not go back and re-record after I fully found Abraham's voice. I am a video editor by trade, and this was my first audiobook production. And let me be clear, I really did produce the whole thing independently, by myself, from start to finish. That included 16 hours of raw audio for 6 hours of runtime, and over 2 months of editing and re-editing. It also included all the mistakes a first-time narrator, producer, and audiobook editor would make. From the noticeable, the evolving voice of Abraham Owens, to the subtle, microphone technique, audio quality, and pacing. For you, the listener, my hope is that Punch Drunk is nothing more than trashy, pulpy, Nazi punching fun. For me, it's a time capsule, a progress report, and a creative statement. I made that. I didn't know how, but I figured it out. And that's pretty cool. I started writing Punch Drunk in 2017 at the height of the United States' cultural aneurysm, where so many somehow forgot that Nazis were the bad guys. I was finishing up a run as a video editor at the Orlando Sentinel newspaper, and had a front row seat to the mental gymnastics assholes like Richard Spencer twisted themselves into, all in the name of legitimizing Nazism. It was frustrating. It was infuriating. Worse, it was fucking depressing. So. I wrote a story about it. Punch Drunk was never meant to be some grand statement about racism, politics, or even alcoholism. The premise was cut and dry simple. Nazis are the bad guys, no matter what they want to call themselves. So let's punch some motherfucking Nazis. While writing this book, I did just enough research to give the third act the authenticity it demanded. It was also just enough research to slip into a black hole of depression, and recording the audio of some of the more uglier alt-right sentiments was a truly unique, well, let's just call it an experience. The first draft of the chapter where Abe and Beckett are walking through the rally clocked a very brief 600 words. It was the culmination of a lot of that nitty-gritty research, digging deep into the scum of the earth that is white nationalism. It was only 600 words, but each sentence was a struggle to get down. You've listened to the finished work, and you know how ugly those scenes are. So, I wrote the first draft of 600 words, and then promptly lost all of it due to a synchronization glitch. Remember that black hole of depression I mentioned? The subject matter had me primed, forcing my brain into a vulnerable state, and then the technical glitch shoved me right over the edge. I had a catastrophic meltdown over those 600 words because, yes, it really was that bad. If you are interested in the full behind-the-scenes story, I wrote and produced a video essay about it. You can find the link in the description. I talk about my writing process. I was working on an e-ink Android tablet with a mechanical keyboard at the time, and I talk about the trauma of being under the looming shadow of a brain broken with compulsion. I don't know, maybe you can relate. I say all of that to say this. Thank you. Sincerely. I wrote this story and produced this audiobook because I love the process. It, it helps comfort that broken, compulsive brain. I self-publish and self-produce because it's better than just printing a manuscript and leaving it on a shelf to collect dust. If you enjoyed this book, or even if you just barely didn't hate it, please consider leaving a review or any thoughts in the comments. Reviews on Goodreads are also helpful. The link is in the description.
Every little bit helps, even if it is just a thumbs up. Thank you for listening, and see you in the next one.